So first, let me tell you about Zebra Learn. So Zebra Learn is a community of finance learners and leaders. So in Zebra Learn, what we do is we connect a lot of finance learners so that they can learn from each other, and we have a lot of leaders from the industry itself who interact with the learners and give them the right guidance to pursue a career in their specific domain. So today we are here to discuss. Uh, the basics of equity research and we have anurag sundarga with us so about anurag sundarga he is a cfa mba by qualification he has worked as an equity research analyst in the past and for the past 3 to 4 years like during his tenure as an equity research analyst he took up a personal project in which he did a detailed research about developing industry sheets business sheets and simplifying and organizing the entire process of equity research right and based on which he also wrote a book that goes by the name rich fonts the complete guide to identifying the rich index building on the same he started zebra learn about 3 years back and also developed a product called zebra pro now zebra pro is a tool that is to be used by analyst in mutual funds and equity researchers in the industry so to share his detailed insights about equity research he has built this four week course and uh, i would like to welcome him uh, right away so hi anurag uh, let me just put your screen yeah hi rohan hi, hi i'm good thanks thank you everyone for joining in told about uh, 290 to 300 people have joined in so far so thank you everyone it's going to be an amazing session where we talk about lot of things uh, related to equity research starting from the absolute basics and uh, the end game being the building the first project in the field uh, and then moving on with it so thank you rohan firstly for that kind introduction and thank you everyone for taking out the time on a sunday afternoon again uh, on a sunday morning rather and uh, joining in on this so thanks everyone great so anurag over to you and uh... please continue with the session thank you rohan thank you uh, let me very so hi guys welcome everyone thank you so much for taking out the time it's been an amazing uh, it's going to be an amazing session uh, we're going to have so much fun in this as well we're going to learn uh, it's going to be long sessions it's going to be two and a half hours roughly uh, and then followed by obviously discussion sessions interactive sessions so and i also see the chat section here so let's do this let's keep the chat session as interactive as possible uh let's keep it as much so let's just uh, let's just make it make sure that this just flows along so welcome everyone to this basics of equity research program by zebra learn uh, it's a four week course again same timing on next uh, for the like today and three more sundays and we are going to start from absolute scratch and build a solid base in uh, for equity research in this program so first things first what do you like what to expect in this course so expect that we start from absolute basics so if you have absolutely no experience absolutely and that is what we expect like uh, we don't expect a lot of background in equity research even if you don't know what equity research is uh we start from that kind of basics uh we focus on learn by doing so what learn by doing basically means is you will be assigned a lot of small assignments during this lecture during the week uh so it's actually when you uh, do is when you actually get confidence that okay i can do this i can uh, you start exploring more the ultimate goal here is to build a foundation uh, in equity research this uh, four week course just because of the time involved it won't make you job ready four weeks is just not enough time to be uh, to be job ready in equity research but what it will do is you will be in a position to make your first project in equity research uh, like first you will be able to understand your first company you will understand the different terms the different moving variables that come along with this career path so this is what to expect in this uh, course duration the outline of this course it's a four week course as discussed week 1 we talk about industry research so what exactly industry research is uh 
first thing is how do you pick the industry you want to invest in so you can invest in a cement company you can invest in a bank you can invest in an ice cream company you can invest in a solar power company so all these are different industries uh, so first thing today's discussion will focus all around uh, industry research how do you pick the industries that are relevant uh, to invest or the ones that are best suited for your uh, for you second week next week what we do once you have uh, finalized the industry or narrowed down on an industry then you can pick the companies so actually if you have picked up the right industry 50% of your work is done after that you come to companies research that means let's say you have uh, narrowed down on cement industry you want to invest in cement as uh, let's say you have you have finalized cement so within cement you can have ultra tech you can have acc uh, you can have so many different companies you can have shri ji so uh, out of these 12 or 13 listed companies in cement space which one is competitively best placed so that is what we'll do in the second week third week we'll talk about financial analysis and understanding the management again uh, we'll touch upon the basics of these two uh, because obviously uh, in a 3 hour session how much uh, but we'll still make it as exhaustive as detailed as possible and last week we'll talk about valuation we'll talk about how to generate investment research ideas uh, what can be the road ahead and also we'll talk about uh, how do you uh, like how do you go about your portfolio so this is how the four week course is structured uh, over here uh, means of communication so for this course further on communication the primary mode remains whatsapp announcements so our team will be sharing a lot of whatsapp uh, announcements uh, to you second there is also whatsapp group for this third there is a group of equity research on zebralearn.com so you can join that so there all the discussion go comes along you can also download the app zebra learn from play store ios store uh, what happens there is uh, the com com uh, the communication further and also the discussions doubts that can be discussed on in that particular group and lastly anything service related any questions just feel free to email on hello@zebralearn.com so this is how we'll further communicate uh, during this course so now that we have we are done with the base the introduction and everything of that kind is behind us let's actually get started let act let's actually get uh, get going with the course before that how many of you are excited just type in excited in the in the ch chat in the comment i'm super excited uh, uh, uh I, let me just go through the comment section so actually i'm not able to access the comment and the presentations together so i might it might be a little uh, like a uh, con so let me very quickly have a look so super excited super excited thank you guys see shubham pooja gopika manan ajay thank you super exciting so i have the chat here but it's just that it, the two don't work together so let's get started first questions first uh, and also one thing before uh, before we get started uh, anyone who has experience in equity research let's say who has been working in it has spent 6 months to 1 year in this uh, more than 1 year rather uh they might not find it as useful because here we are mostly talking about the basics so again i'll suggest it won't be the best use of your time uh so again after, uh, so let's get started for others it's going to be super fun so what exactly is equity research so first things first whenever i talk to people uh and we use the word equity research it's often and i ask anyone to explain it i've seen a lot of people are not able to explain what exactly equity research is what exactly do they do so equity research the word itself has two parts to it if you look equity and research so equity by itself means you buy ownership in any company so what it means uh when you buy shares in reliance let's say you bought one share uh, and reliance has roughly 2 crore shares outstanding let's say these are hypothetical numbers so what exactly are you doing you are becoming 1 by 2 crore 
so whatever that number works out to be 0.0000 i don't know i think 6 or 7 zeros uh 0.5 uh, percent owner of reliance so this is what is happening when you buy one share so whenever you buy equity you buy ownership into an any company so first half of the word is equity that means you're buying the intent is to buy ownership any in any company and second half of the word is research so what exactly research means research is whenever let's say a lawyer picks up a case and finds the background about it finds things that are happening in the back end uh, research is let's say a doctor uh, conducting tests to understand the patient's health research is basically collection of data for whatever purpose collection of data and also understanding of the same analysis of the same drawing conclusions from the same so whenever we talk about equity research it is analysis collection of data of business and its environment so if we talk about reliance or rather let's say geo a product of reliance we will talk about its environment as well its competition government so policies by government uh let's say uh let's say the market scenario so all these things anything and everything that affects geo be it the management the people who run the company so analysis of a business and its environment so environment is anything that affects the business with the intention of investments in the company so the idea is to buy ownership in that particular company so uh, that is what exactly equity research is and in this process you will see i'll come to this you will see we never actually we look at the share prices very late in the process so in day to day terms whenever we talk about stocks shares equity what happens we start from stock price we start from stock prices okay reliance it's trading at 2200 let's say i don't know the exact number right now but let's say 2200 so we start from this and actually this comes very very late all this analysis of price is not equity research what is not equity research day to day buying and selling uh every minute monitoring of stock prices in fact i have i have met analysts i know analysts who don't even know what is the exact price of their share let's say they have hdfc bank in their portfolio they don't know if it's for 1000 rupees or 1100 right now because their entire focus is on business the trading technical analysis these are things that are not equity research so one thing very clear right now it's very important to understand we will focus on the business the share price and all those things will come very late we'll focus on the business and its environment that is what we will do in this course we'll talk about the share price in the valuation evaluation session but business and its environment and it's very important to forget the share price in the background so this is what we mean by equity research what it covers it covers things like industry research understanding the company's product understanding the business the people who are running it how it makes money what's the revenue model uh competition management who are the people running it what's their intentions are they share are they professional management uh then we have financial analysis and so understanding the financials and lastly we have valuations so these are things that are covered in equity research we'll be talking about them one by one going ahead but It's, so this is what is equity research business and its environment i again emphasize and we will not focus a lot on uh, shares price technical analysis on this course and before we get started two very important things one is adopting the research mindset and second is adopting the lawyer mindset after this we come to actually analyzing the industry so what exactly is research mindset research mindset means you need to collect data and at times you get data ready made at times you have to work hard you have to uh you have to work hard and go out in the field and actually collect data and at times that is not even possible so you need to get creative get creative while collecting data so uh, and guys i would request all of you to have note uh, take notes during this it will be are very helpful referring back and also for the exercises going ahead so 
uh, research mindset. Uh, you need to collect data. That's the key. Better your data is, more time you're spent in research. Better will be your uh, better will be your investments. Better will be uh, you'll be better informed, and you can refer a lot of a uh, lot of resources to collect that data. We'll be discussing those resources. Uh, you have to work hard at times. What will happen is you might have to go out in the ground and conduct surveys to collect that data. And last, uh, as I had said. At times, what happens is you don't get data. You you are ready to go out in the in the people and collect data, but it just have you just have to get creative. Uh, it just what can you do? So let's say you want to collect data about cement companies and you're not able to access uh, Ultra Tech Cements, let's say one of their manufacturing facilities. So what do you do in that case? You go in that area. You might uh, you might look at a smaller company. A company that's let's say a local company who allows you to visit their facilities, and that and you can compare that. Okay, uh, this particular company has X, Y, and Z systems. So Ultratech will be a, a larger uh, larger variant of this particular system itself. So actually, research. So we'll be doing all this in the course. So what I'm trying to say here is that you need to adopt a research mindset, a data collection mindset. where can you find good data no matter how creative it is because that is what will determine how good decisions do you take that is what research mindset is and you won't get all the data uh, in a platter never so that is first and second lawyer mindset so whenever collecting data it's very important to filter things what is relevant and what is not relevant and in this you need to think like a lawyer think of it that you are presenting you are going to present a case to a judge to a jury so let's say and it has to have a lot of merit a lot of conclusive proof that's the word actually so you can't go by media reports you can't go by speculations you have to have to focus on conclusive proof if the government of india is uh, releasing some reports that is something that's conclusive but if let's say a, a media house is writing something in newspaper or you see a youtube video that is that might not be conclusive to think like a lawyer what is very solid to your investment thesis what is for sure of fact what cannot be debated upon that is what is conclusive proof the real edge in research is in detail as we have discussed so research mindset plus lawyer mindset is what will get us in a good uh, mind frame to become an equity research analyst this is where we actually start now chat box uh, so guys uh, let's start with the fun part how do you analyze any industry and we'll focus all on logistics okay that was a fun noise uh, uh how do you analyze uh and we'll do this with focus on indian logistics sector so uh with logistics in focus how do you analyze any given industry and we'll be using this uh, metric so you can uh, you can take a screenshot if you want Uh, i think this should be shared with you as well so this is industry sheet uh, that we had developed internally so what exactly industry sheet is it's a one page or document which points out different topics that you need to understand to understand any given industry let's say you want to for in this case we'll talk about logistics but any given industry you want to start a business even in that case this comes valuable so first things first we talk about value proposition what are the products who are the customers and why do the products and customers like understanding the different products and customers segments and then what is the value that the product creates for customers next activities and participants so who are the different people involved in the industry and who are the different people the industry has to deal with so for example logistics sector will have to deal with uh, will have to deal with uh, truck drivers warehouse owners so these all this will be covered in the second section third industry characteristics where we'll talk about market size industry stability uh, competitive life cycle all these things then we'll talk about profit forces this is by mr michael porter a well known uh, a well known professor of harvard university he has uh, so and it's actually pr pretty common the porter's five forces next we'll talk about financial health of different companies and lastly outlook of the industry 
so this is what we'll be covering today all our discussion will be around this and we'll be using uh, focus will be learn by doing and indian logistics sector as an example so let's get started point 1 we'll talk about value proposition and we'll talk about the idea here is we'll talk about very practical things that actually needs to be done uh and we'll also try to do few things wherever possible so and also for uh, for uh industry sheet what are the uh, resources to be used one is annual report by companies you can find it on bseindia.com you can also find it on screener.in other websites are also available for the same you have annual reports of foreign companies Th that has lot of uh, information that you need to google up third we have lot of uh, industry reports so in this is how industry reports actually look and work so yeah so coming back uh, industry reports third thing so how do you look for industry reports uh, this is some this is how you do it so uh, reports on indian logistics sector pdf we'll always focus on pdf so this is now uh, report 1 let me just open it in a new tab by india budget so this is a government website quite trustable then we'll also so we have a report by mckinsey we have a report so this is how we'll go about reports few of so this is by niti ayog so we just need to keep on finding reports okay indian logistics sector i just missed that i think these reports won't be really valuable this should be uh so deloitte okay we have a report by deloitte so this should be good uh we have one by indian chamber but i'm not aware what indian chamber is so looks good uh, it's quite recent as well so that adds to it so we'll find reports like this this is where we get lot of good data about industries these are just two reports this is an old one uh so we just uh, we need to keep looking for it this is uh, okay logistics sector by ibf okay so this is where we get lot of valuable data so we'll be going through these as well uh so industry reports annual reports of foreign companies so we have industry reports we did see them uh then we have con call transcripts so what happens is every company or not every company but few companies they do something called con call or conference calls so what exactly conference call is the company uh, every 3 months they do a one hour call where they invite analysts and these analysts ask questions to them and it can be any questions and it's asked in public and these questions are answered by the management and this con call this transcript a written form of this say that's available to us for further analysis we can find this on screener.in you select any company that does a uh, con call let's say uh, let's just say acc cements do they do it so if you scroll towards the very end you will see these con call transcripts so these are sources of data that we'll use so here what has happened is it's about 23 pages and all that has been question answer question answer so uh, if you move forward a question and then answer then okay this looks like an answer so let's say mr navin is the uh, is asking questions and that has to be answered by mr sridhar uh, so the senior manager basically questions and uh, answers everything that's there lastly we have analyst calls of different industry industry reports so what happens is whenever you open an industry whenever you open uh, a report in the starting or at the end you might have analyst contact so let's say if you look at rating reports so it's likely that at times you will find okay here it is so here you find three people's number who are so you can contact these people to collect data because these guys have lot of insights about uh, about the company because they have actually spent time in the factories they had access to things that uh, we as analyst will not however the challenge remains at times they might not be open to share at times they will not pick up calls it, it's difficult to reach at times so all those things happen but uh, but yeah this is a, another source of information lastly credit rating report so that again we see on screener.in 
so credit reporting agencies have uh, access to much better data and the management than us so we see all this here what are the biggest weaknesses strengths all this that is been the and this is discussed by someone who has access to lot of data which we never will have so these are points that these are data sources that we will cover uh, in that we will use other than that we can get as creative as possible to collect data there is absolutely no end to collecting data there are no hard and fast rules you can just be as creative as possible but these are the most common ones these we absolutely cannot let go of so let's get started with the first section of this particular industry sheet that is value proposition customer segments products and services uh any questions i'm not able to access the questions i believe uh so yes customer segments so first things first who are the different segment who are the different customer segments who are the different peop different uh different sections of customers that use our products or that use the industry's products so for that uh we have this rule who what where how and why so you can divide people based on who they are uh what is their purpose where are they like geographical location how do they intend to use the product why uh why do they want to uh why do they want to use the product or what is why do they want to use the product so for example uh let's say food chains so just one example food chains so taking this example of why so some people go to food chains for leisure once in a week twice in a week uh to eat out there to have a good time with family friends but a lot others also go uh, have to eat regularly let's say people working away from home uh who do not cook at home they eat regularly at this food joint uh, food chains so the why here is very different this is leisure the social surroundings this is a need for food they need to eat for food next where so where actually depends on the geographical location uh so let's say for uh, for that uh india is a co uh, india is a is a tropical country so temperature in most parts of india does not drop a lot for a very long period of year let's say it drops in the winter months let's just say that or let's say in, in the northern part of india it does drop in the southern part it does not drop that heavily so what will happen let's say you are a company that sells that sells heaters so you will have to segment your customers based on where they are based on their temperature let's say you are a company that sells ice cream where will you bet heavy you will have to send more supplies towards the southern part right uh, because that's where the temperature does not drop who are these people what is their uh, like what is the need where do they come from so these are different methods how you segment the customer uh for so let's do this let's take an example uh let me ask you a question uh let's say uh what can we use as an example we can use uh ac market air conditioners and let's say we use uh mobile phones how can put me in the comment put in the comment section how can you segment uh how can you segment your customers if you are a ac if let's say you are a ac company and second if you are a mobile company i'll just wait for a i'll wait for a minute let me read the comments what do we get uh it's good. let's see what do we get in the comment section is fundamental analysis and uh, equity research same thing pretty much yes uh can you share uh this ppt for further references yes we can uh which method of equity valuation will be used we'll talk about that at the end uh but equity research will uh, valuation will talk a lot about relative valuation we'll talk about a method called exit exit multiple and we'll also talk about another method uh which is absolute valuation but in very basics because absolute valuation can be very long and it requires a lot of practice it won't be fair to discuss that in an hour and get to uh, and we and get something concrete out of it uh so on the basis of on the basis of price and age correct uh 
age i doubt how can we con- how can we segment the market for age i am sure old age people have certain phone requirements uh next okay this is crawling up wait wait i just saw that you purchased a product from zebra learn store and thank you so much we have something super super awesome for you introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses be it personal finance stock trading derivatives financial analysis financial modeling uh, stock markets everything and anything that you want to learn in finance you have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period you'll have access to them as well this is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to get into this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle on the basis of weather, weather okay yes but that will be more geography uh, income and geography that's perfect uh ac southern and central india yes that's where a majority consumption is uh ac retail business like banks okay yes perfect b2b and b2c uh company geography uh will target the people who live in states like rajasthan yes that's again geography on the basis of price weather income so i think we have mixed two things here uh price and income i think uh, for mobile and price again for ac as well i'm not sure uh uh if price is a factor like how big is a, how big is the range there do we get the same ac for 20000 unbranded and a branded one same thing for 50000 ac for job uh, rural urban definitely uh, also one more thing that becomes very handy with ac is the r- electric supply uh rural or uh, urban repl- uh, repl- uh, uh, rural versus urban actually reminds me of that with rural the problem often happens is that heavy duty acs do not really work in that uh because the power supply is just not enough in mobile the end purpose perfect perfect so this is how actually we go about segmenting the customers uh we'll have a drum rolls actually for all the users who have uh spent uh all the, all of you who have uh, who have actually replied this is absolutely great let's move on segment the customers so let's do that now for logistics sector in india so how can we do for logistics we can have b2b versus b2c meaning uh again it's pretty self explanatory one business wanting to extend goods to second business and then lastly b2c uh let's say someone like amazon wanting to send couriers to us uh, so that is b2b and b2c second basis of differentiation is industry served so let's say pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry has a very different logistical requirement than let's say a food industry both these people require a refrigeration though versus very different from textiles textiles does not require a uh, refrigeration but it requires volumes uh, space then let's say auto parts so each of these industries have very different logistical requirements and different companies serve different industries so that is the second basis and third basis is well location served So I hope uh, you're taking notes uh, because this will come in handy later on uh, when we work on projects. So location served. Uh, so some companies cater to North India, South India. Some you'll see a lot of companies claiming we serve all twenty-two thousand plus pin codes of India. You'll see some companies claiming that they only serve certain pin codes. That is also one factor in B two C. In B two B, what area do you work in? Northern India. is it amdabad uh, bombay delhi route actually is it uh, bangalore chennai belt which areas are you serving in so this is the first point understanding the customer segments the next two points is customer pains and gains so we'll come to this so that let's say take a few examples uh, for segmenting so be, this is how pci express a company under uh, a company under logistics sector in india this is how they identify their products their services their segmentation so b2b b2c as we have discussed and these are the different product offerings for b2b companies these are the different product offerings for b2c companies uh 
so customer last things uh, last that we had seen was customer value customer gains and pains so gains and pains actually means value proposition why will the customer want to buy why will the customer want to buy from the industry or from the companies that work in the industry so why will someone want to buy uh, do business with a logistics company because uh, they need to send product a from place a to product place b why will someone buy let's say uh, why will someone buy an iphone what can be the different reasons let's actually hit this up in the comment section again why will someone buy an iphone it's a very open question what are the different reasons that customers can buy uh, let me actually go back uh, what uh, if you hit up in the comment section what can be the different reasons let me actually stop the share quality of products that can be one reason reliability brand name okay a lot of you are saying brand name so that is one reason so why will you buy a phone you buy a phone for a very basic reason that is to call people right that is the fundamental uh, reason why someone should use a phone but but why else do we use we can use it uh, for status symbol so we can use it for the brand name for security uh, for privacy okay we don't think that we want privacy when we buy goods we buy iphone because we think it's more uh, the privacy there is better than other mobile phones but phone itself we buy because a quality customer uh, service uh, security again uh, status symbol correct so if we look back at it why will someone want to buy an iphone calling is the basic reason calling we also have uh, we had privacy we had security but one reason that we also got was social status so any reason that people want to buy that product or buy product from that industry that qualifies under value proposition why will you want to buy a phone any reason for that is under value proposition why will you want to buy ice cream if i ask you this simple open question because of the heat or because uh, you enjoy uh, you enjoy the same or because let's say you go out and it gives you a good social experience n number of reasons all these reasons anything any reason why you buy something that forms a part of uh, that forms a part of value proposition how do you understand value proposition you talk to different customers who are the industry who use industries product already and you ask them why do you use this uh let's say if you can get in touch with large companies it would be great often this takes time uh so even if you talk to small companies they'll tell you if you want to talk to logic for logistics don't we won't do what uh, we won't go ahead and go to the head office of tci express and we'll try to find answers that will take a lot of time and it might not be feasible for everyone what we will do we'll go to a local logistics guy let's say your local uh, around the corner pickup guy who picks up goods from you who picks up or even your courier boy we will talk to them we will get a lot of answers if you want a little bit more like more answers after that you go one step ahead from the local pickup guy you go to the the center where he collects all the goods so there he'll be, you'll be able to meet multiple people uh, like the pickup boy and also the uh, admin staff there they will give you lot of answers this way you go one step at a time and you look for answers with things that are accessible if every one of us lines up at tci express head office the company won't be able to answer everyone's questions it's just it will just become so difficult so this is how you go about data collection here understand their logistics need uh, so for every company uh, for different companies different kinds of b2b users what you can for b2b what you can do is you can talk to different companies who use b2b services and why do they use it what exactly is their purpose so again the purpose remains very basic uh, to send good a from good place a to place b but why do they pick up certain companies so in, for many companies 
they go ahead with expensive couriers as well why uh, for example from place a to place b company a uh, com like first company can send it at rupees 200 second company will send it at rupees 400 yet they will go at rupees 400 the reason for that the reason for that can be many maybe company a like the one that sends up uh, like the second company let's just say that the second company is more reliable they won't mess up with the products second let's say the second company has better brand image so often what companies of also do is they need to maintain their brand image if let's say a blue dart sends you if if company sends you a courier in blue dart versus let's say a local service provider as a customer it just looks good to you that the company has sent in blue, blue dart it builds brand reputation for the company who's sending the courier so these are these can be certain reasons the reasons can be anything people uh, people buy goods for as diverse reasons as possible so we need to understand why is someone buying something and will that need sustain we had to use petrol cars there was absolutely no need no alternate to it but with ev we can have something we can have something that allows us to bypass the petrol requirements we might have to charge things but we will not go and buy petrol anymore let's just say that so value proposition is why is someone buying something it becomes very very important to understand this basic google search talking to people on linkedin talking to people around you will give you the answers you don't need to uh, talk to the ceo of a com of a large company to explain this so, and interviews that also helps next for customer research so again to understand customer value proposition we need to conduct customer research what we used to do what i have done in the past as well is uh just look up for let's say you are understanding pharmaceutical companies their logistical requirements just google things up pharmaceutical let's just do that actually right now uh pharmaceutical distributors near me you get all these contact numbers can even talk to pharmacy stores they'll be much more open so when you talk to these let's say you talk to to call up five of them you will get one of them will be ready to talk to you so we have one number let's say zenith distributors you call up this number it's likely they will say okay i'm not uh, i won't answer this that but out of five or six people you call to uh, you will get one of them will be ready to talk so this is Timing of delivery, ease, faster delivery, better handling, definitely all these things become very important. Timing of delivery, uh, one thing that has become very important for logistical companies now is the quality of software that they offer. Like the entire experience, the entire uh, pick up, drop, tracking system, the, uh, the ease with which we can upload orders, uh, that has become very critical. So all those things put together play a huge role. So again, coming back to pharmaceutical, we have found we, we have now five or six numbers. What we'll do is just call them up one by one and one of them will be ready to talk. One thing that uh, I have done personally and it works is that you pretend to be an MBA student that, okay, hi, I'm MBA student. Uh, I, we, are, we are doing this project where we need to understand logistical requirements of pharmaceutical companies. Can you please help me with certain data? And it often works. It just so happens that people are open much more open to talk versus uh, versus when you uh, come across as a professional. Even better if you can go out and meet a few people in person, that will also give you a good understanding. But for customer research, it's mostly about how creative can you get, how many customers can you talk to. So if you talk to a few of these, you'll get a lot of your answers and then visit a few of them as well. Next, let's say we talk about distributors and retailers. So again, okay, so this was about manufacturing companies. So here we should not have seen, uh, we should have seen uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers near me. So he, here we might have to few, we might have to knock a few doors, but if we talk to a lot of them, uh, we will we will get a few answers. 
try to visit one or two factories that will explain that if you visually see it that will that will make you understand even better next is for customer research for pharmaceutical again distributors and then go to retailers as well talk to them just you can talk to them as an mba student as well that does not really work if we meet in person but on the phone it works wonders so this is how we talk, understand one particular user segment uh pharmaceuticals different people just talk to them go there with your questions and even without questions go there talk to them you will see things around and lot of things will become clear and this actually gives a lot of a lot of edge to you as well because a lot of analysts are not will not do this because it requires actually a lot of effort going down talking to people finding the right people even a lot of rejections so this will this is something that gives a lot of edge lot of new data that's collected and that's exclusive to you so this is first segment now what happens after this we'll come we'll do the, we can do the same for different customer segments fmcg apparel steel and cement repeat the same process just talk to different people who are involved in the value chain for steel and segment let's say visit a small a uh, smelter if that's a word i don't i'm not uh, fully aware let's say visit a small factory or whatever the word is uh, near you as small as possible it does not have to be a steel authority of india office it can be a local small office a small manufacturing plant talk to them go visit them you'll understand the requirements next talk to certain people who actually are involved in the uh, in the logistics of steel then talk to few people who sell steel retail it so this way you'll understand the different customer segments and it takes a lot of time and effort but it's a process that is very very worth it it's a process that require can take can be done from two days to two months depending on how much detail you go into but this is what an equity research analyst has to do uh for b2c so this is how we go about b2b for b2c Uh, for b to b what happens is you can collect data by talking to few people and that should be representative of a of general people but with b to c what happens is you need to reach a larger number of people if you reach let's say 7 8 people or 10 people and they are uh, they are they are of certain kind so in that case what will happen you you might get poor sample poor results like poor, you might get incorrect data so let's say a small sub sub segment of people they behave in a certain manner uh, which is different from let's say a small you survey 10 people and they don't like iphones at all in the sense they come from lower middle class low 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 income families and they do not approve of iphones so if you talk to only these 10 people what your understanding will be that okay iphone does not have a market in india and this can be this cannot be more far from truth so here what happens with is with b2c you need to talk with a larger seg- segment of people so here you can talk to delivery agents they meet a lot of people and they'll tell you about customer behavior you can get a lot of online reports as well online reports means they would have talked spoken to these people and basis that they would have submitted results uh youtube twitter comments are actually of lot of value this is very surprising you can't submit it to someone you can't show it to someone but this is something that's of lot of value uh, if you just go on how uh, if you just in this case uh, let's say you search up a word like a video like how logistics works in india simple this search you might have 10 or 12 videos and just read a few comments there you will understand a lot about the industry because those are people talking people talking by themselves uninitiated so that is one of the biggest places where you get a lot of candid version of people however that is not something which will qualify for the lawyer mindset that we spoke earlier it's just something that gives you more confidence look for products and service videos so with this we understand the different customer segments it takes a lot of time but it's very important to understand the products and service customers of any given industry without that we won't uh, we won't get anything conclusive out of it because we don't know who are we sell who is the industry selling to what is it selling last we need to understand the products next so how do we do that go through the websites the 
always web most websites will have this section our services our products all these things so if you go through them you'll understand and do this for different companies in the industry so if you do this you will get an understanding of the different products and services the company has to offer the industry has to offer and if possible visit a few branches of these companies as well and try collecting the brochures that is the key if you can collect the brochures and compare the products uh, that will give you a lot of understanding lot of a uh, lot of detailed technicalities right so this is how we understand products and at times also what to be what's to be done uh, act as a customer so go to one of the stores pretending that you are a customer you want to buy something from the company uh, and just go through their products get a uh, get a explanation from the company or the from or from the sales person that okay these are our products these are the positives these are the negatives uh and this is something that will give you a very good look and feel okay this uh, okay, okay which products are doing better which products are not doing better what are the different offerings uh, in the industry and one very important thing while understanding products is to understand the substitutes is there something that can substitute the entire industry the if if there is something of this kind the industry is for a huge risk let's just take an example that we have taken early on petrol cars versus ev what is happening here petrol cars versus ev uh if you are understanding different product petrol cars different bs4 bs6 all these technicalities that are there you can understand you can spend time over here but the company the industry inherently has a risk of being substituted by evs that is petrol cars going uh, let's say next couple of decades going uh, it might become redundant evs can be the center stage everyone's driving an electric vehicle and the value has shifted towards electric vehicles so you need to understand is there something that can completely knock off the industry if that is the case then no matter what company we pick all of them are going to suffer so it's very very critical to understand uh, the evs uh, or i'm so sorry the substitute industries which are the industries that can knock off uh, different uh, no, uh, knock off the existing industries we'll take a minute uh, what we'll do is in the chat box write uh, please let uh, help me with certain industries you think that will be substituted and the industries that will substitute them so any uh, let me just go back there so hi rahul my name is anurag sundar ka i think uh, and, uh, i'll wait to i'll wait to hear any industry that you think will be uh, so uh, prashant we won't be discussing stocks that's the whole idea of the course you should be in a position at the end of it uh at the end of it that you are in a position to evaluate more about the stocks uh petrol to ev definitely bulb by led definitely a lot of it has already happened i'll just take a minute traditional banking with fintech might happen uh you need to be way more like we need to be very specific what pockets of fintech for now it is going to substitute them all it so yes rohan uh it is technology technology cannot substitute industries technology is a catalyst what it means is technology helps you get things done most more efficiently if education companies start using technology they have become they are they are an edtech company then but what 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 is happening uh it's just technology has helped them retake their education to more company more people uh take them to more people it's not it that has that is substituting the particular industry manual versus automation so okay these are themes that we are talking about okay this we need to understand uh we need to talk about particular sectors uh if we are talking about so okay train by hyperloop 
okay uh, this is uh, so this is something that's far fetched maybe but if it happens this is a proper uh, proper substitution versus uh, we had early on ps used by private banks yes it is happening a lot of it has happened in the past tvs by ott these are substitute products versus when we talk about manual versus automations these can so we can have manual versus automation in uh, in automobile in education we can have that let's say in there is an automation industry actually so this is that is a theme and not a substitute product otts can replace theater definitely and a lot of it has happened offline by online nikhilesh we need to be more specific what offline by online education yes clothing versus clothing to ai visual with whole body to cater okay i did not understand this uh traditional workspaces by metaverse yes uh, if the technology allows for it thermal to solar power yes metaverse but what will it substitute that's the question what is it substituting so this is where if so wherever we are able to find industries that are that where we are confident that okay this industry will substitute the existing industry that is where we have identified a good place to start looking for investments education shopping okay yes i think this is in context with something else social media to metaverse yes something on those lines can happen let me put on my screen so a lot of examples here restaurants to cloud kitchens yes wonderful example so in lately what has been happening is for restaurants the number two top costs included employee salaries and second the rent so with cloud kitchens what has happened they don't need any more waiters they just need the cooking staff and second they don't need la la uh, large spaces for people to come and dine in so the two most heavy cost the fixed costs for restaurants that have been wiped off so a big big and this is only possible uh with swiggy and zomato coming into the picture so yes uh that is how substitute products are working but i am not fully sure if uh our cloud kitchens will substitute the uh the restaurant experience uh, it will it will these two will coexist this is but again a lot of things can happen so this is how we collect information about products and understand the different substitute and whenever there is a substitute understand more about the substitute products as well in the same way so with this what will we let me just go back to this slide very quickly so with this what we will understand we'll understand the different customer segments we'll understand the products and services and we'll understand why are people buying those products so this will give us a very good understanding of the industry who are the customers what are the products and what's the link between them next we come to the technical part value chain industry map profit pool and demand support so let me come to value chain so what value chain exactly means value chain means uh what is the what are the different steps that need to be done to build that product so let's just take an example let's say uh let's take an example of ac so for ac or let me not say ac let me say ice cream so for to build an ice cream it's just a more relatable example so for ice cream what do you need companies first need to procure milk that can be from a vendor or from farmers itself then they need to uh, then um, uh, then they need to uh, maintain check the health of milk once the health is checked uh, ch milk then check the health then after that then it needs to be processed then flavors uh then uh ice cream what's the process i'm not aware uh then packaging and branding once packaging and branding is done next what can be done after that uh logistics so logistics will and then refrigeration and retail so logistics will include cold cold chain uh, logistics so these are the steps that are required for an ice cream to reach you for an ice cream to reach a consumer so this entire step by step activity this is called value chain what are the different activities that need to be done to uh, to deliver value to the customer 
that is value chain. Uh, let's take logistics here. For logistics, what will happen? Let's say pick up. Then, uh, so this is also called first mile logistics. After that, what we'll do after pickup, uh, collection centers. So where different people collect the pickups, then it is sent to some. Are you still using Google search blogs, YouTube to learn finance? It's time to switch to something more efficient. Introducing the all in one finance bundle especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time. Learn about personal finance, stock investing, stock trading, financial analysis, financial modeling, futures and option, MS Excel and so much more. Everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots. With 150 examples, 30 plus tools, 6 certified courses and 2 visual books for the next one year. Take the most definite step towards your finance career now. called sorting up so let's not get into technicalities uh, then it's sent to distribution centers that means similar to collection centers we also have distribution centers then we have let's say here it can also include warehousing so if the goods need to be stored for a for a few minutes for a few days uh, let's say Amazon they need to store goods as well so warehousing gets involved distribution centers and after distribution centers, uh, last mile, that is the delivery and then the end consumer. So all these activities, this is what value chain means. Uh, actually, let me put on a, a diagram as well. Porter's value chain. Okay, we see this here. So this is a, this is something that was uh, that was advocated by Mr. Uh, Michael Porter uh, about value chain. So all these activities, this is what forms value chain. If you don't understand it, let's not get confused with it. Uh, it's just the, pretty much the same thing. What are the steps involved? Here they put it in a technical manner: inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales related efforts, service related effort, then raw material procurement any R&D that the company does, what is the human resource requirement, uh, firm infrastructure. So what I would suggest is after this course, try filling up one of these for any given industry and would love it if you could share it on the platform or share it with me personally or at hello at Zebra Learn. It will give a lot of understanding. Anywhere you understand the value chain, you would have understood what are the different parts of the business. And each of these activities have to be performed. A company needs to take care of each of these activities and within value chain also what happens is certain activities are more profitable than others. So we'll come to this in industry uh, in profit pool very soon. But what we mean when we say that is in India, very few last mile com logistics companies have been able to make money. It's a very loss making business, but a lot of warehousing business companies have done very well. They have made a lot of money. So certain acts so you can even invest in certain activities so we'll come to this but when you understand the value chain you understand the entire process now how do you understand the value chain one is look for reports wherever possible it will not always be available at times it's not there uh, search for terms like value chain for express logistics in india value chain for express for xyz industry in india and you will understand it second visit the company uh, visit the company. What we mean when we say this is uh, visit a small company as well. That's also fine. If you visit us a, a very small local logistics companies, they will still be do, doing all these things. We, the, uh, the size will be small, but you'll still understand the different processes that are required uh, within the logistics firm. Uh, it does not have to be a huge firm. It does not have to be a listed entity as well. A small local shop, a uh, local logistics player, just go and talk to them and understand this process. Once we do that, that and this will give us the best understanding. Why? Because we'll be we, once we see things by, by our eyes in this process, we are in a position to take better decisions. Uh, it just gives us so much more insights. You can even call the analysts from credit rating agencies that can also work at times. 
uh, talk to some senior person working in the industry might not work might take time you never know also one thing that i personally prefer a lot is youtube videos whenever uh, so just look for expl- uh, value uh, just look for how logistics segment works how logistics company works and there you will we will see someone walking you through a logistics company someone talking walking you through a store uh, not a store but a warehouse so in that case what will happen in that case uh, you get, you get a visual representation of how things work on the inside in different companies so when you visit a few companies talk to a few people and watch a few videos on youtube and then go through reports this should be enough to understand value chain for any given industry so this is how we talk about value chain i hope uh, this is understood let's take an example uh, let's take a very relatable example let's take an example of ipl team let's say you are the owner of csk or CK, uh, kkr or rcb whatever that team is what are the different things that you will have to do uh, what are the different things that you will have to do uh, to for it to work well for your franchise to work well let me very quickly have a look in the comment section how is chain analysis a customer segment analysis help in equity research okay ananya how it helps is a uh, value chain analysis and a uh, customer segment analysis it helps you understand in the second part when we talk about companies which companies are able to do which parts of value chain well so competitively let's say within within uh within we just saw the last mile logistics framework we just saw that in logistics there is something called last mile uh i'll come to this question very shortly let me just uh, answer the this one that i'm answering uh, uh i just lost track uh, so yeah so uh if you if you we just saw the example of logistics segment and we saw that last mile logistics has been very uh like loss making for most companies so and in this you see one particular company that's profitable in loss me uh, last mile logistics due to reason can be anything reason is they only operate in tier 1 cities so in that case that is a great example for you that is a great example for you where to pick that company and work more on it because that company has a competitive advantage over others so that is how we see customer segment analysis equity research uh customer segment analysis value chain analysis helping in equity research it's the entire process of how you comprehend information and process it that uh that uh that actually adds uh that actually helps you take a decision uh coming back to ipl uh, any for follow up question i would love to take ananya on that uh coming back to ipl yes selection of players building the team sponsorships that's very important to get sponsorships good team balance so again the team building process brand creation so a lot of marketing advertisement because if brand creation is weak they will get poor te- poor sponsorship deals uh then okay so this is uh management and logistics definitely a huge point uh one thing that a lot of us missed is stadium management so they need to sell tickets they need to make sure that they have enough fan following that the tickets are being sold uh then so correct so performance team building management logistics and uh, stadium management uh buying empires no sabina while skip that uh, that does not that's not uh, it's not it's good for uh, uh so yeah so these are things that are required in value chain coming back uh industry map so what exactly is industry map industry map is this is these this is the company this is how it looks actually let me just draw it here okay so this has been a very poor drawing so when you draw an industry map this is how it looks a uh, company 1 company 2 company 3 so all the different companies that are there in the industry this side you list down all the suppliers and this side you list down all the customers and middlemen so for logistics who are the suppliers uh the truck owners if the company is leasing or the truck companies if the company is buying 
then drivers then let's say warehouse owners then let's say what who else uh, just help me in the comment section who else who will be suppliers to a logistics company uh let's just say uh local labor uh and media advertising because they'll have to advertise as well and who will be the customers let's say b2b customers b2c customers uh let's say there are brokers involved in between so broker between firm a and uh, the logistics company then let's say there are certain web portals such as uh, i think there is something called porter.com uh something called uh, there is revigo so all these different companies they accumulate demand and send it to uh, blackbug also here yes so they send it back to uh, these companies so we need to understand the different suppliers and the customers and that is what an industry map is but a very important point is bargaining power is there anyone who has very very important bargaining like very high bargaining power over the given industry so if that will be that will be the case then what will happen uh the company's profits will be sucked out if let's say uh, all the truck owners in the country they formed an opinion they formed one uh once they formed one uh, association and they together started they basically they negotiated together they'll ask for higher rent higher truck uh, fees so if the truck fee is higher in that case what will happen uh, the companies will pay them more and profits will be down right so is there anywhere where the bargaining power is very high i'll give you a very cliche example of bargaining power killing companies and industries so back in 1980s and 1990s there, there were a lot of computer manufacturers dell there was lenovo let's just take these two as example so computer manufacturers but for supply they needed microsoft uh microsoft uh, os or microsoft uh, license basically so now what happened and only company that was available was microsoft which was commonly accepted otherwise apple was not apple was, did not sell so, uh, software to these companies and others were not accepted by the customers so each license so out of let's say every laptop or every pc that they sold let's say 30000 they would pay this is just a hypothetical number they would pay roughly 10000 12000 to microsoft just for their license and these companies were left with absolutely very poor profits and my, you know the size of microsoft it just grew leaps and bounds because of the monopoly that it had because of the huge uh, bargaining power that it had so any one set of people has huge bargaining power what will happen the company's profits will be sucked out in that particular scenario be it a customer or middleman or a supplier if the company has to absolutely buy goods from them and they don't have competition within them uh, so this is something that's very important to understand what will happen is let's say you get someone you get let's say web portals have lot of bargaining power i'm just this is not the case but let's just say they have a lot of bargaining power what will happen you for you as an investor you might stop looking at logistics companies and start looking at these web portals as a potential investment so for you it doesn't matter wherever most profit is being attracted that is where most value is being created and that is where you would want to invest so what happens is profits and value does not get created equally everywhere it's all about bargaining power and with this map what happens we are able to locate who are in the best position to who are in the best position to attract most of those profits second we have something called profit pool this we saw early on as well so what profit pool does is it is something like this let us let me just go back to this different activities that need to be performed in the value chain we ask two questions for each activity how big is the activity and second question how profitable is it so this will give us our profit pool so if we come back to this 
what will happen is we'll understand which are the biggest activities so let's say in a let's say to deliver a 100 rupee uh, a parcel that has been uh, that has 100 rupee as shipping fees let's say 50 rupees has been la cost for last mile logistics so this is the largest activity amongst all these right let's just take say that so if last mile logistics is the largest activity so that is the biggest activity in terms of size in all these but it's is how profitable is the activity it's very low this is the most profitable activity so what we are understanding in profit pool we need to understand which is the most profitable industry activity in the value chain and which is the biggest one there will be certain companies who are doing only that activity we will find companies who are only doing warehousing so warehousing might be uh, small in in this overall scheme, uh, scheme of things but it's very profitable and in that case we'll look for dedicated companies in that com company in that industry rather dedicated companies uh, who are only doing warehousing because by definition they'll be very profitable or more profitable than others versus we'll also find only companies that are doing last mile logistics but these companies will have large revenues but will generally be less profitable or even loss making in many scenarios and for that we might have to find data from ministry of corporate affairs website so let's just skip that that will get too complex for now but for an understanding this is what we need to do warehousing and last mile logistic uh, logistic just uh, you look for the activities which are the biggest and you look for the activities which are the most profitable and with a balance you choose companies that do more of profitable activities so that is how that is the third point profit pool lastly we talk about demand supply scenario and then we'll take a quick break so demand supply scenario is something that's pretty straightforward a lot of you would understand it already so to un uh, so use government data here only that's one very important thing because we'll find a lot of data points a lot of places so coming back uh how do you understand demand so demand almost there will never be an exact number to it uh, in logistics what we'll have what we'll do is we'll estimate demand in res with respect to growth of major industry that uses them so pharmaceutical fmcg apparel if pharmaceutical grows the logistics demand will also grow if fmcg grows logistics demand for fmcg will grow if apparel grows logistics demand for apparel will grow for let's say uh, for cement if it's cement sector what will happen under cement sector demand will be directly related to construction investment if the investment in constructions is increasing the demand for cement will also increase so so these are things this is how we understand uh, demand we can take indicators of it estimate growth using uh, like how how where is the demand going is it upwards or downwards demand can also be downwards so something similar to or for what can be the case for let's say automobile uh, in india automobile like petrol automobile let's just say so demand can be upwards downwards flat so what is the direction of demand uh, what are the demand drivers like what are the factors here we saw construction investment so here we saw growth of the different industries that drives our logistics requirement so talk to the companies talk to people in sales get the numbers from various government sources look for things like uh, logistics demand india uh, india this way so this is how this is how uh, this is how we can collect a lot of data about demand uh, in logistics it's difficult to estimate exact supply because it's not a it's not a regulated industry it's not something that's well monitored you don't know how many trucks are there on the road uh, which are directly into logistics which are active which are inactive so you can expect changes uh, you can uh, you can estimate by understanding the variables related for example each month how many trucks are getting registered so this is a variable that we get, this data we get from government every year uh, every month rather so if we have if we track this we can get an estimate of supply now very very important it is to understand how much time 
it takes for new supply this is something very important so what do we mean by uh, what do we mean by uh, new supply so let's say you want to increase supply in logistics of trucks what will happen you can buy trucks and that supply can be increased quite immediately but let's say you want to increase supply for warehouse for to increase warehouse supply what will happen you need to build the warehouse go find adequate locations that process might be 6 months or let's say 1 year so how much time it takes to increase supply is something that's very important uh if supply can be increased immediately then supply demand imbalances won't last for long but if supply can not be increased immediately then if there is over demand the prices will shoot up quite instantly and profits will also shoot up so we need to understand demand supply and over short term as well as long term over long term where is it headed and over short term uh over short term means how much time does it take for new supply to come in for old supply to go out for demand to increase all those factors but if demand supply is imbalanced that is your golden opportunity if you can be in a position where demand shoots up and supply is not able to catch up that is the case where a lot of value will be created for companies that are there so this acts as a huge huge value creating uh, step but it is not easy to identify supply demand shocks uh, supply demand shocks uh, because you never know what happens what uh, uh, if if the if the information was clear everyone uh, that, that would have been reflected in the price as well so so with this what we have done is so far uh, we have understood these two sections we'll have we'll spend another hour and these other sections should be quite straight forward won't take as much time as these two these two were quite technical in nature uh, so we'll start with the other exercises uh, or the other four points immediately after a quick break so let's break the session for a water break maybe 5 minutes so let's actually it's 12:30 let's resume at 12:35 let's resume at 12:35 meanwhile i'm still here in the chat so anyone has any questions let's just stop for the next 3 4 minutes 5 minutes rather in the chat section uh let me actually stop the screen share for 5 minutes can you put the screen off rohan so yes any questions so guys don't leave please guys don't leave uh, we are just we are done through half the session and it's going to be lot of things that are to come very quickly after this and a lot of it is to come up uh, any questions uh, so after, at the end of it you'll be in a position where you can identify understand any given industry any given business that even if you want to start a business in it so so uh any questions hi anurag uh we have questions everything is going well and i can see in the comments the uh, all our attendees and they have actually helped us reach 100 uh the number of 100 subscribers really oh, yeah. thank you for all the love that you have uh uh good right so much other skills required to get into equity research so ananya uh what i'll say is with equity research uh, one very important skill other than obviously the research part is your report creations so what will happen is initially definitely initially not uh, for for the first couple of years to 3 years in your career you will be hired based on the past reports that you have made and your understanding of those industries so that is something that's very important the ability to communicate your uh, findings uh so that is something that's very important second thing that i can say is financial modeling can come in handy not exactly for investment activities but if you work with large buy buy side or sell side firms they require financial modeling to create uh they they require financial modeling to create those uh those uh sorry uh to create those reports and to serve their business purpose how can a ca get into equity research i really like analyzing business so that's a great start for sadik uh, uh also ananya i think financial modeling other than that uh i think yeah these two should be good for now and other than obvi that obviously the skills remain very important 
and uh, read as much as you can. As an equity research analyst, you'll be reading quite a lot. Coming back to Sadiq, uh, how can you get started in equity research? Sadiq, I'll say read books. That is number one place to start and build a few projects. Without building projects, start any industry that you're comfortable with. That uh, start with that industry, create a report, create three, four reports, go for an internship, uh, spend two, three months in an internship, keep reading alongside as well. If you find, if you need help, take a course. If you don't, that's also fine. Uh, and after that, uh, after that, you can start. I think you should be in, with an internship and have some experience in valuations. Okay, valuations is one part of it, Sadiq. Uh, other than that, Research also remains a very critical factor. Uh, okay, I think I'm missing a few comments. So does this video will be uploaded on YouTube? I am not sure, Prince. Uh, I think Ron, Ron can answer it, but I'm not sure on YouTube. I think they will upload it somewhere. Uh, special thanks to okay, uh, Rahul suggests some good books. Okay, my favorite book, the first book if you want to read is, actually I, what I'll do is I'll put up a li list of books after this. That's a great point. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this book, uh, The Warren Buffett Way to start. That was my first book about eight years back uh, in this field. Uh, second book is uh, Five Rules of Successful Stock Investing. That's by Mr. Pat Dorsey. So that's also very good. Uh, that's also very good for beginners. And yeah, I think these two books should be good start. I will suggest Warren Buffett Way to start. Uh, after that, my uh, I, I really like those two books. Uh, value proposition design and business model generation don't start with heavy books don't start with intelligent investors and security analysis because that can be your fourth or fifth book that can't be your first book you will lose interest in the topic so under the financial services industry there are many sub industries yes there are how can we narrow down to for research it will be very fast uh, i wish there was an answer to this roshni uh, you it's you need to treat each of these as a different as a different industry that's what i'll say uh insurance and banks have absolutely nothing to do with them except the fact that they are they qualify under financial services these are two completely different business models uh so i will say treat each of them don't treat financial models industry financial services as one industry T treat each of them as an in, uh, as a separate industry How how about One Upon the Wall Street? Yes, it's a great book, but I don't think start with that. I think uh, what happens with One Upon the Wall Street is uh, it covers a lot of topics for a beginners to start with. Uh, you need more, uh, so that can be your these so these books can be your third fourth books, but I would not say. Uh, and whenever you read One Upon the Wall Street, make sure you follow it up with Beating the Street as well. Like both of them together. Can we get the slides? I'm sure you will. Uh, how much career scope is there in equity research analyst? So I don't know if you're asking pay scale wise or end uh, goal wise. Uh, pay scale wise today in Bombay, some starting salaries are around 35,000, 40,000 per month uh, for uh, absolute fresher. Uh, again, this is on the lower end. Uh, it goes higher as well. On the upside, there is no upside to it. If you are if you are in a position where you can manage a team uh, and if you create a reputation for yourself, uh, manage a team by that I mean manage uh, funds with under you and if you create a reputation for yourself it's absolutely endless companies won't let you go uh, they'll pay whatever uh, like they have to because see it's a very you don't need an army of 500 equity research analysts to manage biggest of funds on the planet a team of even Warren Buffett has such a big fund but he only has a team of 30 35 people so that is why it it's more about quality of people than number number of people in the industry. So if you have good, if if you had, if you have a good, what I was trying to say is that if you have, if you focus on the skills, uh, there is absolutely endless career scope that I can say. But again, one one disclaimer: it's not it's not some it's not a field where thousands and thousands of people are required. Something that happens in IT where absolutely lacks of people are required every year. With equity research, a few thousand are required, but if you have the quality, then you keep on going up on the ladder. Is financial analysis a part of equity research? Yes, it is a sub part of equity research, but financial analysis is used elsewhere as well. Uh, not just in equity research, investment bankers also use that. Uh, so yes, it's a sub part of it. 
any questions we are about to start so let's start again guys how to start with the report just just know uh, what i'll say ananya is download four or five download four or five uh, report sample reports and refer them and follow it up follow it up uh, follow it up see report making is just a part of the this, analysis sir? which needs well, to process we have something more to do download the zebra learn app writing. get free courses to learn from attend days. live events with experts work on assignments connect with Good experts format. basically everything you need to build Basic a career in finance industry company download the app now stop prices no that's not the case uh, when you have money invested in something you tend to be pulled towards the stock prices to look at it and also when you want to buy something you can't ignore stock prices but it's definitely less integrated it's definitely less integrated with uh, with uh, equity uh, with equity research like professionals as much as it is with retail participants so within equity research people will talk about businesses people will talk about competitive positions uh, sales growth all these factors way more than the uh, stock price the stock price also will be discussed that's not something that it's completely ignored I, i hope i answered the question right i will i think we'll start with the session i'm getting a lot of questions but what will happen is after the session we'll have one hour where we can talk endlessly about anything and everything it's been two years since my mba have been sending hundreds of applications but not getting caught can you see can i survive in finance sector uh i think you should there is no reason why you should not be able to survive in finance sector without csfa however it will add to value uh if you have them but without that also i think work on the skills prepare some sample work and share it along with your resume that should help demand for financial analyst in india so see financial analyst is a very broad term you need to understand what exactly uh, like financial analysis in what context is it for an investment banking operation or is it for equity research so you need to understand those as well uh i have not seen honestly uh too much core financial anal- analysts it needs to be combined with something else as well uh so that is what i would say uh, other than that i would say that i'm not fully aware to, i'm not fully in a position to say how what's the scope of pure financial analyst in india where can we get a uh, ppt i'm not aware i'm so sorry i think somewhere on the platform app a uh, app a uh, platform or youtube somewhere you should be getting it so let's move back guys we'll take on all these questions after this again right so the first thing that we talk about here is market size a very very important topic how big is the industry let me ask you a question if you own the company that's the biggest ice cream seller in the country there is app your products are absolutely mind blowing there is nothing that's bet no company in the world that big, big creates ice cream better than you you are an indian company how big can you become how much can you sell let's say 10000 crores let's say 20000 crores correct versus so this is this is this is the size this is the market size let's say you sell 40% let's say 60% of all ice creams in the country then you sell let's say 20000 crores of ice cream let's say in telecom how big is uh, how big is the smallest player in the country let's say vodafone idea is the smallest right now of three how big is that they would be let's say about i'm not sure of the exact number 80 90000 crores in sales maybe or i'm not sure of actually of the number but whatever that number comes out to be how big can you become is the question uh, uh geo might be let's say 20000 crores in sales already if they increase the prices go up everything increases they can become much bigger than what they already are right so what i'm trying to say is if everything goes well how big is the industry how big is the opportunity how big is how big can it become so this problem today if we take an example of asian paints asian paints roughly occupy 60% of the industry and the industry is growing at 6 7% per annum let's say so for for asian paints to become any bigger the paint industry has to grow right for paint industry to grow 
what do you mean what happens when paint industry grows asian paints will grow in that same line this won't happen right that this becomes every paint that they sell uh, is of asian paints only this won't happen that they get 90% of industry or even if they do after that they won't grow right it won't happen they get 105% of industry so the market size is a problem here the market has to grow for asian paints to grow so a very very important question uh how big is the market how do you get that you can simply look it up market size of paint industry in india so what i'll do i'll say is uh, i'll take a take, while i search this um in the meanwhile you can post in the chat section looking it up on google what is the market size of chocolate industry in india so somewhere it will be mentioned so here they have said 57 trillion dollar uh, rupee indian rupee so you so if different companies will give up different numbers 70000 crores here they are saying 70000 here they are saying 57000 crores i'm assuming 1 trillion rupee is so 1 billion rupee is 100 crores so uh, a trillion should be Well, fifty-seven lakh crores. No, I don't think this number should be correct. This should be. I am. I am not fully really sure this number is correct. This this can be number. So seventy thousand crores uh, is what the sales is for. Let's say paint industry rough estimate. Sixty-two thousand crores, seventy thousand crores. So these are huge industries. So this is how you get market size. Versus let's say ice cream would be ten thousand crore industry in the country. So players will not be able to become absolutely huge in that industry. So let me just go to the ch uh, chat button. Let's see, US dollar one point nine billion. Yes, perfect. So I think uh, in twenty twenty. So this is the amount of chocolate sold in India. So is that a big industry? One that's about a fifteen thousand crore industry in the country. So this is something that becomes really really important. Uh, where were we? This is something we need to understand. What is the size of the industry? we will the bigger the industry so for example ev today is getting so much hype because it's a huge industry automobile is lakhs and crore lakhs and lakhs of crores uh worth industry uh, maruti alone has i think sales upwards of some 50 60000 crores uh, i don't know the exact number but yes so you need large industries for companies to become absolutely large so that is that is this question market size the next question is market stability how stable are the companies over here in this particular industry so let me take two examples let's take example of paint and mobile phones and let's take the year 2015 and 2020 here again 2015 and 2020 so what it means what does paint means here uh so who are the biggest companies for paint asian paints uh berger nerolec if you do a detailed analysis what will happen uh you'll see that again the order remains the same the market share also has changed only a little bit so this is an example of stable industry where the biggest firm remains to tend like the big firms remain to uh, tend to remain big there is not huge shift in market shares versus second example let's take of mobile phone so which were the biggest uh, mobile phone companies in 2015 in india you had samsung you had micromax again other than apple you had companies like lava intex so and there were other companies as well now in 2020 uh, you have uh, you have oppo you have vivo you have samsung maybe somewhere li little lower in the uh, market share chain you have redmi i think uh, you have xiaomi and all these guys as well so what is happening this is an unstable industry an industry that changes market share and if we actually compare not just 5 years if we compare 2018 and 20 then also we'll see changes in the market share uh 
so if we look at it if we compare things this is an, an unstable industry this is a stable industry you want industries to be stable as a public space investor why because if you're betting on winners you want them to be winners 3 4 years down the line 5 years down the line you don't want them to become a uh, industry like from leading positions to lag lagard positions immediately or very quickly you have you need to have enough strength in the company so that they sustain their leadership so this is what happens in stable industry things remain stable in unstable industries market shares change very quickly very important like immediately so this is what we'll do this is what we understand by market stability so so far we need large industries we need stable industries third we talk about pricing power so these are different industry characteristics within pricing power what do we need to understand we need to understand can the industry increase prices and not lose demand and increase prices we mean uh, prices to increase profits not to pass on their costs so let's say let's take an example of qsr chains in india mcdonald's subway pizza hut all these guys have been able to increase their prices 5 6% year on year in fact mcdonald's has been able to increase prices for 12 to 15% year on year that means something that costed 100 rupees today might cost 115 next year or the size of the 100 rupee one will go down so this ability to increase price to increase profits and this is actually just to increase profits it's not nothing to do with raw material prices or inflation maybe 3 4 rupees or 5 rupees were to reflect the price increase of raw materials but mostly this is to reflect the reflect the uh, the profit increase so does the company or industry increase price and not lose out on demand so in that pricing power can be for industries as well as for companies so it might happen that in certain case certain companies are able to increase prices but the industry is not able to increase price so just hold on yeah so or rather opposite i just i just messed it up uh in certain cases few companies are able to increase prices and the overall industry is not able to increase the price so we need to understand that does the industry have pricing power if it has great but the uh, but the thing with pricing power is it's so rare that uh if we look up for pricing power always we'll end up we have to pay up uh, high valuations for those companies and industries let's take an example of iphone they have complete pricing power over their products because of the brand let's take an example of telecom providers in india uh telecom providers uh again we have jio airtel so because the competition is so high and also the prices are a bit regulated not a lot but a bit regulated uh due to that reason pricing power in this sector is absolutely missing it's very low right now unless and until they form some sort of cartel or something uh versus let's take an example of oil companies in middle east so because they have a cartel so these companies have together come uh, they have stopped competing they have come together and formed a cartel and this cartel allows them pricing power because they can control the supply uh, that we discussed earlier on they can control the prices that are there in the market as well so this these are certain examples where you have pricing power and these are examples where you don't have pricing power so this is how uh, this is how market size industry stability pricing power are used next we have competitive life cycle so where exactly is the company which stage is the company in right now just a second yeah so where exactly is the company right now uh competitive life cycle wise so is the industry i'm so sorry i was using the word company repeatedly so is the industry in early stage let's say 
something like crypto exchanges in india so you had uh, coin dcx you have d2 d2c something uh, so all those companies those are early stage companies let's say so in this case what will happen these companies are very early stage they'll burn a lot of capital to introduce uh, the product uh, crypto as a as a product is also not yet regulated things are not very stable so they are early stage so industries that are in early stage they will have a certain set of uh, behavior what we mean when we say that these companies will have new product innovations new products high r and d they'll also have uh, new products high r and d then they'll have high promotion expense high prices so all these things will be characteristics of early stage companies they'll not be making very low revenue now i'm not sure if all crypto exchanges fall in that i think some of them might have passed that as well uh next let's say growth some sector some companies are in growth mode for example online gaming or for example we have lot of fantasy apps for uh, fantasy league apps so uh, something like dream 11 my dream my team 11 all these companies so they have their product established now they are in growth phase revenue is increasing rapidly prices coming down heavy promotions low profits because they are spending all on promotions right now so this is so we need to understand actually which stage is the company in if you are in a early stage innovation stage you can expect that the companies might not work out value proposition wise as well if you are in growth stage you can you will be you will you can expect that the company's growth is very high very fast uh, but it also has a cost profitability will be low they will constantly require external capital then we have mature companies that have steady uh, steady scale steady sale rather profits margins are there investment requirements are done uh then we have uh then we have what like profits are there so all these characteristics of mature company uh the growth will be lower than uh growth companies and then we have declined companies the companies that are started to go down so basis which industry do you invest in you will expect results based on the life cycle that they are in you can't invest in a growth stage company and expect the risk to be low uh, like a mature stage company growth stage the growth will be high risk will be high those things will go together but if it works the return will be higher so the the fundamental remains the same if higher risk higher return lower risk lower return so risk can at times work out for us it can backfire as well so we need to pick industries based on which part of the life cycle they are in and which part is it that we are most comfortable with uh let me ask you a question let me ask you a question uh ipl teams today what will you say ipl as a whole what what where which part of which part of competitive life cycle is it right now growth stage is power cement yes digit uh, upi payments uh, upi payments uh, will be growth stage yes online payments uh any so ipl will be what stage tell me that uh i if you are running an ipl company what stage growth stage correct will someone say it's mature stage okay pratishtha uh, says mature uh so yeah it's a debate that can, we can get into growth stage or mature stage i would personally say uh, growth stage because uh because the the, the model they are uh constantly increasing uh the the growth is there basically but again that's something that we can debate upon uh they are const but the, the 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 other side is they they also have profits now uh so that that builds the argument for mature stage that yes it's the 14th season is the 14th year so one thing here time should not really be considered few companies or few industries have existed for decades in one particular space in one particular uh, zone so okay subrashi uh, says growth stage nikhilesh says growth stage 
uh, Kya says mature stage. So yes, actually we can debate upon it, and uh, and we won't be wrong in either ways. It's just how we look at things. And it's it's a very personal kind of uh, thing where you can pick and choose what's your where do you draw that line for mature? Where do you draw that line for growth? Next, we have disruption threat. So disruptions we have already seen early on uh, with uh, with the substitute products that we were seeing when we were seeing uh, uh, when we were seeing the uh, products understanding. So disruption is basically at what time point in time the value proposition starts. or rather stops to work so the reason why they were the customers were buying the products that's no longer true that the reason can be anything they they found some other products the need for that product went away but the reason let's say apple uh, has apple has lot of please yes uh, so yeah uh, apple has lot of uh, social value today but let's say 10 years down the line something happens and the brand value does not remain the same or there are other companies with better brand value social value so what will happen in that case in that case the value proposition has stopped working so that's not exactly a disruption but that is one reason why apple will face problems uh with disruptions let's say the need for mobile phones goes away uh there is something that comes up where uh let's say Yo, let's say we wear uh, i wear i'm just throwing random examples let's say we wear i wear and that has some calling facility in that and we can see the visual some some kind of technology comes up and the need for uh, need for mobile phones goes away so in that case and that was very that might very well happen landline phones and telephone telephones 15 years ago were thought that these will forever exist and today they have converted into an into a mobile phone correct so these are disruption threats that a company has today a very real disruption threat or that is there is for petrol the ones that we have discussed actually petrol and ev we saw uh, uh, we saw that as well uh, renewable energy so all those things are disrupt so anything that can break the industry that is what form that is what we call disruption threat uh you talk uh talk to experts they or consultants they know it the the first thing like whenever that happens they know it very early on in their in their process because they will face it in their day to day work life so so this is something that's very important to understand uh and it's actually difficult to understand honestly uh, because you we often get the information after it's late so we need to kind of be in touch with the experts people who work in the industry people who will know it first and also we need to take care of when does the management team act, uh, accept the fact that okay they are facing competitive pressures from other products so this is something that we need to understand uh, for disruptive threat lastly we need to understand the regulations that are there and two main regulations most importantly new product launch related regulations so simple google search will keep on uh, will share this with you and second any price control we will stay away from any industry that has price control if we can't control the price and the government controls the price we will stay away from those industries the reason for that the profitability will always will never be there for shareholders it will always be a company that will be run to meet the government's political intentions if let's say it's a petrol company and its con- price is controlled by government then the petrol prices will not be moderated for shareholders but it will be uh, moderated for the political intentions of the government that's monitoring or controlling the price so regulations wherever there is price control we will stay away from those industries not saying there is no opportunity to create wealth there but it's very difficult to do so second if there are huge number of regulations to release new products what happens in uh, what happens in pharmaceuticals so we need to be very careful here uh, if if we won't put a complete cross here but what we will do is we need to ensure that whatever company we are looking into going ahead uh, they have a solid pipeline already 
so for pharmaceutical companies in india if it's a 3 4 year product release process if it's a 3 4 year release process so in that case what will happen uh we uh, we need to ensure that they have a solid pipeline to follow uh because uh, the releases will take time any other regulations we need to make sure that we are aware of it uh, industry reports talk about value, uh, regulations also uh, government bodies do talk about regulation for example for logistics we recently released uh, got logistics policy national logistics policy not actually very recently it was i think 2019 uh, so they where they initiated bharat mala and sagar mala all these plans and multi they started emphasizing multimodal transportations so all those regulations we need to be aware of all those government initiatives also we need to be aware of so this will give us a good understanding of the industry characteristics how big is it how stable is it can they increase decrease prices what stage of the uh, what stage are they in? Uh, do they face any disruptive threat what are the regulations so with this we have understood all the let me again very quickly go back we have understood all the uh, industry characteristics all of them so now we have a very good understanding of the industry already we have understood why is it like customers and products different participants and outsiders and the characteristics of the industry very quickly we will cover profit forces now so profit forces is a concept that was uh, introduced by mr michael porter is a i'm sure a lot of you would have heard it in your uh, commerce classes as well so porter's five forces whatever uh, the one we study so it's a very very powerful tool that was developed it's actually he works with harvard research uh, he's a professor there as well uh, so it's a very powerful tool and what it says is that in an industry there are five kinds of people and these five forces can together affect the industry's profitability it is possible that the suppliers can suck all the profit out of the industry or the buyers can suck all the profit out of the industry or there is so much competition within the industry that the, they are not able to ensure profitability and the buyers and the sellers are the suppliers and the buyers rather they are enjoying the competition uh, there is a substitute product that's there and because of that the price keeps on reducing and profitability keeps on falling or there is a threat that if there is very high competition uh, very high profitability new players will come in in the industry and they will compete or they will take away all the profitability that's there in the industry so if you if you if you do not understand this we'll be talking about this in the coming slides but the idea here is any one person any one set of reasons can take away the industry's profitability so we need to be really assured like really sure uh, if the industry is retaining the profits that it is making and it is one of the most powerful tools uh, while understanding it, uh, any given industry so first things first supplier we have filled up this num these with uh, with logistic sector in mind but if we talk about just a second if we so if we talk about supplier power uh, can we substitute can, how many suppliers like if we are a logistics company who are our suppliers truck companies who are our suppliers uh, the the drivers the the local labor so uh, how are how many suppliers are there many right so we have competition between suppliers imagine if there was only one association which we had to bargain with for trucks what will happen our life would have been completely upside down the prop we would never be able to these guys would have uh, bargained very high uh, truck rent truck uh, truck fees so we do have labor unions for example imagine if there was one large labor union that uh, that defined the prices or the labor uh, the labor wage so in that case what would have happened we would be paying much higher than otherwise what we would pay so number of supplies are high availability of regular supply yes it's easy are there any substitutes to trucks and labor 
workforce right now no there are not we might have automation in the future to do some kind of work but right now a lot of it is done manually so no we don't have substitute cost of substitution we don't have substitute so there is no cost dependency of industry on suppliers moderate they can also buy their own trucks do suppliers threaten vertical integration no so vertical integration means can the truck owners become logistics companies themselves can they start taking orders so uh, they can become but size and scale wait wait i just saw that you purchased a product from zebra loan store and thank you so much we have something super super awesome for you introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses be it personal finance stock trading derivative financial analysis financial modeling uh, stock markets everything and anything that you want to learn in finance you have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period you'll have access to them as well this is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to get into this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle it becomes challenge they can't become tci express by just starting to take orders or they can't become a gati express by taking orders these are 2000 3000 crore businesses they can't become a they can't become a let's say ecom express uh, so these are different questions importance of volume to suppliers payment power with suppliers these are different questions that together tell us that okay uh, the suppliers have moderate power over them they don't have extraordinary power to bargain with the with the logistics company and that is why they won't be able to extract most of the profitability out of uh, the company so we understood supplier power next is buyer power there are multiple buyers small sized buyers medium sized buyers so what we want is we want lot of small suppliers and lot of small buyers we don't want few large suppliers or few large buyers because they will be able to uh, extract bargain rather bargain it's better terms for themselves and will mean low profitability for us and we also want in, uh, buyers to be less informed uh, we want these are the ideal case if buyers are less informed then they will they will choose the products that are not best for them so in this case the buyers are very informed so they will have to really communicate uh, the industry really needs to communicate uh, well uh, and uh, next is price sensitive sensitivity demand supply scenario payment power uh, do buyers threaten vertical integration so all these reasons all these we need to keep in mind uh, to understand if the buyers have a uh, extraordinarily high buying power or bargaining power so in this case because there are many small sized buyers they have medium uh, buyer power it's not too high so they won't be able to extract most of the company's profitability next is threat of entrance so again these are things that we need to see how much time does it take for a new entry how much time does do, do these companies benefit from high scale then uh, distribution strength required switching cost for customers as how specific is the asset uh, how specific is the asset so all these we need to understand uh, to understand can someone new come in the industry and become sizable so the idea here is they should become sizable it's not that uh, you start a logistics company anyone can start a logistics company tomorrow can anyone become a 2000 crore company tomorrow uh, so no it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of entry a uh, lot of effort but can someone with capital lot of capital do that yes someone can do it if, if let's say reliance start uh, uh, starts a logistics company they will become this size so threat of entrance is again moderate it's not too high not too low uh, common versus if anyone could start and become a, a take a sizable stand in the industry then in that case threat of entrance would be very high they would compete away profits threat of substitutes there are no substitutes for logistics right now uh, so yes there is absolutely no threat of substitutes competitive rivalry yes there is lot of competitive rivalry in the industry it's and one thing that we need to understand here is what do they compete on so here they compete on price 
so that is a big big red flag industries that compete on price are ones that destroy most of their value so for example telecom in india started comp- competing on prices that okay my services are cheaper than them and their services are cheaper than mine so in that case what happens everything takes a uh, like the profits of the industry they gets hit out like they go away versus let's take an example of pepsi and coca cola so pepsi and coca cola have never actually competed on price they have competed on ads who advertises more whose ads are better so whose brand awareness is better whose distribution is better so distribution is also something so in the, with this competition what happens the industry grows pepsi and coca cola both of them benefits why because more ads means more people are aware of soft drinks and more people are aware of soft drinks uh, so that means they they are they will buy either of it they will buy either pepsi or coca cola and they will buy at full price they will not buy at prices competitive prices otherwise what would have happened let's say today a 20 rupees bottle would be available for let's say 8 or 10 rupees who is losing out on the top 10 rupees that 10 rupees lost by retailers by the bottlers and lastly uh, by the pepsi company themselves as well. so these are things that we need to understand a uh, competition rivalry so supplier power are the sub, we want small suppliers we want many suppliers buyer power we want small buyers we don't want lot of buy uh, we want actually lot of buyers we don't want few large buyers uh, that makes uh, that makes our life difficult then we want in entrance we want time and cost like high time required and cost required uh, for entry we want economies of scale we want prior brand uh, recognition reputation should be there to get orders so we want all these things uh, for for to, uh, for the industry to not lose value there should be no substitutes ideally and all these are ideal cases this will never happen that you get all the tick marks together it's just that we need to pick that which ones which are the ones we are ready to uh, we are okay to uh, compromise would be the wrong word but we can uh, we we can which are the ones which will not materially hamper the industry within competitive rivalry we want small competitors uh, than the this particular company we want the industry to be concentrated uh, and concentration means that there are few large companies that have lot of value a uh, lot of market share and we want companies to not compete on the Uh, basis of uh, price we want them to compete on ads service distribution all these things so that the industry as a whole grows also we want fast growth industry here uh, and as i was saying about concentration of industry so that means concentrated means few players and we our company should be one of those few players who are in a position to dictate terms so with this this is what porter's framework is and if everywhere we don't have a place where there is a major leak in uh, a major leak in uh, uh, in the industry uh, so then the industry should typically be very well pro- very good profitability any industry that is low on profitability will have one of these things one of these places where they suffer so we need to understand where exactly is the industry losing value next is we need to understand financial health so last two topics quick ones Uh, so what we mean by financial health we mean <coughs> how are the existing companies doing money wise or financially let me put it that way so how are the existing companies doing financially uh that's very important to understand if uh, we uh, we take example of let's say in cement we take largest of large companies ultratech acc ambuja then we also take small companies in the listed space let's say star cement uh then we take very small unlisted companies as well so for them we get data from ministry of corporate affairs 
it's a uh, it's a website let me just actually show it up very quickly so ministry of cheese uh, ministry of corporate affairs so here you have mca services so somewhere in this only i think documents of company services and i think data and okay yeah so here you can write any company's name and you, you get a data about uh, that particular company you can also download uh, i think somewhere here i'm uh, i have the link saved actually i can share it so uh, so uh, we have to find the companies we have to find those companies and we can download the entire income statement and we can download the entire balance sheet uh, for those come for the small companies if the companies in this in any given sector they are doing well if they are doing good let's define good they are earning at least 15% return on equity for anyone who is not aware of what roe is it's profits upon shareholder capital so any a company that at least earning 15% roe so if that's the case with 1 2 and 3 all these three segments so that means the financial health of companies is good in this particular space so different companies have different reasons to struggle but in general if this is the case with all these different categories of companies and this can be any space any sector then as a whole something is working for this industry and it is doing well right now if it has been this for few last few years that means the financial health of companies in this particular space is well or good and it should be a good place where you can look for investments or even start a business in so all that we have discussed actually comes in very handy even when starting a business so with this we have understood financial health last is outlook very quick one here we need to understand roe we need to understand the growth that is how fast is the company growing and the investment needs of these companies as well so take a note of these three roe as i said more than 15% uh, growth anywhere more than 10% uh, and investment needs how much capital do they need or how much capital by how much capital let's say their uh, fixed capital and working capital is increasing so it's all reported in the so fixed capital is basically their plant property equipment so where were we yes so it's all there in the income statement balance sheet we can download we get it in public for the bigger ones and for smaller ones mca but uh, this is how we we have to collect this data for different companies and if it's good for all of them then that means the financial health of that company or that industry is good last we come to the straight forward point that is the outlook what do we expect the company to do going ahead or industry to do going ahead so next thing that we need to identify is trends the key trends in any given industry so with logistics uh, for example it's moving towards multimodal so what multimodal basically means is uh multimodal basically means that let's say you want the parcel to be delivered from uh, mumbai to bangalore so early on what would happen it would go either by truck it would go either by train or air aeroplane something but now what's happening let's say mumbai the route can be mumbai to uh, pune in a truck then pune to uh, let's say hyderabad flight and lastly from here till uh, bangalore again uh, let's say train the reason why multimodal works is that uh, let's say the the flight here for uh, mumbai to bangalore flight to be full uh, they will require the entire flight load of uh, goods but let's say mumbai to pune has already ha already has truck one truck full of uh, logistics material so the cost comes down here quite drastically because they already have load 
Uh, so it's a little technical in nature. So let's not uh, get there. In the comment section, if you could put up any trends that you experience around that you see around. Uh, so trends for uh, so just put that. Let I'll, I'll come to that very quickly. Before that, trends. Where do we get data? We get data for it in the industry reports mostly that we saw early on, and by talking to people who are working in the industry. It's just a normal conversation. They will be the first ones aware of uh, the trend. Let's say uh, today hiring in tech in India has become let's say a challenge. So people in the industry are the first ones who are aware of the same. Uh, and only then will the reports pick it up, and only then will it reach out, reach to us. So contact people here, talk to report, talk here for reports. Uh, let me come back here. How buyer power power will affect uh, will affect uh, profitability? We'll take all the questions at the end uh, immediately after this. But by, just to answer quickly, buyer power will affect profitability because let's say if you have one single buyer. If you have to sell all the produce that you have to, let's say, a company, let's say Reliance, everything that you manufacture as a company to Reliance, what will happen uh, when you go to uh, negotiate prices with them? Uh, when you go to negotiate prices with them, they will use their bargaining power uh, to dictate terms, to give you low prices and get the goods from you at low price. Versus there are 50 companies because you also can't say to them that, okay, uh, I, okay, don't buy from me. I'll sell it to someone else because you only have one buyer over there. Let's say you have a market, let's say of 50 people, uh, 50 people, people can buy from you. So if one person is giving you very low price, you can give them, you can tell them, okay, uh, you can actually tell them, uh, okay, I'll send it to someone else and there you'll get a better price. How can we analyze industries health based on financial health of the companies that form a part of the industry? So I'll take this question actually later on, but uh, not this question, but questions in general. This question, uh, industries, financial health based on. Fa so what happens is in the companies put together, represent the industry because we are taking all kinds of industries. We are taking uh, all kinds of companies. We are taking large companies. We are taking medium companies and small companies as well. So together, if all of them are doing well in terms of financial health, that means the industry as a whole is doing well in terms of financial health. So that is how we can say that companies' financial health in general is indicative of the industry's health. But we can't say that on basis of one company's health. We need, let's say, seven or eight companies' health to pick that up. Uh, guys, if you, uh, if you could put up any trends that you see around anything that you see, so I would wait for that actually. Meanwhile, I can move forward. Any trends that you see around? Let's say one trend that we see is, uh, that personally I observe with myself is, even when there is a TV front of me to watch cricket, I will use my mobile phone and watch that. So even if there is a TV and I am accessible to it, uh, I have access to a TV. So that is a huge trend that I am seeing with myself uh, personally. Second trend that I see is when I went for a local and trends are things that we can observe by ourselves. Uh, when we, when we went to a tier two city, I went for, uh, so, uh, I observed in the rice market that people are now in the smaller towns and cities, people are now looking to buy organized in Dawat rice, uh, India, India, India rice, all those things over loose rice. So that is one trend that I saw. So such trends, anything and everything you can put up in the stream here. Would love to take it up. Uh, meanwhile, let's move forward with the last part. Uh, trends we have, uh, we have, uh, we have. Last thing is uh, industry-related risks. So what are the risks that the industry has? What are things that can go wrong? And how uh, how do you find them? So within every given industry, you will have a DRHP. DRHP is basically a document that every company has to file before IPO. So you will find DRHPs. 
So look for DRHP uh, IPOs in your given industry. Look for a DRHP, and there you have a section called risk factors. Go through the entire list, and they have all sorts of risks. They have to just list down everything that can go wrong. The promoter can can fall ill. The company's premises might catch fire. They have to list down everything that's that's possible under the roof. Our job as analysts is to identify two or three risks that can go wrong and can affect the company's survival or industry's survival. So anything that does not impact survival will not be uh, important for us. We will only focus on things that affect the survival. UPI from small shops to big, definitely a big, big trend. Uh, drones used for delivery instead of delivery boys. I have not seen it, but yes, if it's there, and I'm hopeful it will be there. Uh, it will be there. Uh, I'm noticing most restaurants are now forcing customers to buy mineral water. Yes, it is. This can also be called a trend. How do you benefit as an investor out of this? I'm not fully aware. Delivering groceries within 10 minutes by Zepto. So now where where does this 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 I won't say exactly a trend. Uh, are people ordering 10 minute delivery groceries and is their buying behavior elsewhere changing? Are they have they stopped going to Reliance Mart or uh, let's say other grocery stores because of Zepto? So if that happens, that is a trend. Uh, using in shots rather than reading newspapers. So this is in shots happens to be a typical name. We can say reading, consuming digital news rather than newspapers. So this has been a trend for quite some time. So industry related trends, uh, risks are uh, coming back. Uh, buying instant food rather than cooking. Yes, this is a big, big trend. Actually, instant ready food. Uh, instant food has, has become something ready to cook actually. Ready to cook actually has become ready to cook, ready to eat. It has taken, and particularly in tier one cities and metro cities, uh, it's just become such a large part of life. The frequency of people doing that, that has been, has increased quite a lot. Uh, so coming back to DRHP, uh, so let's say PCI Express, so any company So we have information memorandum. Let's see. Okay, TC Express did not have an IPO. It was a spin-off of an existing company. I am not sure if this will have. Let's just see if they have risk factors. Yeah, they do have risk factors somewhere on page 8 to 11. But this is a. So if we go to page 8. So they, so they have mentioned all the risk factors here and their explanation of it as well. But this is a relatively short list. Uh, this is only three or four pages. But if we read at it, if we read at it, uh, our company is in business of express distribution and any inaccuracy in forecasting future capital can affect liquidity, our dependency on outsourced vendors for key business. So this is an important risk. They depend on outsourced vendors and that part of business can go wrong. Fall in demand due to slowdown in other industries. Demand can go down. Uh, so if we look at a complete DRHP, this list, instead of having 8 or 10 points, has 30 or 40 points. And this is a great place to start. So men, list down all the risks that can, survive, that can impact the industry's survival. If that happens, that is a huge risk. Other than that, we will we can let go of few risks like the prices will go up uh, the risk from interest rate fluctuations those won't actually impact survival so we need to finalize or we need to understand what are the risks that we are getting into higher the risk so once you have identified industry risks that applies to all the companies within it as well so if you have pick any company in this industry in this logistics industry you will these risks will impact those as well so this is one next the last two factors growth factors growth fact by growth factors we mean what will make the industry grow and together with this we can list down variables for success so growth factors typically means why will logistics industry ever grow only because or only when the uh, customer industries grow. 
only then if e-commerce in india grows logistics will grow if uh, let's say pharmaceutical grows logistics will grow so growth it for logistics is tied to end customer or end industries oh, i just when the customer okay i just missed it up so uh okay okay i was right actually uh so coming back uh coming back so for every industry you can you need to uh narrow down on one or two reasons that okay this will happen then the industry will grow for let's say crypto exchanges if crypto is regulated the industry will explode that's it we can't list down 50 factors or 500 factors for growth it will be one or two or three factors even i think three is too much one or two factors tell me uh, let's do this write down any industry in the comment section and let's try to figure out together if we can tell uh, what what will make it grow let's say okay ipl uh, again let's again take our uh, our example what do you think will be the growth factor for ipl how can it grow further from where it is currently yeah delivery ipo drhp page 29 very well explained for learning correct so drh delivery drhp i just missed that delivery drhp will have a very good description of uh, of all the all the risk factors that are there uh, so for growth factors let's say an ipl team what will they have to do to grow what will be the growth factors actually what will be one or two things that will make the company grow meanwhile uh, let's take uh, while we get few examples there let me uh, let me take other example let me say for growth uh, uh let's say ac ac market will grow directly with the heat every year and uh power distribution expansion only these two things nothing else so so this is how we need to solidify the growth factors to one or two core and very specific things we can't have reasons over here like uh, because gdp of india will increase no that means nothing will if gdp of, of india will increase uh, for logistics or let's say for ac market will that translate into better power distribution or will that translate into uh, people uh, people getting uh, like people in spending more on such consumer goods if those things do not happen gdp increases does not mean anything uh, for this sector at least so uh, for growth factors we need to pinpoint one or two things that are absolutely specific more investment on training uh, correct for ipl adding more sponsorships correct adding more teams correct uh zaro khan is building a ipl practice ground in us and he promoting it to us in saudi so maybe something might come up over here so lot of people actually what they have done is lot of uh, so lot of football clubs what they have done is they have, they own their own stadiums they have made a business out of the stadiums for ipl to grow audience remains the next thing that is the number one important thing more audience like if we have 80 crore people or 50 crore people just throwing random numbers if we have 50 crore people who have to who are watching ipl this year will they watch will 60 crore people watch ipl next year that is one and second is time spent if people are watching ipl for 45 days will they watch it for 60 days will they watch it for 80 days will they watch it for 150 days that is the number two reason third reason can be uh, other country viewership that's a very valid point then again the team nft is crypto i get those answers as well uh, i am not sure how that works so i won't be in a position to tell a lot about it but yes maybe something on those lines so this is how we need to pinpoint a few factors that okay if these things will happen the industry will grow otherwise no. and second similar to it is variables for success and specific is being specific is very important for those these two so what are the two or three key variables that decide the success in the industry so if you are running a hotel company number of rooms that you have and average occupancy of rooms these are the two things that decide 
uh, these do that decide that okay how is the company how like if you have large number of rooms and low acu- uh, low occupancy you won't uh, it won't be a good sign if you have high occupancy and high rooms that is a big tick mark so what is required by companies to succeed in this particular industry this is what we list down here and only two or three factors we won't list down 50 factors in an i for an ipl team the brand value now how do you quantify that that is something so for i i, I for, for success in ipl brand value are you still using google search blogs youtube to learn finance it's time to switch to something more efficient introducing the all in one finance bundle especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time learn about personal finance stock investing stock trading financial analysis financial modeling futures and option ms excel and so much more everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots with 150 examples 30 plus tools six certified courses and two visual books for the next one year take the most definite step towards your finance career now so i think one of the reasons should be your past history of winning and losing and how many star players you have so brand value and viewership I think these two reasons will be make or break variables for success within an IPL team. So growth factors and variables for success with logistics. Uh, how many trucks you operate? How many trucks and average truck fill rate? So there is a fa- uh, there is something called truck f- uh, fill rate or factor load as well. So with fill rate, what happens is sixty percent of your truck going full, or is ninety percent of your truck full? Because the costs are fixed, petrol expense will remain what it is. Petrol expense will remain what it is. Most of the expenses will remain what they are. So what we need to do, uh, if the if the truck is sixty percent full, the the numbers will be uh, poor. If the truck is ninety percent full, the numbers will be good. So we need to identify the growth factors and variables for success. very important and lastly the evolution and history of industry so one very thing and this is the last topic actually one very important thing that happens is in india it said that in indian investing a lot of things happen in the same way that happened in us maybe 15 years ago not always but often maybe in china uh, 8 years ago or 7 years ago so it said history never there is this line history never repeats itself but it always rhymes so this is a very important thing you learn uh, as an analyst what it means is that we need to take learnings so actually few of my teammates are laughing on this Uh, but it's a very true line actually it's something that's that once you start working in the field you'll hear once a month definitely so uh what we are saying is what happened in us you can draw judgments from it logistics in us became a huge industry in the last 10 15 years uh in fact uh, fedex and all these players have become 100 billion dollar companies there so is this is it possible that in next 10 15 years india also produces a 100 billion dollar player in logistics uh we might say that yes it is possible who knows so these are things that you learn from play elsewhere that okay in south africa our logistics company is worth let's say 20 billion dollars so in that small space also a 20 billion company i'm just taking a random example uh, it's it's not even true actually but if in that country if to a small country there a 20 billion company can be formed then indian companies can be much larger so you find bigger bases for 100 billion dollar company here uh and the largest company right now in india let's say is 2 billion dollars for example so there is a 50x potential that's there if the all goes uh, to plan then next we have china where we have lot of companies like sf express uh we have uh vito s vito express we have sto express all these companies uh we also have the chinese state owned company into logistics so 
and these companies have become huge these companies are 10 12 billion dollar businesses right now and they are growing quite quite fast and alibaba also plays a very important role in this entire business so is it possible that something same can happen in india so a lot of emphasis is given to history of industry in other places because it helps us set precedents now it will give you way more confidence that okay now in logistics in us we have had us has already seen that journey of the top company going from 5 billion to 100 billion so it's something that's quite possible with the indian economy in india however history will not repeat itself it might not always rhyme as well but it is possible that it can happen so we need to understand these things and with this we would have had a very good understanding of any given industry uh we have in the last section we understood the risks growth factors variables for success and we have to be very specific here i can't emphasize that enough and lastly the evolution of the industry the history of industry everywhere else with this we would have understood everything that's there required to understand any given industry more people we talk to there will be better understanding lastly these are the resources that are to be used uh go and subscribe to reports for logistic associations uh read different magazines so actually i i follow this company there is this company called magster so uh so they have a lot of magazines and we can access it a lot of it for free so i i personally read this quite a lot so if you search your logistics let's just see if they have something on logistics so yes they have certain logistics related uh, magazines as well so do read these i think this one should be free only uh, i'm not very fully aware but yeah uh, we have lot of logistics so follow these magazines on logistics sector google alerts is something that's very heavily used set the correct keywords and your company names to stay updated every day sends a lot of noise as well but again it's something that just keeps you in track uh keep a track of international developments personally i have struggled with this always but because just so many things are happening in so many places and you won't just be working with one industry but it's important to keep a track of international developments keep a track of what various players are doing or saying uh this is easier said than done again the same thing so many things keep on flowing and keep in touch with industry experts this is something that can be done very easily talk to like seven eight people just have a call with them every six months also is fine every yeah that six months should be good like one call every six months should not be too much on you for also and for the other person as well and these resources and the annual reports and the resources we discussed early on should be enough uh material to understand any given industry in a lot of detail uh so very quickly summing it up uh, we have seen the industry sheet we have understood the value proposition customers and products uh activities and participants industry characteristics uh profit forces financial health and outlook hi guys i guess there is some issue with anurag uh and the whatsapp link has been posted in the comments and you can join that the whatsapp link has also been sent to you with the mail that you have received and uh, okay uh, if you choose banking industry it is the uh, all of your questions anurag will be able to answer it uh yes okay anurag is here i'll just Uh, join yeah, me yes i think there was some technical glitch yes. something got disconnected i th- i was talking and i think i answered a few questions uh very quickly uh just let i see a few questions rolling in uh before that uh i think there was one one point a uh, area under square area for warehouse so yes the technical word there is uh square feet managed of uh, warehouse square feet that's managed so different companies can have let's say 2 million square feet some company will claim 5 million square feet area of warehouse we manage so yeah different companies uh, claim that do we have financial modeling session no ashish i don't i'm afraid financial modeling will touch upon the basics but financial modeling in itself is a very very long process we'll have a i think we might have a separate four week free course for that but i'm not sure of the timeline and uh, things on those lines 
but in this course financial modeling just because of time will not be possible so sorry ashish on that please share application link i think rohan you can share that uh, i don't have the link how can i develop analytical skills rahul uh, honestly uh, no clear answer to that only one answer the best way to build a muscle is to use it uh, what i will say is start analyzing a few companies few industries or read articles if that's uh, if a company is too much uh, for to begin with and that is the only way how i think those muscles will be built over time uh, these are soft skills that can't be learned in a specific manner uh, i wish there was uh, a sim- uh, uh, an exact answer to that but i think more you use it the more you develop it please share linkedin to connect my linkedin is anurag sundarka if you search it straight forward i'll share it somewhere in the linkedin profile as well but i think my name is pretty unique in that ways you don't find another one in Insta- uh, on linkedin so i think you should be able to find it so can you explain uh, i just missed the question inflation will affect the margins on the companies going forward so yes shubham that's a very very good question and we can spend hours on that the answer is uh, so the answer actually relates to pricing power that we were talking about early uh inflation will increase the raw material prices for certain industries uh, for certain industries the increase will be more for certain industries the increase will be less and if those industries don't have pricing power or even enough pricing power to pass on the increase in raw material prices then the margins will be affected otherwise with a lag of about one quarter that is 3 months most companies will pass the like not most but many companies will pass the effect of inflation by increasing the uh, sales uh, prices but a lot of companies will suffer margin pressures due to inflation uh, if they are uh, if they are in a competitive environment and not able to pass the uh, inflation to end user great session thanks rishikesh thanks uh, i think thanks saksham uh, what should i do if i don't understand something in the industry reports uh i think join zebra learn i think there we sh- i we should be able to answer at uh, i think uh, you can ask people around but i i say honestly i think in most reports there will be certain things that you won't understand because uh it's just the nature of it i i picked up for example one industry called uh transformer oil industry about 4 years back and i did not understand one line of it uh where it started where it ended i just couldn't fix anything so in that case if it's too difficult for you i i i drop that industry it was just too difficult for me so start with something that you understand already again and again i was taking this example of ipl because that is something that most of us could relate with most of us can visualize if i took an example of let's say steel manufacturing company a lot of us will not be able to relate with it so start with something that you understand but if there is something technical you don't understand i think google will be of help zebra learn uh, put it on zebra learn i think someone should answer it uh and any f- suggestion you have that we can do to make it uh, answer it would love to uh, and other than that pick something initially that you understand uh, you have good understanding of so provide us everything on whatsapp nikhilesh i'm not sure how it will be communicated i think honestly whatsapp will be difficult because they have restrained they have certain limitations when you send something to large number of people but i'm not sure i think uh, i think it will be communicated to you how it should be do we learn modeling in this course i could know uh, as said early uh, you we don't really learn uh, modeling in this particular course we'll be touching the very basics of it in financial analysis but not modeling in particular that's a separate four week program that we should be running somewhere in the future i'm not very sure so your view on valuation of listed e-commerce still overvalued put any potential of mogi multi bagger despite several companies having poor business model uh manan what i will say on that is uh views are very subjective the whole idea of this course is let's not focus on each other's views let's focus on the process behind it and i want at the end of it i want uh you to be in a position where you have your own view because uh if uh that's the whole idea of an equity research analyst when something let's say if i tell you let's say for example i uh, yeah, i think it's overvalued for example or someone else tells you it's overvalued if this changes your view then that, then that is something that need that you need to work upon your you have to you need to collect your facts and basis that uh, you can take your decision uh, 
e-commerce company is still overvalued. I have not followed this sector honestly, uh, so I'm not fully aware. But yes, a uh, lot of companies are having poor business model. That is a problem to be fixed. Uh, sooner or later, valuations will reflect our uh, numbers if the numbers do not improve. So that is something that definitely needs to uh, fix. Logistics as an industry is really dependent upon uh, I lost upon a lot of other industries. Yes, it is. So, sir, suppose if we choose banking industry, it's divided into public, private, foreign, and so how do we club together for research? I would say treat banking as one industry and public, private, val foreign as different value propositions. Uh, so public companies, people go to public companies. So in customer segments, you can treat, you can have a customer segment for public companies, private company, a separate one for private and foreign, uh, separate one for foreign. The reason for that, uh, the reason for that is uh, key, uh, people go to public companies either because they have a sense of comfort with public companies or because they trust uh, the public companies more than the private ones. This is typically with people above a certain age. Uh, private companies, people go there for more better, like better services, better interest rates. Uh, however, there is still a section of people that do not trust private banks as much as they do public banks and cooperative banks. So basis, the reason why they are choosing the banks that they are, you can treat them as segments and then you can proceed with it. You can even treat each of them as a sub industry, but I think this would be much better because honestly, these are two competing products, uh, public company, public banks and private banks. These are competing products, competing sub segments. I think, uh, can you explain? Okay. I think I lost it. Where were we? Uh, Zebra learn if you can share the recording as well. Okay, it should be somewhere. Does interest rate increase affect the PE of companies? In general, interest rate increase means uh, you uh, means the valuation of companies by economic means should go down. So by definition, it should uh, at in general the valuations of the entire markets should go down. Uh, so it's actually if I explain, it's, a, it's it will take a minute to explain. It will take a couple of minutes to explain. But what happens is it is an economic concept entirely. So it's all about where does money flow? So if interest rate increases, more money will flow in the debt market. So if more money flows in debt market, that money will either not flow in equity market or some money from equity market will flow to our debt market. Right. So because and then after that, it's supply demand because the demand for equity products will go down or uh, people, some people will sell uh, equity products, uh, equity shares. So in that case, the valuation in general will go down. And that is why, uh, and the valuation for interest rate, uh, the yields there, where, will, where did we lose it? So yeah, the, re, the yields needs to catch up. And uh, yeah, so the valuation in general goes down. If this is what should happen logically. However, it's not required that it all, always happens company specific factors play a role uh, if you can share uh, where can I find sample equity research reports for reference Adim uh, pretty straightforward just go on Google and write any company report PDF uh, let me actually see uh, let's just see uh, we were talking about uh, PCI Express only let's say PCI Express uh, report PDF so uh, ignore those reports by PPCI Express itself. I see one report by HDFC Securities, one report by Money Control, one can report by some company called SMIF. So I'm not really aware what they, what they do, but you can look at them and uh, just pick the best one. I think if you're looking for an industry report, then look for industry like logistics rep industry report PDF. And if you're looking for uh, if you're looking for company reports, then look for company reports. However, uh, when starting with equity research, do not uh, do not give a lot of weightage to uh, like do not read uh, reports by brokerage firms initially. Uh, the reason is you will get biased if they say buy. Let's say if HDFC Securities sell uh, says buy and their set of reasons for TCI Express, so you will by definition get biased that okay, I want to I need to buy my def your your research will take a hit. So go with a clean slate, start collecting facts. Don't go by someone else's opinion. Any report is someone else's opinion, unless it's a government report. 
uh, yes uh, okay i am doing ca for industrial training in capital markets can you help me with this i did not really get the question what exactly in investment banking similar to equity research reports uh, is investment thesis similar to equity research reports uh investment thesis is a sub part of equity research reports investment thesis is only prepared once you have decided to invest in something or you already are invested in something so what are your reasons for those investments you need to communicate with your team members so that is an investment thesis that okay these are the risks these is the growth potential this is the uh, these are the reasons why i'm investing it's a one to two pager equity research report is basically an entire collection of your like a collection of your entire learning uh equity research report basically is an entire like presentation you can say uh, you want to explain that company to someone else if you might not invest in it as well so in my investment thesis is a sub part of equity research report whatsapp group has been linked in okay uh, sir can you please how uh, explain how inflation will affect the margins of the companies going forward so we discussed this a little while ago certain companies will able to, will be able to pass on the price of increased raw materials to the end user or to their customer in that case their margin will not be increase uh, will not be affected in the long term but in the short term every company's margins will be uh, affected and for other companies who are not able to pass on the inflation in the future as well uh, pass on the inflation to uh, to the end customer in the long term as well for them the margin affection will, uh, the margin will be affected quite long term when will we get ppt i am not sure i think somewhere after this course does the increase interest rate increase affect the pe's of companies i think we discussed this i want to start investing i am a beginner what should i start with shares mutual funds uh, srishti that's a very uh, broad question honestly so first things first how much time and skill do you have uh, if you have time to de dedicate at least 6 7 hours per week only then can you pick uh, shares before the, otherwise uh, shares is not an option without 6 7 hours a week uh, you can buy based on tips and stuff like that but won't really materialize to something meaningful if you have that time next you need to invest some time in your skill like learning more about uh, shares how to pick it and all that stuff after that you can pick go ahead with shares and meanwhile what i what can happen is if you don't have the time or skill mutual funds is the way to go uh, crypto i'm not fully aware uh, what i mean what i mean by crypto is uh, can they essentially replace shares so far i'm not fully aware uh, i'm not fully confident rather uh, in the future if it happens nothing better uh, we have a new asset class but right now comparing crypto and shares would not be fair shares uh in shares you can park good amount of your capital in crypto you might not be able to park uh, given the current state of affairs any newspaper you would suggest any newspaper just just read any financial newspaper i think one of the best ways to generate ideas is newspapers and magazines uh, we'll talk about this in the last uh, in the last session uh, about idea generation i would suggest uh, mint is one of the best and economic times i think these two are good enough i would suggest magazines though uh read business week uh, forbes uh these two uh, more than business week which one was that i think outlook india and business india right so business india these three four magazines are absolutely great if if more than newspapers you get time go through them will we be covering how to calculate risk and risk premium ashish honestly in equity research when you will be working as a professional there is no such calculation as risk and risk premium that we try to quantify these are things that are required for financial modeling uh, for building our thesis but in actual reality there is no such thing as risk premium that you can put a number to you can uh, you can compare things but putting a number becomes difficult to it so no i don't think you will be we won't be covering it and it's also not required for the purpose that we are learning it uh, i have worked, uh, i have still i am still, still not cal ever calculated risk premium uh for an equity research exercise so but passing the inflation to consumers will decrease the demand i think it's bad for economy so yes shubham passing the inflation will decrease the demand but then the, uh, there is another concept that comes in that is how price how elastic is the demand meaning if it's an essential good uh if it's an essential good uh then the demand will not decrease even if the prices increase so 
uh, so in that case the demand will uh, maintain but if it's let's say a uh, 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 something that's not uh, essential something that can be the consumption of which can be delayed for example cars for example consumer durables like mobile phones if the prices of these go up quite uh, fast then the consumption might be uh, consumption might be delayed so yeah shruti is such an interactive session okay thanks shruti unable to join whatsapp group please look into it is equity investment thesis similar to okay, i have covered this investment thesis is a sub part of equity research process will we be learning how to calculate undervalued stock and overvalued stock yes we'll be talking about valuation of stocks uh so yes i think you'll get a good understanding of undervalued and overvalued however it's it's you in no session it's uh, just a disclaimer it takes a lot of experience and time to understand and be confident about something that's okay this is definitely undervalued and this is something definitely overvalued so it takes a bit, bit of uh, uh experience and it also takes uh, some sense of uh, some sense of background knowledge that okay you can compare it to something so if you have some experience prior experience uh only then that then you get context for any given valuation road map for becoming equity research analyst and skills and certifications required uh so there are multiple roadways but one roadway is something that's for sure build a few projects uh, and get an internship that's something that is definitely to be done uh, otherwise educationally you can be an mba you can be a, you can even be a graduate uh, you can have you can be uh you can be a graduate and still it's all right uh you can have cfa you can have ca uh i think you'll still take an year or so of time to learn read as much as you can books will teach you as more than what's required for this field certification i don't think any direct certification is required it's just uh it's just if you're well read and your skill is good and your projects are good uh it's not something like a license you need to practice it's not ca where you need a license or a doctor Where you need a license, it's it's something where if you are good at it, almost anyone can do it, given you practice on your skill. Uh, so please provide this class for revision perspective. I there it will be provided. I don't know, uh, I don't know how, but it will be provided. Any investment tip for intraday investors? So for two things, two two things. Intraday investor is not actually a term. It's something intraday trader and an investor. so intraday is basically so all this we discussed today if you do that and go ahead with intraday you'll make up you'll come up with a horrible experience in the market intraday requires a completely different set of exp, uh, skills called uh, technical analysis uh, so that is not something that is covered in the any in this particular course so yeah uh, and personally i'm not some uh, i'm not someone who is who follows intraday investing so i have not fully aware or equipped with that as well uh moving on any book recommendations again a uh, few book recommendations that i can say uh start i uh one up uh, so peter lynch books one up on the wall street beating the street uh if you want to uh, start like if you are a beginner then i would say warren buffett way five rules of st successful stock investing uh if you are someone who is little more experienced or has good reading experience then i would say definitely security analysis and intelligent investor at some point in time but these are two heavy books and 800 pages and 600 pages and also little technical so don't start with these two books other than that value proposition design business model generation one book that i really like uh is uh mr ashwath damodaran on valuation and dark side of valuation but these are books that you should not start with these are books you should do once you or let's say 6 months into the industry or have been following the topic for 6 months and then there is also this book called mckinsey on valuations it's a relatively expensive book but really valuable other other than that i would suggest to watch a youtube video called ashwath damodaran he gives a speech of 1 hour somewhere in google i think uh, i think that's a brilliant brilliant speech numbers versus narratives nothing better i have not i have not seen a video better than that so if you get time just spend time on that cfi m fmva certification good to start a career in finance i am not aware what is cfi fmva i think financial modeling and valuation uh, by cfi so i don't know the curriculum but in general this this is a good certification but uh, and finance also you using the word finance so that's a very broad topic 
so finance can include uh, finance can include uh, investment banking equity research so if only for equity research this is not enough for financial mod uh, for investment banking it can give you a good start so you'll get a financial modeling kind of profile here but you'll still have to learn a skill alongside this uh, that can be however al alongside the job as well like once you get started obviously learning won't stop so you can learn it alongside as well so yeah let's get started guys uh, thank you for taking out the time uh, quick revision last time we covered around industries which industries can win and which will not uh, like which should not do well so we wanted to identify the spaces that we are ready to invest in or that we want to invest in uh, be it cement be it logistics be it whatever type of company but what space are we interested in and if we can do the industry right if we can get the industry right that is half our work done actually more than half our work done so what happens is i would again repeat uh, yes uh, so average players in good industries do better than good players in average industries so that is why it's super super important to identify the right industries if we have good industries where we are invested in uh, choosing of companies uh, we get a much bigger space there so this is what today's session will be choosing the right players in any given industry so last time around we talked about industries and choosing the correct player uh, that is the best case scenario so what if we can choose good players in good industries so that is what our agenda is for the uh, for the day very quickly uh, very quickly discussing the last time's uh, session so that who are uh, one new they will uh, they will be uh, for them it's a quick catch up so we talked about yeah you uh, so anyone who's seeing for the first time or joining for the first session yes you can go through it uh, go through this session uh, as well and after this session however make it a point to go through the previous session as well uh so uh, this last time around what we did very quickly we created industry sheet so what industry sheet does is we uh, we evaluated any given industry last time around we took an example of logistics and we also discussed many other industries uh, in many ca uh, ca like examples so we understood the customers and the products that is the first thing second who are the people involved and what is the val uh, value chain uh, what, like what activities are to be done who are the people involved stakeholders all this third industry characteristics that is market size industry stability uh, all this has to be studied uh, like how big is the market do um, like do big companies remain big is there pricing power so all this was discussed to evaluate the health of the industry then we discussed michael porter's profit forces uh, so this what it did if at any of these five points if the industry is facing a threat or weakness in that case the the industry's profitability will be drained so companies in that uh, space will be making relatively much less profit sec uh, fifth we discussed financial health of different companies so roe dupont so different companies that are there in the industry how much investment requirement is there for their day to day activities and then lastly we discussed the outlook of the industry trends that are there growth factors variables in success uh so and this was very very important so very quickly variables in success uh, variables for success we had to identify two or three items matrix for any social media company this way you can define variables for success for almost any given industry so it's going to be super fun to talk about businesses now what we'll do is now using this we have identified the health of the industry we have picked the health, uh, picked the industry that we would like to uh, invest in after that we'll go ahead uh, with picking the right companies and that is what the agenda of the day is uh, we call it business sheet uh, so what happens is if if we pick let's say cement industry or logistics industry there is company 1 there is company 2 3 4 so business sheet should be created for each and every one of them and we can compare where are where are the differences and that is how we can pick okay company 2 should uh, win in the industry or company 4 should win in the industry whatever that case may be so this is what we'll do once we have identified this particular company uh, or space last time around we'll pick the right companies uh, in that uh, in that particular space uh, so let's get started how many of you have are on board on this in the sense how to identify the big fish in any industry that's the agenda for the day 
find companies that will win in any given industry so that is what we have discussed uh we can even what we can also do is uh we can even bypass the stage actually by following something called a basket approach so let's say if we like cement space uh if we like that okay the space is going to do really well for next 3 to 4 years or 5 years we can even pick like top 4 or 5 companies and create a basket or cement basket rather uh we can create a cement basket and that is also something that can totally be done uh stage by following a path and this basket uh so we don't have to really pick a winner here we uh, our bets are hedged our bets are spread so this is one thing that can be done however uh if you are in a position to identify companies as well uh it increases our risk but it also increases our return possibilities so that is why we'll understand a uh, business sheet our focus will be on this particular word competitive edge that companies have find companies in any given industry that have a competitive edge if we can do this our investment return should be good what does competitive edge means how to find it all these things we'll be discussing in this particular session uh we'll be talking about so many things uh so just stay tuned it will be all super fun uh can you now it is okay so yeah great can you please repeat the fourth slide okay this one uh, i think the previous uh, it will be there in the previous session we just touched upon this very narrowly it's the industry sheet we go through this to identify the industry's health uh so yeah it's little uh we go through these six points to identify any given industry's health and yeah all this will be shared in the previous sessions actually uh let's actually uh, so you can move on with the business sheet that's going to be uh, so let's for, uh, let's get started with that so first things first as i said the entire discussion today can be summed down to two words competitive edge competitive positioning competitive advantage competitive disadvantage anything and everything that's to do with the competitive landscape so this is what we'll do and first things first what exactly is competitive edge because it's something that's often very misunderstood it's something that's uh it's something that uh, it's open to uh, it's, it's something that is yet to be, to be clarified so competitive edge is an advantage that a company has over its competitors uh so for example uh, let's take an example let's say of uh IPL we have been taking IPL example quite a lot from previous uh, in the previous session as well uh let's take an example CSK KKR uh Rajasthan Royals uh let's say Mumbai Indians so uh how these teams these are the teams that have won IPL quite frequently uh CSK has won maybe four times uh MI has won four, five times KKR two RR two uh these companies also come with a lot of brand value let me also add rcb here so csk had dhoni kkr had shahrukh khan rcb had mr virat kohli mi has lot of star players mr rohit sharma also so these these the com- these companies have created a large brand for themselves as compared to other teams as compared to teams that uh, that might have not done that well so that is something that is why they have g- uh, gathered a huge followership uh as compared to others what that huge followership done does in fact i was reading a few days back rcb has one of the largest sports followings uh so yeah coming back guys uh so we were taking the example of competitive edge so apple for example has this huge advantage there that that their products are also seen as social status so this is an advantage that they have over samsung or maybe oneplus where the advantage is huge people buy this because of social status and the competitors are not able to overcome this so these are two examples of competitive edge first one being relatively weak edge second one being absolutely tremendous competitive edge we'll see a lot of examples a uh, lot of ways how competitive edge can be achieved different examples actually this session is going to be so full of examples that's what the uh, it is coming uh, going forward so there are few key characteristics of competitive edge it has to be structural in nature 
that means it is something that cannot be overcome overnight uh, by the competition or by any external change so for example apple having social status that is something that has been built over many many years over many uh, product releases over many new products and that is how they derive this particular advantage so it's very structural to them it's not a marketing gimmick that they did or it's not one single marketing a campaign that got them got them the status so it's very structural in nature and that is what the idea is it has to be absolutely structural it uh, for example a company having cost ex- uh, cost benefit let's take an example where chinese companies had uh, chinese and bangladesh companies produce uh, one of the cheapest uh, textiles so what is the example what is the advantage that these companies these industry countries have so chinese produce a lot in volume so because of volume their cost of production goes down quite significantly also uh, they have uh, invested quite significantly in the machinery uh, that's there in the capital goods industry so that is one of the reasons uh, that why china is one of the cheapest producers of textile uh, material and bangladesh because the labor cost there is significantly cheaper from the other countries so these are two benefits that are very structural in nature it's not something where a uh, where let's say a government is giving subsidy uh, and which is making textile cheaper because subsidy can go away tomorrow as well so it has to be something that's absolutely very structural uh, second there are two types of competitive edge so we just are uh, touching upon it we'll be covering uh, in the in the coming sessions we'll be understanding it better so two types of competitive advantage or edge first is cost advantage second one is differentiation so either you are the cheapest seller in the market of a good that means no one can sell it at a price that's cheaper than yours uh, for that particular good so that is cost advantage or in fact let me rephrase it no one can make it cheaper than you because of some advantage some advantage that the company has some reason uh, that the company has so this is cost advantage uh, for example if you are a raw mat- if you are a nat- uh, let's say if you are a cement company so if you are closer to the raw material extraction point or the market you uh, you can produce uh, you can produce the cement at a relatively cheaper rate second let's say if you are anything to do with mining if you are closer to the mines you can produce the cheaper form of uh, cheap like you can produce at a cost advantage in this case because china uh, because of bangladesh let's say low uh, cost of labor they can produce uh, textiles at a rate that is far cheaper than on, on almost any country can so that is a significant cost advantage that companies will have in this particular space so that is the first kind of competitive edge uh yes uh, okay so it's working all right now so moving on second form of advantage remains differentiation uh so differentiation means that your product offering is something unique what you offer is something differentiated or different from the competitors case in point certain examples let's say uh whatsapp so what happens uh with whatsapp uh if you are sent uh you and the receiver there are so many other uh, chat platforms as well right there are multiple chat platforms but why is uh why is it that we use whatsapp only because uh for the sender and receiver both should have these uh, the same app so whatsapp is something that both of them have so the offering here what that whatsapp has the distribution that is something differentiated secondly let's take an example of uh iphone for example so the product here brings a lot of social value and probably the best cameras that are there in phones uh, so the offering there is differentiated as compared they don't sell it cheap they sell it re- really expensive but the product here is differentiated from the competitors so these are things how uh these are things that lead to competitive edge we'll understand these two categories as we discuss more examples going ahead and also one more thing 
advantage only if it is reflected in the financials that means it is con- to be considered a competitive edge only if it can lead to more sales more better margins lower cost so many other things so so let's do this uh, let's actually uh, so we have un- we have touched upon what exactly is competitive edge any form of advantage over competitors in a nutshell it can be structure it has to be structural it can be cost related it can be differentiation related uh, what is not competitive edge simple brand awareness if something does not affect the financials that is not a competitive edge for example if people know your brand but because of that brand you're not able to sell more or you're not able to have like a charge more uh, or sell expensive that is not something that is a competitive edge competitive edge has to has to reflect in financial numbers uh, abundant raw material availability if price cannot be the cheapest so this is just an example let's say uh, if we have lots of raw materials but we are st- uh, we are still not able to sell the cheapest products like we are not able to enjoy the cost advantage so that is yet another example of uh, raw material availability uh, that is yet another example of what is not a competitive edge so and something that is transient meaning it's something that is to do for a few uh, months few weeks and then it will go away for example lot of industries benefited during covid times but uh, as things start to normalize uh, the advantages that companies enjoyed let's say online uh, consumption of almost so many forms of uh, so many forms uh, that is something that's starting to go away so 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 anything that is transient that is also not a competitive edge so with this we have touched a few basic uh, like we have touched upon a basic understanding of what is competitive edge what is not competitive edge uh, let's understand this in more details but before that i would like to hear f- from uh, from you uh what are few things that you think have a competitive edge over their competitors few companies few products where you feel that okay there is a definite competitive edge love to, like netflix yes uh, but what exactly netflix i would say with netflix two things uh one the content library that they have created uh the media that they have created and second the simple brand value that they have created for themselves and third the distribution the large number of people that already use the app that already are within the netflix ecosystem uh latest technology uh, economies of skills okay these are reasons why you can have uh, why you can have a competitive edge uh pp manufacturing companies okay are uh, not not exactly uh pp manufacturing companies right now because uh again because it was transient uh the uh, also because it's an industry you need to identify competitive edge for companies google definitely google so for google what is it that they have the data that they have uh the distribution that they have and the tech that they have built on the back end which will take for anyone else many many years to copy so these are few examples of competitive edge we'll understand a lot more uh going ahead but let's just understand competitive advantage much uh, in a greater detail so there are two parts of understanding any competitive advantage one is the story side and second is the numbers side so what exactly do we mean by stories we we want to ask why the advantage or what is the source of advantage like why, what is the company doing that is leading to that competitive edge and it's very very important to identify this to understand this so this is competitive edge uh the story side that we need to understand and second half of it is the numbers side how does it reflect in numbers again as we saw if it does not reflect in numbers there is no advantage if we are one of the cheapest pro- producers but because of that we are not able to sell more then it means it, it is no advantage actually so uh the second part is the numbers side uh it does it has to has to reflect in numbers otherwise there is no advantage that's there so we'll understand this uh in greater detail in the coming to uh, in these two uh, uh, sessions and then we'll understand the different reasons that can be there for the story side 
so let's get started with the story side why advantage like why does the company have an advantage uh so i see still a lot of examples coming in mcdonald's low cost than its competitors uh not so much low cost but because of the large distribution that they have and also uh, also the large uh, also the brand that they have created and the uh, like the brand value that they have created i think that is more of the reason why they have an advantage cost i don't think that will be that big an issue for mcdonald's uh, so yes that is what i'll say uh, tesla for their technology yes so let's let's actually move forward uh, let's uh, products uh, so for story side to understand why does a company have an advantage uh we, we uh, the advantage can be linked mainly towards these four uh, tabs we can say uh there can be an advantage related to the product to the people involved through the processes that are involved uh or the price structure these are four categories where we can club most of the advantages so let's cover one by one each of them and then we'll cover a lot of them with a lot of examples as well so with product the company can have a better value proposition the company can have a better product decision uh the company can have a good customer segment so so for example uh, let me actually first break it up or uh, understand this so each what we understood the value proposition uh in the last session for industry like why are the customers buying the company's products so or the industry's products in this case we need to narrow down even further what is the difference in the value proposition that each company has on offer uh, so that is something where different companies can have a different uh, model for example we have amazon and we have ebay so both are e-commerce marketplaces but the value proposition is very different amazon is for buying new products ebay is for buying a lot of old and used products so again it's buyer seller meeting place but again the value proposition the product design that is completely different so we need to understand between different companies what is the value proposition that they offer one more example flipkart so uh flipkart when it came, uh, when it uh, came when it started actually they were one of the first players to allow cash on delivery so with indians they were not very ready uh to pay online uh for a good that will be deliv- delivered 3 4 days into the future today's flipkart is something that that's very like lot of us have already experienced uh we are comfortable with the e-commerce space but uh in those days in roughly 2008 9 people were not very uh people could uh, would not easily trust online places uh so they came up with e- uh, cash on delivery and that value proposition or product decision is what gave them an ex- a great competitive advantage that allowed them to get a lot of get lot of users and customers basically and this distribution that they had early on that is what led to their uh, that is what led to uh, the advantage that they enjoy that is what led uh, to the to the uh, competitive edge that they had they just went on becoming bigger and bigger from here they just became bigger from their competitors here and they just uh, double down on it different customer segments serve to different companies serve different customer segments so that can also become a source of advantage for example uh, we saw a company that was only selling products a uh, uh, products uh, to army families and because of this exclusivity that they had created for themselves uh they 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 really meant something to these uh, people uh, and as a result uh, that became a really good uh, competitive advantage for them the, the people could associate with them uh, with this particular company i'm missing the name actually but uh, but this is this is one of the examples second point people so internal people external people so let's cover that one by one uh, so by internal people we mean if a company has a very rich parent for example flipkart 
has Walmart, that's its parent. Reliance, uh, or it should be the other way around actually. Reliance owns uh, Geo. So in these categories, because of the parent, actually the parent is the real source of competitive edge. Reliance has such deep pockets that it can almost, it can give the competition a very, very hard time. So this, this is one of the examples where your parent that acts as a huge competitive advantage uh, for you. And here as well for geo reliance is a source of competitive advantage uh, for Flipkart, Walmart's pockets, deep pockets is a source of competitive advantage. Uh, then, then we, uh, so the parent that's there, the people involved in the company, like people in the company. Uh, those people can be really, uh, those people can be a really, uh, big source of competitive, uh, advantage. So let's say if, uh, if the founders of Flipkart, they started a company today in any given industry. So they will be able to attract more capital. They will be able to, uh, attract the best of talents. They will be able to attract a lot of customers and media and PR attention. So those people in the company, they will have an advantage that is much, much bigger than anyone else. Uh, that is there, that is any like much bigger than anyone else will ever have. So this is one, uh, this is another example, then external people, external connect. So let's say political connections, Ex it can be explicit or, uh, like it can be known to people or it can be something that's much more, uh, secretive. But either ways, uh, then let's say if they own uh, media, uh, if, uh, media companies, like if this, uh, if the ownership, uh, if let's say Reliance has network 18, uh, so they can, they can, uh, use a lot of media space there, uh, to kind of promote their products. So, uh, this way, uh, this way, external factors can be a source of, uh, source of advantage, uh, Next, so let, let any questions so far, we'll come to a lot of examples. Could you please explain product decision? Yes. Uh, so product decision basically means, uh, let me use an example. Uh, for example, McDonald's came up with, uh, McDonald's came up with something called on the go, uh, in India. So what on the go meant, uh, on the go basically just led to and no other competition competitor was doing this so you could order stuff up and just pick it on in your car itself so this is one product that mcdonald's uh, introduced uh that that is a product decision that is a decision that you make to tweak your product offering and that led to a competitive advantage for them a new product line being settled uh let's say when when let's say uh, ipod was introduced so those are product decisions that were made or when in fact iPhone was introduced first one. So that, that was an iPod converted into a iPhone. So iPod's market was completely transformed here. So, so these are all product decisions that they made, uh, that led to huge competitive advantage. Uh, for example, com there are two companies. Let me explain this company one and company two company one, let's say is let's take an example, YouTube. And company two is Amazon Netflix. So a lot of you would have seen, we can rent, uh, we can rent movies from YouTube for like 25 rupees a day, 50 rupees a day, whatever that number is. So pay per use. And here we have subscriptions. So this is something where they have designed the product in a way, uh, where two companies are different. This can also be linked to the revenue model, which we will come to later. But here, when we experience this product, we get a lot of free media to consume and we get uh, a few paid versions as well. Here we have, we get nothing for free, but once we pay a small amount or once we pay an amount, we get everything else. We don't have to pay anything above over and above it. So these are all product decisions that how do you want to design your product? So, uh, so this is, yeah, this is how we can say, uh, uh, uh then a very good example of a great product design, uh, product decision is, uh, caravan, uh, that, uh, carva, not caravan, uh, carva, 
I'm sure a lot of you would have seen this Karwa by Sare Gama Pa. So that is a good product decision, like just taking, making things very simple and making it usable for older people. So uh, older people in particular. So, so that is again a very good product decision example. Now coming back to advantage. So third tab that comes is process. So anything that the company does, we'll understand process actually when we understand value chain. Wait, wait, I just saw that you purchased a product from Zebra Loan store and thank you so much. We have something super, super awesome for you. Introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses, be it personal finance, stock trading, derivative, financial analysis, financial modeling, uh, stock markets, everything and anything that you want to learn in finance. You have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period, you'll have access to them as well. This is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance, if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to enter this industry, this is the place you should be starting. This is a no-brainer deal and since you already purchased the product, you just have to upgrade it. You don't have to pay the entire amount, just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have. So what are you waiting for? Just go and grab on the bundle. In going ahead, but any activity that the company does uh, can be an advantage activity. Meaning, uh, let me say, uh, there is this company, let's say it, uh, XYZ, uh, logistics company, for example. So they only do B2B uh, delivery for larger cities. Meaning, uh, they'll send goods Mumbai to Ahmedabad or Mumbai to, let's say, Delhi. They'll only cover these large cities. Then maybe Bangalore to Chennai. So because they have made it a process to only cover these large cities. They always have very high volumes in their business, even though the pricing is low because these are competitive routes, but still, uh, they, their trucks are almost always full. And because of that exclusive ex uh, decision that they made, the process that they followed, uh, they, this particular thing, it becomes a profitable activity for them over its competitors. So this is another example. Then we have, uh, external activity. So we'll cover all this going ahead. Then we have price. So anything related to cost and anything related to revenue model. Uh, this, I think they have, this is something that's not, that's wrong. Uh, I think there's some mistyping here, but coming back, uh, anything in the value chain that can lead to uh, advantage, anything in the price, uh, Price meaning we can get the raw materials cheaper. We can get the revenue uh, in in a different manner. The revenue model. Some, for example, Google Google's pay per click model. So we uh, Google charges an advertiser whenever a user clicks versus Facebook's impression model. So Facebook charges when uh, anyone sees an ad, irrespective they click or not. So these are two, for example, different revenue models. So we'll co cover all this and these are the different sources, how we can have a competitive edge, but the tabs remain pretty much the same. So we're going to cover all this in very shortly with a lot of examples, but this is the story side of what can be an edge, uh, what can form an edge. And it's very important that the advantage must reflect in numbers it is absolutely must there is no discussion around it if, if if let's say if we are saying that the company has a very rich parent but because of that the numbers are not affected so in that case uh in that case that advantage is of no use if that advantage is of no value to the uh to the user let's say the company has a great product but it's not like selling more. So if it's not reflecting in the numbers. Uh, it's of no value. It's of no value. So before that, before we uh, begin with the numbers very quickly, any questions, any questions on the previous session? All right. I don't see a question as such so far. So let's continue. Any question that comes up, just feel free. Uh, so let's begin with the story side, uh, the number side, just a second. So yeah, 
if we continue with the numbers side, uh, any competitive advantage must reflect in sales, meaning it should allow the company to sell for a, a more expensive price. For example, uh, if you if you say the company has a great product or a great brand, then it, the company should be able to charge a higher price. For example, uh, Apple. So Apple is able to charge a premium price. Uh, that is a very typical example. Let's say Netflix as well. So these companies, because of the brands, they are able to uh, extract expensive prices over its competitors. So that is something uh, that is something that's very uh, important. Uh, if you have a source of advantage, it can you can charge more to the uh, customers than your competitors and customers are yet buying. That is a huge edge of competitive advantage. If not charge more, you can sell more of your products over your competitors. The quantity must be up or else your sales must be must, much more sustainable. That is, it's very sure that you can keep on selling products for next five years, next 10 years. Uh, these things, either you can charge more or sell more or your sales are much more sustainable. These are things, these are factors how competitive advantage can be reflected in numbers. Second pricing part. So any intangible, uh, you basically the same thing, like you can charge more. Uh, it can, it should reflect in the cost side. That means your variable and fixed cost should be lower. Uh, something of on those lines, like you can produce cheaper. Uh, if it's not happening, then again, that the advantage source is not, not very strong. So actually to understand any company's source of advantage, you can go through the, uh, the P and L statement, the profit and loss statement, uh, and the line items there will have a lot of hints about what can be the potential sources of uh, competitive advantage and disadvantage. Again, what are the uh, the different cost? Uh, the, let's not. Uh, this is uh, the different cost drivers that are there. We uh, the company's cost drivers must be low. Uh, that is something. That is something. The different so cost drivers is anything that affects the different costs. Like um, any company can have four, five different cost drivers. So, so uh, it any one, even if you have a significant advantage on one major co uh, cost driver, that is something that's uh, important. Industry parameters again, as we saw, uh, around the different lines, and also industry parameters. We mean more than this. Uh, we mean last time we saw factors for success in the industry. If anything is leading uh, to, let's say if you're a social media company, if anything is leading uh, more to bring in more users or more user, more time per user. Uh, anything that's affecting these two numbers. Uh, that is also a source of competitive edge. So this is how competitive edge works. It should either get you more sales or more profit margins because of the cost. Uh, because of the cost, it, should, it brings you pricing power. It brings you uh, better industry parameters. That Then it is a competitive edge. So two things, story side and the numbers side. So we have discussed... Uh, the two in uh, two in a uh, in a manner where we have touched upon them. Now we'll be understanding so many different reasons that can lead to competitive advantage. So we're going to be covering so many uh, different topics here. So these are all reasons why we can have a competitive edge. Why a company can have competitive edge? First, firms resources. Uh, any resource that the company has, I would love if you could take down notes here, uh, because it's going to be super useful. Uh, the different resources that a company has, uh, that is a reason for competitive advantage. Uh, for example, Adani controls 30% of Adani ports actually uh, controls 30% of India's ports, total port space. So that is a huge competitive edge. Why? Because the firm's resources, they have a lot of resources here. Uh, they control this particular about 30% of the ports. 
and no one can get that actually overnight so any competitor with any any amount of resources it's very difficult for them to get that second saudi arabia aramco so uh, the saudi arabian uh, oil company oil company so they have huge uh, oil reserves so this is again an example so the resources that the company has for netflix and uh, disney over time they have created a lot of media so the media library that they have created uh, the films that they have created the characters that they have created the uh, the brand value that they have created around these films that is a huge source of competitive edge for against other players so if you could give in a few more examples let's wait in the chat section if you could give in a few more examples in the in the chat session uh, where where uh, you think there is a competitive edge due to forms resources okay so i have a lot of questions here what are cost drivers so going back uh cost drivers so what happens is uh let's say let's take an example of ipl team last time around we discussed this for ipl team what are the major costs the players fee uh the players fee next is the support staff fee uh next is hotels and logistics let's say marketing so these all these different cost items these are different uh these are different costs that the company has and different factors that affect these costs these are the uh, cost drivers so in fact we can even say these the uh, factors that affect players fee the, the uh, so there is something called in ipl there is something called uh, the cap like budget so every company can spend every uh, team can spend let's say 100 crores in players for example per year so so this so uh, these are different cost drivers that are impacted hotels logistics so all these factors so any any advantage that a company has anywhere that is uh, something let's say this is a ipl so players fee is fixed support staff expenses pretty expenses pretty much stable hotels and logistics is uh, was around 30 to 35 crore about 3 years back per team per year uh, marketing is something that's subjective so most of the items are fixed so cost drivers here here are mostly fixed and not variable but let's say you are a cement company or not cement company let's say you are a cement company for cement company one of the major costs is uh, the transport or logistics cost from the point of manufacturing to the point of consumption so logistics cost is significantly impacted by the uh, the diesel prices uh, and also by truck availability truck availability or uh, whatever mode they use so any company that is a uh, closer to the market end market as well as point of production they will need the logistics uh, they will need logistics less so because of this they will have an advantage over other companies so this is how one cost driver can uh, if if let's say if a company has a major advantage here the cost driver here is a much bigger uh, much bigger advantage that the company can use uh let me go back can you please explain again all right so yeah okay i'm getting okay i'm not even uh, so just a second so jio yes jio has a lot of firms resources google has tremendous firms resources and also russia diamond company with largest production uh okay i'm not fully aware of what alroso russia does uh patient pains controlling 60 50 to 60% of uh, market so yes keshav uh it is um, it is an advantage but not because of firms resources we'll cover this indigo not so much due to the firms resources again so yeah uh so so firms resources geo yes 
the 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 resources that they have the towers that they have spread out the uh, the optical fiber and also the simple capital that they have that the resources so these these are these are the forms these this is one of the one of the reasons why one of the items that can lead to a company's advantage but it should also allow them to, uh, to like it should also reflect in numbers for uh, saudi aramco yes it is reflecting they are able to sell more for dani ports if they control such a large portion of country sports they should be able to charge more or they, sh uh, they should be able to sell more that is happening jio should able to be able to acquire more customers yes that is happening next information uh, the information that a company has the know how the knowledge that can be a source of advantage for example moderna and pfizer these are uh, pharma companies uh, so they have done hundreds of like they have existed for about more than 100 years if i'm not wrong so they have done so much research and development in the medical space that uh, they have now a lot of uh, intellectual property with them information with them which allows them to respond to new diseases uh, and create medical uh, medical uh, medical like, uh, medicines for them uh, much better and this is a huge source of advantage to them also the patents and the medicine that they have created that is also something that leads them to sell a lot of good lot of it and uh, at an expensive price because they are patent protected then google and facebook so google and facebook understands our data that is facebook knows what are you interested in so does google so this knowledge of what you are interested in allows them to and this knowledge of very few companies have and this allows them to personalize ads in a manner that was absolutely impossible till a few days back uh, so these are things that uh, that lead to huge competitive edge amazon alibaba so these guys know what you are buying and they also know who is selling these things and by mixing uh, like by matching these two uh, they create a huge marketplace for themselves so these are different sources of information that a company has know how that a company has that can be tremendous tremendous uh, i think i'm not uh, visible uh, the screen's not visible not able to see the screen just hold on yeah so it is visible uh coming back uh so yeah uh this uh, this is examples where the information that a company has uh that can be a huge source of competitive advantage let's shoot in again a, a few examples microsoft yes microsoft is an uh, is an example of information uh microsoft uh, but what exactly in microsoft uh the softwares that they have developed that is not information uh microsoft so where, what exactly can microsoft have that is a source of advantage if you could uh, if you could specify uh other companies that you think cred so cred has a lot of uh, information about a uh, lot of users actually who have above a certain uh, uh who have credit rating above a certain re uh, number uh, not so much. I'm not fully uh, sure if cred we can count as uh, having advantage over here because uh, the Sybil score is something that is not calculated by them. That is something that's public. Uh, so yes, uh, HUL, how exactly HUL Rahul would love to hear, uh, like what is the information advantage that they have? CAT, IBM, uh, not sure. Seat IBM, I'm not fully sure uh, if Seat is it for uh, information. What is the information advantage that they have? IBM, yes. Amazon, yes. Just look for examples around where the information that the companies have, the know-how, the, uh, the knowledge that they have. That is something that's very important. OS dominance, yes. Uh, is this for Microsoft? I think it is for Microsoft. So OS dominance is, is 
definitely competitive edge, but is it due to information? That is what I'm asking. YouTube, definitely YouTube. So YouTube will qualify actually for both the places, the resources that they have and the information that they have. Bloomberg, uh, can say, Facebook, yes, done. So this is how, this is how, uh, so this is how, these, these are two reasons, so two items so far that can be potential reasons for competitive edge. Next item that is very straightforward, trustworthiness. So what trustworthiness means? Uh, these companies are trusted more by their customers and as a result, they are able to generate more business. The key here is the ability to generate more business. If you're not able to generate business, due to uh, trust, then this won't qualify. So th then this won't qualify. Okay. I think they have messed up with the design. Uh, I think this is something that is from the previous one. Uh, this should be here. Okay. So sorry for that mess up. Uh, so which are companies that, uh, so they should be able to get more business due to their trustworthiness. So for example, HDFC and Kotak bank, these are two companies which are way more trusted than their other competitors or smaller, smaller companies. In fact, even ICICI bank, for example. So these are companies that are very well trusted and as a result are able to uh, attract more business versus others. So this is a source of competitive edge. Second media companies. So their credibility viewership is a function of how trust, uh, how much do people trust them? And if viewership goes up, the, uh, the ads, the ads charges, and uh, ad charges go up as well. So, so trustworthiness, uh, again, for media companies, uh, next for educational institutes, IIM, IIT, Harvard. So these are large companies. People are able to, uh, people are not companies exactly these, but institute, and they're able to attract the top talent and top recruiters uh, for the trust that they have in them. The recruiters trust that the students of these two institutes will be top tier and institute and the students trust them that okay the uh, the end result of these institutes will be really good so other examples that you can think of for trustworthiness like they are able to get more business because of trust trust tata yes ta, this is a great example tanishk so yes ta, ta, tata and tanishk because of tata's pedigree they are able to sell way more than other players in the market colgate yes can say a uh, bit uh, because uh, ultimately toothpaste is being sold on uh, the promise that it uh, benefits your teeth and trustworthiness plays a role there. But I'm not fully sure if they're able to generate more business purely because of trust. Samsung, how exactly trust? Like, are they able to, tr are people buying more Samsung phones because of, uh, because of Samsung, uh, because of the trustworthiness? would love to, uh, it's, I would love to hear. Big four of auditing. Yes. Ex great example. Nowadays, instead of media companies, influencer marketing, but yes, can say it definitely. Yes, it is uh, very true. Uh, by Vituzi. big four for auditing. Yes. Akansha, that's a great example. So this is typically an example where pe they are able to attract more business due to our uh, trust. If people did not trust them, then they would not be able to acquire, uh, more, uh, business. Vaman Hari Pethe Jewelers, I am not sure what it is. Maggie, Maggie, not exactly due to our trust. Nokia, uh, Nokia, I think so. No, uh, does not really mean trust. I think that point in time, the options were also limited. Being a Samsung user, it has built trust over the years. But are you buying more, uh, because, because of the trustworthiness? Like, uh, are they able to sell more because of trust or because of, uh, because of the uh, features and all that they offer ambassador, uh, ambassador, 
we buy samsung because we don't like apple okay that's a different discussion and that can go on for another hour our supply yes medicine companies definitely yes ambassador i'm not very sure as yet because see that point in time a lot of buying was also happening because of lack of options berkshire hathaway yes so for almost any financial company that's there trustworthiness is a huge factor one of the biggest places where trustworthiness is a factor is insurance companies if you did not trust the company that will exist 10 years from today 15 years from today uh why will you even get an insurance from them ever particularly life insurance lic definitely lic is entirely trust uh it's government banked it's backed it's super trustworthy uh that way so yeah so this is how trustworthiness can and if let's say if i start as insurance company tomorrow or if any one of us starts an insurance company tomorrow what will happen we will not be able to get as many clients as the larger companies why because of lack of trust so this is where this is where we need to understand that trust is the source of business there uh people trust them uh they are able to uh, i'm not fully sure if dominoes can be counted yes we can say dominoes because the quality of we put trust in the quality of their foods but not exactly is the, that people only buy dominoes because of trust honda motors uh honda motors see these are trust that okay these are we put trust in the brands that uh, one thing we need to understand here is uh, we are trusting the brand here that is uh if any any given brand any given brand on this planet let's say even if it's a youtube even if it's uh, it, it has to be trusted if users can't trust it uh we no one will ever use it why will you ever use a product by someone who's not you don't trust to but here we are trying to identify companies that get their business purely because of trust that means others can't beat it due to uh, the trust that it creates so in that case will it happen that uh, let's say people will use only dell computers because it has huge trust and not use maybe a, let's say a hp computer or a asus computer so that is not the source like that is not where like dell is not getting its like all the business due to trust yes trust is a factor but uh, it's not a make or break for them is what we can say hdfc's nbfc's yes trustworthy plays role when fund pays online definitely for any online uh, companies trustworthiness becomes a huge factor folks no normally go for cod for new uh, platforms yes so yeah very good point ola and uber for passing passenger safety this is exactly trust if we uh, you'd be very uncomfortable ordering from a unknown uh, or a small vendor uh, because uh, because you will not be very comfortable that okay the uh, like is it safe is it not safe so great point so yeah this is these are uh, phone pay google pay definitely in fact even paytm why will you even pay put in like 1000 rupees in the wallet ever if you don't trust it so these are companies uh, that work on trust so yeah wonderful example so far so th with this uh, we understand how trustworthiness can help us generate a lot of business uh, like trustworthiness is a, can be a huge source of competitive advantage uh, next point being technology the things that they have developed technologically and here uh, let me write out down a few examples so the technology that they have developed it so it, it takes so much time for others to copy uh that is where it will have an edge so for example google uh tesla so again these are very large examples actually uh in fact even uh let's say uh any space company so google has taken about 20 years to write uh their uh, algorithm for the search engine and they have now any company irrespective how much money they have be it facebook be it apple they they just can't write the algorithms that google has written in uh, and by the time they write it google will have done another 15 years 10 years of work so that is where the technology is a huge edge uh, for these com for this particular company so anywhere where uh, you have a technology you have built something that others can't catch or others can catch but will take a lot of time uh, and in that time you'll move forward 
so that is a source of competitive uh, advantage so google again tesla so they are training the data they are train like uh, they are sending images of the roads and training their uh, training their uh, data so that is something that they have created that others can copy but will take a lot of time for them to do so the space companies so anywhere where technology is being used in a manner which gives them to a significant competitive advantage that are you still using google search blogs youtube to learn finance it's time to switch to something more efficient introducing the all in one finance bundle especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time learn about personal finance stock investing stock trading financial analysis financial modeling futures and option ms excel and so much more everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots with 150 examples 30 plus tools six certified courses and two visual books for the next one year take the most definite step towards your finance career now is exactly where uh, that is exactly which is a source of competitive edge so and it should reflect in numbers so there is a reason why google there is no other search engine that does as well as google yahoo bing all these companies do not have as good as precise co algorithms as google does uh same is the case with tesla maybe uh, other space companies we can have n number of uh, n number of technology companies would again love adobe wonderful example i was just about to come to adobe so adobe has uh photoshop for example let's just take the common ones they have a whole suite of a uh, whole suite of uh, products so photoshop after effects and premiere pro so these are designing like video editing and Im- image editing uh, illustrator as well adobe illustrator so these are products for video editors and photo- uh, designers and there is no company that has been able to build these products as accurately uh so this is a big competitive edge that oracle enjoys saas companies yes but we'll have to be more specific what which what kind of saas companies let me just go through other starlink yes uh, however it has to work uh, like it ha- i'm not fully aware what is the current state of things microsoft big yes so microsoft has something called microsoft uh, azure uh, or microsoft cognitive services so these are places where uh, where they have a much bigger edge over uh, over others uh and the entire microsoft in fact the microsoft products as well the microsoft uh, operating system uh spacex yes upi amul milk not so much amul milk i'm not sure how uh, technologically i think amul milk for trust okay that these are for trust uh ibm spss i'm not sure what spss is but ibm yes the uh yes ibm for sure uh any other example so with this uh we can we uh, so anything where technological advantage is there uh it's uh that is and it is something valuable to the customer and it is again reflecting in the numbers anything and everything must reflect in numbers so these these are items uh, these are items that lead to competitive advantages so far so we have discussed from resources information trustworthiness technology then we have management certain times we already saw earlier on as well uh, the senior management or the owners uh, they are able to they are able to attract great things for the company for example elon musk can attract lot of capital lot of attention to almost each of his companies uh sharukh khan for uh, mr uh, mr sharukh khan for kkr so he's not the management directly but he runs uh, he is the owner there and brings a lot of value so he can attract a lot of uh, value for kkr team for ipl for wrong uh, for this brand wrong by mr by mr virat kohli so Uh, i'm not sure if he uh, if he is the owner or not but he's definitely the uh, he is definitely promoting the same uh, it's a brand on his name uh, so so 
these people are able to attract a lot of value so imagine this brand versus other similar clothing brands so they'll be able to generate much better business uh, as compared to others because of the uh, the management so uh, let's take example of uh, flipkart co-founders again as we saw early starting flipkart co-founders starting new business so for example currently they're doing something called navi uh, navi uh, so they, they just are able to attract much more every of everything like investors capital uh, employees uh, the team the core team the product uh, uh, the media space the pr space each and everything and it just gives them a great head start so th this is how management can at times be big source of competitive advantage as well so other examples where we think management can lead to uh, uh management can lead to exam uh, to this so sponsorship of wrong i'm not fully aware hrx by ritik roshan so yes hrx by ritik roshan but it's yeah it's pretty much same as wrong by, by mr virat kohli tatas for management yes every tata company is trusted quite significantly ipl tata uh, i'm not sure how ipl is not uh, i'm giving your example zebra learn okay how okay uh, would love to hear explanations so yeah guys feel free to explain that is where uh, we all learn so where management anywhere where nike cristiano ronaldo so not so much see are we talking about the management uh, we are not talking about sponsors uh, sponsorships we are not talking about uh, promotions we are talking about ownership and uh, ownership and management like people running the show or people owning the same thing uh, rapido by rajkumar rao again we are taking examples of uh, we are taking examples of uh, sponsorships uh, or rather promo uh, paid promotions like brand ambassadors that is something that's not uh, fully correct because brand ambassadors can change if something happens if if a, if a negative news affecting mr uh, if a, uh, affecting cristiano ronaldo comes up maybe nike pauses the the ads for a while so this is not this, which they won't do for if it was owner or like owned by uh, someone like ronaldo for example uh, nike jordan by jordan can say uh warren buffett for berkshire hathaway big big yes definitely ratan tata for tata mba praful bilore for mba chai wala yes uh, uh followed the story yes k owned by katrina kaif yes cr7 yeah so now we are getting to to the correct examples uh nike by and katrina kaif we can say but katrina kaif owns a very small uh share in nike so not exactly the main owner but yes you can say this alibaba jack ma so anywhere the management becomes a big reason uh for in one like the getting more business that is uh where that is something of lot of value next is marketing cap cap capabilities so by marketing capabilities we mean brands if a company has a strong brand uh that can be a strong advantage and here i'm sure we'll have infinite examples but one very important thing that needs to be understood brand is uh, that needs to be understood is a uh, brand only is valuable if we can charge a premium for it so brand means people, like for example nike nike sells the most expensive shoes as compared not most expensive but as compared to similar uh, sim companies in similar range they sell the most expensive products so and yet they are able to sell it so this is a strong brand again apple nike are traditional examples let's focus on indian examples a few of them so boat boat is a good brand it does not allow them to charge a premium but it allows them to sell a lot more so this is also one of the possibility uh, one of the benefits uh, like if a, if you have a strong brand and you can sell more as well then to uh, we can say that okay uh, it has an advantage if the brand is the reason why the company is able to sell more apple coca cola nike are traditional traditional examples classmate notebooks so yes lot of us use classmate notebooks 
because of the brand that uh, they have created the trust that okay the call, paper quality and all that is going to be good uh, zara and they do these two also sell the most expensive premium product so brands that you have that you can think of here we can short or uh, we can have infinite uh, brands so uh, let me just go there H U uh, previous example, Mr. Mukesh Ambani for Reliance. Yes, great learning by Virat Kohli. Again, it's a sponsorship and uh, it's a it's a promotion sort of thing. Uh, Zero Da is a big brand. H and M definitely yes. Puma, Reebok, Dell, Adidas, Raymond's correct. All these are correct. SpaceX. I'm not fully sure if it's uh, something. Where due to a brand, they are able to sell more because it's more of a B two B business. It's more of a technology uh, play more than a branding thing. Ambuja Cement, yes, Upstocks can say I'm not fully aware of how uh, uh, what are their details. Peter England, England, these are uh, Peter England would be a uh, can they sell? So they they sell relatively cheaper products as compared to competitors. But do uh, can they sell more due to their brand? Like a lot more. I'm not fully sure. Colgate, yes, big yes. Colgate is selling due to brands. Lake May, Maybelline, uh, yes, wonderful brands. Range Rover, uh, Amul, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, Amul, I think should be uh, good. Complain, uh, is it Complan? Uh, so Complan, yes. Uh, Dabur, so yeah, all these brands, Raymond, Reynolds, Trimax, Pen, Pen, yes, absolutely. We've been using it for. As long as we can think, RRR. I'm not sure what's this uh, movie. Uh, so I, no, I don't think that's a brand. Starbucks, yes. Starbucks also sells due to brands and sells expensive as well. Let's let's narrow down. Let's narrow it down further. Let's uh, let, let give me. Let's think of some names that charge a premium for their products, like because purely because of the brand. So few examples. One example we got very good. Uh, Pat uh, Patanjali, not so much. Starbucks. Starbucks sells due to uh, more uh, Raymonds. Yes, definitely Raymonds also is expensive than the products uh, than the alternate offer offerings. Rolls Royce, yes. Rol Rolex, yes. So these are so the companies that we have now. These are absolutely very strong brands. KFC, uh, not so not exactly expensive. Uh, so we are looking for uh, brands that can charge a premium from their customers. Rolls Royce, Louis Vuitton, uh, Gucci. Yes. So yeah, all these are brands that are able to. That's so strong that they're able to charge premium. Lenskart. I'm not sure if it's able to charge premium. No, it does not. But uh, it's it's able to sell more, a lot more of their products. So yeah. So these are examples where we have understood how brand can be an a competitive advantage. Simple brand awareness does not mean anything if these two things are not happening. If either of these two things are not happening, and if this is happening, if you can charge a premium, that is where you have a very very strong brand. Uh, next, we come to intangible resources. So again, these are pretty much things uh, like a lot of overlap here. So brand is also an intangible resource a company has. Facebook and Google has customer data. They know what we want, what we are interested in, what we are searching for. So that customer data is something that's an intangible resource that only they have. No one else on the planet has these data points. And this is what makes them super powerful businesses. So this is their real competitive edge, the customer data and obviously the distribution as well before that. The pharmaceutical companies have the patents, the copyrights, the licenses, all those things which are intangible resources. Tesla's know-how, Tesla's data. So anything the pat patents copyrights anything that uh, licenses so all these things uh, are wonderful uh, business uh, like like strong advantage that a business enjoys so any other intangible resource that you can think of it's going to be super exciting if you can uh, interact here uh, so, so intangible, intangible resources that uh, you think a company has, uh, any given company, what can be the intangible resources that they have? Uh, that can be an advantage. 
signature clothing brand i'm not fully aware scholastic novels charge more okay uh, maybe i'm not aware of them as well uh so so uh, intangible resources where else can we find intangible resources facebook and google data we have seen pharmaceutical patents uh let's just say uh uh recipes uh, i think the spelling's wrong uh so so uh, re- any re- secret recipe that any company has any food company has in particular or restaurant chain has uh this can be one intangible resource goodwill premium art so uh, trademarks and copyrights yes but where exactly paintings from famous artists uh, they're not intangible they are tangible so intangible is anything that's amazon premium how exactly cred has a good a, a very good uh, exclusive uh, network of people so yes can say uh, we'll have to be more specific uh, like trademarks and copyrights but how coke and pepsi the brand that they have but uh, the the yes the recipe also that they have see uh arms tech rent out patents on chip design okay so if uh, i am not aware of arms tech but yes uh, if they do something like this then uh, then they have a very good intangible resource fifa team names yes in fact while tech, uh, while we are talking about the technology part we could have uh, taken example of ea sports as well software source codes yes can say but again these would qualify more under technology rather than intangible resources alibaba internet and software i think we'll have to be more specific yeah so far we have covered few good examples a uh, few uh, purchased goodwill purchased goodwill amrit uh, uh, that's a uh, that's an accounting entry more than a business advantage uh bcci yes the adva- but what is the intangible advantage that they have tcs and accenture the advantage uh amazon ease of return and refund but anyone can give you ease and return and refund uh almost flipkart is as easy to return and refund so it's not so much of a competitive edge competitive edge means something that the play- others can't copy easily as well so any intangible resource uh, particularly around copyrights uh, licenses data recipes secret uh, which stops the competitors from copying what the company is doing that is uh, that is a, a big example of intangible resource next is alliances so so this is quite straight forward we can see already any significant partnerships that is uh, that is a source of advantage it can be a source of advantage for example maruti and suzuki so when uh, when the indian car market opened up that point in time uh, this this comp- this company was found maruti suzuki where suzuki had the technology uh, to build a car and together maruti suzuki could sell the entire car a lot of it in the indian markets and because of that they gained quite a lot of market share and they enjoyed being the largest share Uh, ma- ka- uh, the car maker in the country even today tata and starbucks so today starbucks operates in india within an alliance with tata and it has just allowed them to understand the indian markets introduce indian products within starbucks as well uh, so this has been a great uh, uh, great like accepted very well in the ma- indian market then we have trent and zara so trent is again a tata company which operates zara brand in india what this does it allow it has allowed them to grow quite quickly and significantly in the indian markets so these are few examples of alliances would love to hear more ideas more examples uh, books and novels yes the intellectual capital the intellectual capital that's there but more than the publishers it's the author who has the rights in books and novels so for an author yes definitely tata Mo, marco marco polo yes a uh, hero honda so yes hero honda but it has now broken when, when it was there it was the largest bike company in the country uh, more examples guys that you can think of uh, for alliances and partnerships
Tata Tanishk actually uh, Tanishk is a brand by Ta- Tata. It's not a partnership. Tata Sky, I'm not sure. So see, two companies are involved here: Maruti and Suzuki, Tata and Starbucks. These are two different entities. With Tata and Tanishk, it's the pretty, it's pretty much the same entity. It's owners of the same brand. Uh, Vodafone Idea, yes, uh, it has it is an alliance, but more than an alliance, now it has become one company itself. Starbucks and Sabdesachi, I'm not sure if there is something like this, but if it is, yes, definitely it can be something. A uh, uh, lot of insurance companies. So if you see ICICI Prudential, so ICICI is a different company and Prudential is a different American company. I'm not sure if surely American, but uh, that is a wonderful alliance. Uh, I think Berkshire Hathaway has invested in Activision. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware. But yes, but however, uh, that is not an alliance. Alliance is not owners uh, like ownership thing. Alliance is where two different companies just partner for a particular objective. Tata aliens, yes, yes. Uh, Uber and Spotify, uh, I'm not uh, fully aware like uh, of any partnership there. But if it is, then yes, it can be. HP, uh, HP with what? Vodafone Idea is one company, so that's not exactly an alliance, that's a merger. General Mills and Nestle uh, can say, yes. So yeah, this way, wherever two companies mutually benefit each other to form an alliance to serve a business objective, that is where the alliance can be a competitive edge. Insurance of Tata uh, Tata company, Tata Daimler uh, Benz. So this is related to trucking, I think, yeah. Uh, I think this can be one of the bigger, uh, one of like, one of the strongest truck companies. So yes. So yeah, we have covered a lot of examples. Uh, so this is how alliances can be competitive advantages. Then we have assets and skill set. Uh, for example, uh, companies require skill pools. For example, TCS today has maybe more than 400,000 or I'm not sure of the number. I'm just taking a random number, but I think the number would be at least like 100,000 people. Uh, what skilled engineers or software developers? Infosys would have again, pretty much same numbers. So, so the idea here is to create that kind of, uh, that kind of skill set, uh, like that skill set and the workforce, uh, talent pool rather. Uh, it will be if you want to. If tomorrow you have to start, if you have to put together a team of hundred thousand skilled software developers, it will just be impossible to do. So it will take so much time to do it. To do it, and that is, and they have done it over the years. So that is the the, the talent pool and the and the human assets that the company has. That is a source of advantage that these companies have the simple team that they have put together, which anyone can bring in place, but it will take so many years for them to do uh, where these companies will run, like move again ahead. So that is again an example of how, how like, uh, how uh, the companies can enjoy uh, advantage. So TCS and Infosys, again, auditing companies have a lot of skilled, uh, skilled uh, human, human asset. So that again will take a lot of time for anyone else to put in place. Law firms have a lot of skilled uh, lawyers. So these the the, the for the la- the larger companies have put together one of the largest uh, human asset or skill set pool. So th- here, what we have to do this these reasons can be sources of huge competitive advantages. So any place else that you can think of. Please answer my previous question. Okay, what was the all joint venture companies, I'm not very sure. Uh, what was your question, Varun? I'm so sorry, I missed it. Uh, okay. But Facebook, WhatsApp is actually an investing thing. Fort Mahindra, yes. Facebook acqu- has acquired WhatsApp. It's not so much of a partnership. It's like they, it's their company now. Insurance partnership is because of regulatory requirements. Can we still classify this? Yes, we can. Uh, so we can classify them as alliances. Also, what happens is if you have strong partners, uh, strong partners, what happens there is uh, it just allows you more access to capital. Uh, for example, in the early days, Kotec had a partnership with, uh, I am not 
I think it was JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, one of these banks for the early part of their operations. Uh, so they just could get much more capital. Uh, they had access to much bigger markets to, uh, to kind of operate, which which uh, led to an advantage, like they could grow quickly and become larger. So yes, we can say that. Uh, all joint venture company can say, but not exactly. Uh, AMC skill fund managers. So the entire team actually, not just the fund manager, but the entire team. Sabesachi and Starbucks for alliances. Yes, possible if it is something that uh, McKinsey. So McKinsey, yes, consulting companies. Let me just put it that way. JP Morgan. So banks also have a certain kind of human asset pool that they have created, which takes a lot of time if anyone wants to replicate it. These are a few examples. HDFC and Paytm for previous example. Uh, yes, can say. Definitely can say. Uh, so yeah, uh, these are two examples so far. Let's move forward uh, with next example. Next re reason for it. Uh, country of origin, location. So, uh, for example, as we saw cement companies closer to market, uh, they will have lower logistics cost. Uh, so because of that, they will have, have cheaper cost and that is where they'll be able to uh, sell their products cheaper as well. And that will be a source of competitive advantage for them. Any natural resource companies that are close to the mines or where the raw material is extracted from, whatever form the raw material is extracted from, uh, that is also a, a source of competitive advantage. We took the example of China and Bangladesh for, uh, for textiles. So the country of origin or the location can be a huge source of competitive advantage because it affects uh, first the origin country and the location. The cost structure uh, is completely changed based on uh, the the, cost, the local costs in these places. And secondly, the availability of raw material is affected. And third, the overall logistics cost is affected. So these three reasons uh, play a big, big role. Uh, Three reasons uh, play a big role for uh, like uh, the overall cost uh, of the product. Result, if we have an advantage in these places, the companies can do really well in terms of advantage that they enjoy. So examples that you can think of, fintech companies. I don't think uh, that will be the case. Like the companies have the teams in short period of periods of time. Anywhere IT employee companies. Yes, that's what we uh, like HCL. Uh, all these companies actually TCS. Uh, so Gulf countries, yes. Uh, Gulf countries with oil, yes. Uh, exactly for this. Uh, wheat production in India can say yes after the Green Revolution. Any other examples where you think country of origin or location is uh, in fact software development industry in India? Okay. Uh, Australia for natural resources, yes. Particularly uh, uranium and few other uh, resources as well. Yes, definitely. So country companies there uh, will enjoy a lot more, uh, will enjoy a lot more effort, uh, will enjoy a lot better cost structure than companies far from there for those natural resources. Uh, we can even take an example of uh, diamond mining from South Africa. We can take an example of diamond polishing uh, in Surat actually or Gujarat. Uh, why? Because the cost structure is much cheaper. The talent is available for India for biryani. I'm not fully sure if that is the case, uh, that they have a significant co cost advantage or location based advantage uh, for coal. Yes. But, uh, what, what part uh, I think, uh, Chhattisgarh and Dhanbad, they have huge course reserve Chhattisgarh and, uh, Jharkhand, if I'm not wrong, but, uh, so yeah, these, this is how. This is how we can, uh, we can, uh, like source country and, uh, location can be an advantage moving forward to the next point, dairy product, like 
but dairy product companies are how the, how are they affected by uh, country of origin and uh, location next network benefits so network benefit means uh let's say let's take an example to understand this whatsapp whatsapp has uh, if imagine tomorrow whatsapp only has let's say 2000 user uh you want to send a, a, an invite to your uh, birthday party let's say uh, a whatsapp invite and half your friends don't use whatsapp Are you liking this session? Well, we have something more for you. Download the Zebra Learn app. Get free courses to learn from, attend live events with experts, work on assignments, connect with experts, basically everything you need to build a career in finance. Download the app now. So in this case, uh, in this case, this is an example of what network benefits. Uh, like because people are not available on WhatsApp, the value of WhatsApp went down for us. So now as and when more people start using WhatsApp, let's say all our friends become available on WhatsApp, only then has WhatsApp become valuable to us, right? So this is exactly what network benefits means as new users come. Old users find more value in the platform. For example, Hirect and Nokri.com. So Hirect is an app which allows you uh, to find recruiters, uh, like to find jobs in uh, startups and Nokri.com, as we all know, is a job portal. So as more and more people join these companies, like go use these apps, uh, more recruiters come and post their jobs here. And as more recruiters post their jobs here, more people uh, find value here and they further invite more people to join these products or use these products. So each and every new user is making the platform more valuable for the old user as well. So that is a network benefit example. We took the example of WhatsApp. It's only valuable to us because let's say 500, like all of our friends are available. Let's alternatively take the case of Telegram. So with Telegram, what will happen? Uh, let's say 10 of our friends are available and 10 are not available. So that is where uh, it's like, it's enjoying poor network benefits over WhatsApp. We all know that Telegram allows much more features than what WhatsApp does, but we're still not using this. Why? Because all our friends are here. All our friends are uh, using this and that is what network benefits does. It's a big, uh, advantage that it's a it's a very difficult advantage to overcome no new company can simply come up and take away network effects of the existing companies instagram as more and more users more of more of your friends start using instagram it becomes more valuable to us then we have amazon so as more buyers come it brings more sellers and that further brings more buyers because more products are available so this is how network benefits work. I would love to hear examples that you can think of. Uh, that you can think of uh, here. Masala from India. Yes, steel plant India. I'm not sure. Tea from Assam. Yes, for the previous examples. LinkedIn, Twitter, Telegram. So basically any platform business uh, that uh, has network benefits integrated within it. Baiju's, uh, I'm not sure how Baiju's, Zerodha also. Uh, so what is the advantage that you, what is the benefit that you get if more people use Zerodha? I am not fully sure if Zerodha and Baiju's will have network benefits. Sa same problem for Signal, poor network benefit, even though it has better privacy. Yes, uh, Signal was an app, uh, was a chatting app. Uh, that even Mr. Elon Musk had uh, promoted. Uh, so yeah, uh, definitely. You can't find your friends there. So what's the point? If the product can be good, but network benefit is a problem. Netflix, uh, yes, more users. So more, better content is created and then even more users and so on and so forth. Internshala for internships. 
uh yes can say mlm uh, is i'm assuming multi level marketing vestige i am not aware how uh, i am not i am not aware of the name vestige and uh mlm also i am not sure how it works like uh, how do current users advant benefit if more users join in uh next any other examples that we can uh, think of so this is how network benefits work uh, we have taken good examples in terms of uh, our google pay paytm yes paytm was a story of huge competitive uh, huge network effects uh, you adopt as like you had to pay using paytm and the shopkeeper also had to accept payments using paytm so more as more people wanted to pay via paytm shopkeepers had to have that paytm uh, scanning qr code but with time as upi came into the picture and people could scan and pay into other companies so in that case uh, in that case uh, the network effects went down zomato yes can say emails i'm not sure how upgrade upgrade or upgrade upgrade i'm assuming it's upgrade so i'm not sure how i think yes upgrade as more people come Are uh, they'll get more universities, better universities? Ola and Uber, yes, definitely yes. YouTube, yes. So yeah, almost any network uh, platform business. Next, we have innovation pipeline. So certain companies have an innovation pipeline that's required. Wherever there is, uh, whenever there is a large or long product development cycle. so whenever a pharmaceutical company has to come up with a new medicine the process can be from anywhere between 3 years to as long as 15 years so it's a huge it's a very very long period of time to get one product in the market uh, same is the case with agrochemical companies like fertilizer pesticides here the numbers might be slightly low let's say 2 to 6 7 years or 2 to 5 years so in this cases what happens is the products that the company will release today they were working on it let's say 10 years so yeah coming back uh, so the product that these companies are working on today that will be released let's say 2 years 5 years from today so in this case the companies need to have an innovation pipeline so any new company that comes up they will take a long period of time to get the product out in the market so uh, so to create if the company has such an innovation pipeline where they have seven eight products or maybe and the numbers can be anything depending on the size of the company if they have a pipeline of products that are about to be released are in different phases of their approvals uh, that can be a source of advantage as well so so th these are few examples that, that we can see innovation pipeline uh, anywhere you can see innovation pipeline being an advantage like the companies back to back releases are planned for next few weeks next few years uh, would love to hear so again tech companies can have this uh, pharmaceutical companies can have this agrochemical companies himalaya uh, himalaya what exactly netflix smaller pipeline time but still content is required yes so content pipeline actually can say uh, can you explain again yes so innovation pipeline means that the company has a pipeline of products that are to be uh, released uh and particularly product uh, pipeline in an industry in industries uh, where it takes a lot of time to release a product it takes a lot of time to release a product in such industries so innovation pipeline uh, uh such pipelines where uh, where uh, products are to be released that can be a huge source of competitive advantage this is what we are discussing uh any places where you think there can be a product pipeline like oh, innovation pipeline okay so as we saw our uh, tech companies uh, do have one uh, then again pharmaceutical agrochemical companies anything where medical is involved there, there are a lot of approvals are required so there again the, uh, pr uh, the the process becomes relatively long moving on uh isro yes definitely great example drone companies yes aeronautics new os from windows and apple but uh is this that's not exactly a innovation pipeline that's something a scheduled update of their products uh drone companies uh 
yes drone company aeronautics isro yes veg protein supplement so yes again uh veg protein supplements yes because it's a medical supply it requires approvals but what's the pipeline there see the pipeline is also important for construction companies also yes they have a pipeline it takes if they release a new pro- project it can take that's a great example actually mudit uh 3 4 uh it can take long be like 3 4 years to complete the project so they need to have a pipeline of projects one after the other for a youtuber there is a product pipeline because of new video not so much that, like a uh, pipeline means it should take uh, it sh- the release should also be long it should be uh, it should take time like the product release product creating of the product should take a lot of time insurance company i'm not sure how so yeah with this we have discussed examples for innovation pipeline few examples for advantages uh, we have four more uh, before we go ahead uh, these are these let to these two quickly uh, like these are pretty much similar supplier networks and buyer networks so supplier networks means having a very strong pool of suppliers like lot of people sell on your platform or on what or like what you do so having a strong supply supplier pool or supplier network so for example amazon has a large number of suppliers that sell products on their platform so does alibaba zomato has a lot of restaurants ola and uber has a lot of uh, taxi drivers so that is what supplier networks means having a large number of suppliers who are selling who are selling willingly on your platform second is the buyer networks amazon hul zomato oyo uh having so basically distribution having a large number of buyers to buy from your platform and not exactly not compulsorily your product but other products as well so amazon has a large number of buyers hul has a large number Well, uh, yes, Oyo also has a lot, large number of people. Just so it's easier for them to introduce new products. As you can introduce new products, and they have a large distribution ready already, and they can just uh, push the products in that distribution itself. So Im- imagine if Zomato starts selling something else tomorrow. So it already has millions of users. So it can start selling it to those users itself, and then build it up from there. how oyo as a buyer so okay uh, we mean buyer networks so oyo has a large number of buyers or people who have people who buy or book hotels from oyo so a large distribution actually so this is a having a large supply side and this is having a large demand side having a large group of buyers who will buy uh, things from uh, rapido yes on the supply side so can we have more and we discuss on more examples on both these sites rnd on medicines yes this is for the previous one turn construction for previous companies yes rapido has a large number of uh, bikers so that is supplier network uh dmart uh, danzo yes again pretty much same uh supplier network as well as buyer network walmart uh, yes supplier network i'm not sure of uh, sorry buyer network esco morrisons i'm not sure of these brands going ahead any other brand that you can think of so almost any platform businesses that is why platform businesses are one of the strongest they have huge network effects uh, supplier networks buyer networks Amazon Prime has a lot of uh, buyers, so buyers like a lot of viewers. Actually, YouTube as well. Apollo Pharma uh, has a large buyer network, but not so much of a supplier network. They must be said they sell their products mainly and few. HUL, yes. So yeah, this is how we talk. Take an example. This is these are two examples how uh, we can identify competitive advantages. then we have investors stakeholders and parent firms that can be a source of advantage as well so this we already saw in people like jio has a very rich in, uh, parent firm so that can be a source of advantage flipkart has a very rich parent walmart so that can be a source of advantage 
Ambuja Cement and ACC Cements recently had a major stake taken over by Mr. Uh, Gautam Adani. So uh, that now has this these companies now have an advantage with having a strong parent firm. Uh, then the examples that we were discussing early on in the uh, earlier on, for example, WhatsApp and Facebook. So, uh, in fact, Instagram and Facebook as well. When Instagram was bought by Facebook, Instagram did not have as many users. But once Facebook bought it, Facebook could market Instagram to their distribution to their users. And it's the parent firm that actually helped Instagram gain the size and scale that it enjoys today. So these are places where investors, stakeholders, parent firms can be a big source of advantage. In fact, even in the Indian startup ecosystem, companies backed by larger funds like Sequoia Capital, uh, then Lightspeed Ventures, maybe, uh, then so, so many, all these larger four or five companies, uh, four or five investors, companies backed by these ha enjoy much more uh, PR companies. Uh, they enjoy, they are able to attract better talent. They are able to, like, so they are able to get, uh, do so better, attract better capital going ahead as well. So, so all those things, all those things, uh, they can be also a source of competitive advantage. What are the few advantages that you think can be the reason uh, where where this can happen? OLX, eBay, yes, for previous examples. Reliance Fresh uh, by uh, investor by parent firms, yes, DMART also. Uh, DMART, okay, these are for previous firms, but Reliance Fresh, we can say for parent firms also. Examples that you feel uh, where there is an advantage due to parent firm. Let's wait a few minutes, seconds. Alphabet of Google. So what exactly? Like Alphabet backing the other companies, the other portfolio companies that it has. That is an advantage for the companies that is that are there. So uh, let's say Elon Musk recently acquiring Twitter. So that can change things up for Twitter quite significantly. So all these are how advantages work. Uh, last is scale. Companies that are hugely like huge, they enjoy something called economies of scale. They are able to produce more uh, cheaper. All these things happen. Uh, yeah. Uh, so all these things happen. And because of that, uh, because of uh, because of that, uh, uh, because uh, because of that, the advantages just flow in. So, for example, Reliance Petrochemical is the large is the largest, like one of the largest producers of petrochemical uh, products. So, what happens there is it is the cheapest as well. They have they have a significant cost advantage that no one else can match because of the scale that they have. If you produce, let's say, 100 quantity of something and the next player is producing only 10 quantity. So by definition, this person will be able to produce cheaper per unit because the costs get spread out versus expensive. So this is what happens, FedEx and UPS. So these are two logistics companies that, uh, that, are able, that have high volumes. So because of the high volumes, uh, they are able to transport things at a cheaper rate as compared to others, or they enjoy better cost structure for themselves if they do not pass it. Next is Amul. Uh, then we have an example of, uh, let's say, Asian paints. So scale also is a huge advantage because getting to scale betters your, economic, uh, betters your cost structure, also gets a lot of trust for the company, for you. For the company so one of the strategies to pick companies is just pick the biggest company in every com every industry so that is also one of the methods how companies can be picked so 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 would love to see examples that you think are at absolute huge scale where scale is an advantage basically Toyota for automobiles, ITC, yes, definitely. Uh, 
uh, ITC, more examples that we can think of where scale is an advantage. Tata Salt, uh, not sure how. PCS, uh, yes, can say. Almost every manufacturing company that's large uh, enjoys scale benefits. So with this, we wrap up our discussion on possible items that can be advantage sources. Uh, we'll come to these. Uh, uh, items that can be uh, advantages. So we understood that story side, the number side, and all these will only be advantages if they affect the numbers of the company. If they don't affect the numbers of the company, it's of no value. It's just, uh, it's very easy to actually get confused and tell ourselves stories that, okay, this company has an advantage, this company has an advantage, but actually if it does not reflect in numbers, then actually uh, there is no concrete advantage present. So with this, we wrap up the first approach to finding big companies in any given industry, looking for these factors. The second way to do it is uh, something called value chain. So value is Coca-Cola and McDonald's an example of alliance? Uh, yes, can say if they have some alliance. I'm not sure if they have. Tata, ELX, uh, IRCTC, any examples of scale? Amazon can say. Uh, Tata Motors, can't really say, I'm not sure of the market share. One very good example is Asian Paints, definitely. ITC is also a good example. Tata ELX, I'm not sure what they do. Data, Amazon. Uh, is Coca-Cola and McDonald's an example of Alliance? Yes, we have answered this. Uh, moving forward, uh, let's talk about the second point, value chain. Uh, before that, let's take a break for a couple of minutes. Let's actually take two to three minutes of break. Uh, and let's continue after that. Meanwhile, I'm here. Uh, any questions would love to take it. It's just two to three minutes. Let's again resume. It's 108 right now. Let's resume at 111. And roughly 30 minutes of uh, 30 minutes is uh, we'll discuss this for 30 more minutes. And then we can wrap up the discussion. Thank you so much for being patient so far. Meanwhile, we can have any other discussion, any other question that's there. Uh, would love to uh, would love to take up so let's break, take a break for a couple of minutes any questions guys anything anywhere related to previous session this session anywhere let's just briefly take a minute or two Uh, it's a five minute timer, but we won't actually spend five minutes there. Where can I learn the basics of finance? Uh, uh, so basics of finance, uh, I'm getting noise. So basics of finance, Rahul, uh, I think Zebra Loan would be a good place to start. A lot of it is also unpaid uh, uh, that should be good that can be there uh, there are other there are other good comp uh, other good edtech platforms as well so however i'll say uh, uh, yeah so however i'll say uh, start learning with an agenda like what's the purpose if it's career driven or is it uh, is it like to understand finance better on the side is it possible for an engineer with CFA level one to job land an equity reserve job internship? Yes, but will require a, a little more training. Uh, so other than CFA, I would say to, uh, would like a more training on the equity research side. So would say uh, create a few reports at your end and get started with it. Is it is there any exam or test preparation test after the course completion? Yes, there will be. Some sort of assignment, a small one, not a very long one, but yes. While doing an equity research, uh, the first step is to identify an industry and then a company has to be recognized in that specific industry, right? So uh, this is a great question, Uzi. So there are two approaches, actually, that uh, it's one is I'm getting a little background noise. I don't know from where. 
so first approach is it's called top down approach and bottom down approach so a uh, bottom up approach so top down is uh, uh is when you start it's called eic actually like economy industry and then the company so first you select the economy so if you want to invest outside india then you can start with an economy let's say uh, let's say whatever country uh, let's say europe then a particular industry in europe and then a company in that industry so this is eic or top down and the second approach is uh, second approach is where you pick the company first then understand the industry that's there and then understand the economy in which it operates so for smaller capital size for smaller funds uh, the sm- starting with the company becomes easier but as in when you grow in capital when you have to manage large amounts of funds it's always the uh, it will always become uh, economy and then industry and then company in our in this course what we are doing is first we'll pick up the industry then we'll pick up here we are identifying companies to invest in and then uh, and then uh, next time round we'll be talking about management financials and all such things uh, so after doing that assignment we'll get the certificate yes roshni uh, what what should be the road map to becoming a fund manager i think arvin that's not the correct question but i'll say start with this if you're not already in the field uh, start with how do, how can you become an equity research analyst and once you do that once you have an entry level job that then it's more about experience and keep on keeping like you keep on learning and with time if uh, if you, the work is good and you are uh, working doing good so with time uh, you'll become a fund manager as responsibilities increase but focus on the first step right now rather than the uh, fund manager which will be for most people it will be like who are in early 20 it will be at least like a decade away from today which approach is better uh, i think you're asking for uh, a top down or like first company or first industry so there is actually no better approach it's just it's a, there is actually no rule in this ki, okay you have to follow this it's a very simple thing like whatever works for you uh, personally for me industry works better uh, but but uh, it's just easier to identify things happening in a company than things happening in industry how can we invest uh, in us and european markets from india uh, i am not sure i think there is this app called ind money uh, ind money that i see a lot of advertisement and promotion for uh, so and then there is something other than that also called uh, i think for retail investors it's mostly ind money that's one of the services uh, there are other companies as well i think you a basic google search will answer this in which how much time period will we get the certificate roshni i'm not sure on this i think you should get it immediately i think you can get in touch with the team on the website and they'll guide you better uh, could you give an example of how to proceed with equity research project at the end of the board week so we have an idea on how to proceed while doing our project uh, this is great point uzi what i'll do actually is in the last session uh, we'll take about 30 minutes to actually go through an equity research project and like a done like one which has been done and we'll talk about a few uh things how you can create your own and i will strongly suggest to create one like after the course equity research is an area of study in finance field then will it, then is there a lot of marketing aspect we are learning i didn't follow this question marketing we are not touching upon marketing here uh why marketing is not required as much why why will you want to learn marketing can i become an equity researcher after mba you should uh, but you'll also have to train yourself otherwise as well a bit. Are FDI parameters also in line with equity research matrix? I did not understand this question, so sorry. Uh, FDI, I am assume parameters, what do you mean by parameters? After creating few reports, how do I go about searching for internships? Next, go, go and talk to people. Just talk to every, go look for a few companies. Uh, each of them has a just contact us button. Just contact them, talk to them, go for an interview. The, uh, you will and LinkedIn is one of my favorite. Like LinkedIn works the best, uh, and then there are other uh, other websites also, so they should help. So let's take questions at the end of this. Now let's get started. Let's move back. Okay, uh, my screen was on. Sh- uh, uh, let's start with value chain analysis. So moving back to value chain, last thirty minutes. So how value chain works? Last time around we discussed value chain. So value chain, firstly, very quickly summing up, it is a series of activities that a company does. 
so if you are to make ice cream last time around we took this example what will you do first is milk procurement then is logistics then is cold storage then is processing then is branding and marketing then uh, distribution that is taking the ice cream to the final users and then retail sales so these are activities that happen in simple sales of an ice cream right uh, rom, uh so so this is exactly what value chain means all the steps and activities that are required from the start very start till the very end uh wait wait i just saw that you purchased a product from zebra learn store and thank you so much we have something super super awesome for you introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses be it personal finance stock trading derivative financial analysis financial modeling uh, stock markets everything and anything that you want to learn in finance you have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period you'll have access to them as well this is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to enter this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle so that is how uh, that is what exactly is a value chain it's a series of activities uh, what i'll do to say is as an exercise uh, create a value chain for any given industry of your choice and would love it if you can share it on the on the platform uh, on the platform uh, like on zebra learn platform and i would love to see there let's discuss a few of them where we are going right and where we are going wrong we'll create a value chain here as well and this is a value chain template that was created by mr michael porter so he is a professor at uh, harvard university and has done some remarkable work in this field a uh, lot of you would have also heard photos five forces that we saw earlier on as well so he says that value chain will include activities around this form infrastructure like uh, processes in the form within the form how the form is built up human resources technology procurement procurement means uh, procurement means just uh, getting the raw materials the supplies then these are support activities and the primary activities just ignore these don't get confused so let's just count each of them as activities then inbound logistics operations outbound logistics marketing and sales and customer service so these are different uh, like categories of activities you can put each of these activities in one or the other category in this so uh, this and this entire thing is called value chain so companies can have advantages in certain parts of value chain for example certain companies able to procure way better than its competitors because of let's say they own their own farms or whatever the reason is so wherever in the entire value chain uh, like some companies can do certain things better than other companies so our job right now is to identify uh, activities that the companies that we are evaluating they do well so uh, we'll compare different activities of different companies and see who does a few key activities better let's say apple does uh, technology really well and marketing and sales really well so these two things are done really well others are also done well but these two activities is where they win over the market so just an example let's say uh, let's say uh, netflix does procurement of content really well uh, they do marketing and sales also really well so these are examples where we can identify what parts of the entire flow is done well by the companies our understanding of industry will be very useful in here so this is how a value chain looks like so after this what i'll say is we'll cre let's create a value chain actually together for a logistics company so you'll get a good and you'll get a good understanding how, how it works uh, so firm infrastructure so for a logistics company they'll have branches uh what else will they have uh, so the entire branch management thing comes into the picture uh next they will have let's say uh what else should they should have distribution center let's just keep writing as things start coming up 
then it, uh, uh, human resources so they have uh, truck drivers and uh, warehouse staff so far anything else we could take keep adding it here technology no such technology as such in house automation that's it uh next let's say procurement so procurement what is it that they want to procure they have to procure uh, trucks and warehousing space inbound logistics so they have to take uh, they have to do first mile logistics okay this should be operations here a uh, first mile then uh, pick up of the good all these things uh, operations is basically everything that's happening in the uh, in the uh, warehousing distribution centers so this is the logistics company that we are talking about then last mile you can even put first mile and last mile also within operations because in reality it's just the entire it's just the entire operations operations part for them marketing and sales like building brand name uh digital marketing let's say they do that services means customer support services so uh goods returned or rather goods return is not a uh, telecalling team support team let's say so these are few examples that we have taken where the entire value chain has been put together uh, for tci express now let's take another example delivery let's uh, so one thing what i'll say is fill this up at your own but let's take an example where delivery and tci express will go different so delivery will have much better technology than tci express why because this is a simple in house automation here they have an entire order uh, order auto, order of procurement and uh, fulfilling thing uh, they have their entire uh, like website uh, management website would be the wrong word they would also have website but the entire uh, back, the logic the back end behind it where a uh, lot of things happen so technology is where delivery will be better than them uh, maybe branches and distribution so uh, they do they might do branches and distribution branches better uh, than delivery uh, then what else Bra marketing wise delivery is above they should be above tci express uh, trucking and warehousing space they should be able to do it uh, operation side uh, tci express should be much more economical as compared to t delivery that, that is why they are able to generate larger profit margins so this is how we identified which parts are stronger for which companies so this is a great exercise and more you do it it will just be so much fun and so, so much better for general business understanding as well which part is strong for which company and basis that we can choose the correct investment uh, or the correct winner for every company that uh, as we saw apple has technology and marketing that's so good than others that everything else almost does not matter so 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 this is what we have to do this is what we have to disc understand which parts are done better by which companies and be, and how well and can the second company copy it can tc express copy delivery stack i don't know but if they can uh, then it's not so much of an advantage but if they can't then it's a very strong advantage so this is how uh, just a second guys so this is how uh, we identify competitive advantages another method as an example what i'll say is let me erase this i'll share the screen uh, this uh use this as a template and uh, share uh, any any given uh, value proposition that you can create and do this in the equity research group we'll we'll discuss it there itself uh, so this is how this is the second method how you can identify uh, companies with equity, uh, benefit, uh, companies that are at an advantage and then the third method which is very simple signs of competitive advantage so these are pseudos you can say or signs that indicate competitive edge so market leadership any company that's leading the market they will be having something that is better than the uh, than their competitors so market leadership if they are gaining customer share or market share 
uh, that would uh, that means they are doing something right something competitively they are doing better or else if they are able to increase margins over and above the industry meaning on an average the industry enjoys let's say uh, 10% ebitda but this particular company uh, is able to enjoy 25% ebitda so ebitda is actually a financial term we'll cover this very shortly in the next session actually uh, so so if their margins are above and over the industry there is a reason why that will happen and because of that uh it's a it's a big competitive edge like these are if these things are present that means that the company has some sort of competitive edge now is it a is it a very strong one that is something to be seen but in general if this these things are happening these can be taken as a pseudo for competitive edge last we have something uh, we need to focus on this this is something very important sustainability that is let's say we have identified companies that have competitive edge the key question is will it continue will that source of advantage remain as it is it will it remain intact so nokia had a very strong brand name very strong uh, kodak films had very strong name but they went away so problem was sustainability so again the key question is will it continue will apple let's say continue to remain the social status that it is will they will their products be so far ahead of the competition that it is let's say so 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 will it continue that's the key question so do we have any solid reason where the company source of advantage can go away so for example maruti suzuki might have problems from ev cars even if they enter ev market they'll take some time learning so it's not saying that they will the company's advantage will go away but it's a risk so do we have a solid reason where the company's source of advantage can go away so this is something that we need to understand in great detail uh if we pick up an industry company uh, and the advantage goes away it can lead to significant wealth erosion for us like uh if the, if the quality of business deteriorates the entire entire uh, thing goes for a toss it will be significant because we'll be buying at a premium when the uh, when the competitive edge was there and once it has gone away at that point in time uh, the sustainability uh, like because of poor sustainability at that point in time the valuations will also take a significant hit so are we confident that the advantage will continue for a very long period of time let's take a proxy of 10 years actually not even 10 years even if 5 7 years we can say confidently then it's a good start example uh, so certain example so ipl teams have very strong can you will you say that 5 years 7 years into the future csk and rcb will have the same kind of prominence i think it will there is no strong reason that that it will not happen uh, so in that case th there is good sustainability but with mobile markets will are we sure that 5 7 years down the line let's say oppo vivo will continue to be remain key players samsung will it remain key player might not be the case uh, why because every year the industry changes new companies come in old ones go out so that is how sustainability has to be judged if something is not affecting numbers then it's not an edge if something is an edge and it's not sustainable then that is not something that we will act upon and that is why finding good investments is a lot of effort but once we find it it is very very rewarding once we find companies that are uh, that meet all the conditions that we are talking about it is something that is very very important for us and the last topic that we'll talk about is winners and the cost of winners so whenever we identify winners in any given industry it's likely that it is known to people known to others as well so if something is known to others what happens in that case in that case uh, the the stock is not cheap uh, that is if you so first things a winner does not compulsorily mean good stock returns uh, so britannia is a clear winner in its industry hdfc is a clear winner in its industry but will be surely earned by buying these two stocks the problem is that the, this fact is known to everyone else as well so because it's known to everyone else as well these these companies quote for a relatively expensive price in the market so we'll learn about valuations going ahead but because these are expensive in the markets uh the idea is to like because these are expensive 
will we will have to pay a relatively higher cost for these winners so we can do two things either we pay a relatively higher cost or else we try and find undiscovered winners like small industries what the winners there so that is where uh, that is where we can we can only do one of these two things to buy industry to buy winners and there is no other option that's available but uh, so this is the cost of identifying winners the idea is to identify winners in the making or so you can also identify winners in the making those companies will have sort relatively higher risk uh, but uh, will give us better like can give us good wealth creation this time this requires a lot of uh, effort and time correct it will require effort and that is why it is something that's a full time thing the result can be extremely extremely rewarding uh, so winners will be expect uh, expensive uh, so yeah this is what basically we, we are all trying to say that we need to check the valuation and uh, balance advantage and valuations for a company that has a very big advantage we can't pay outrageous valuations and expect to make money out of it uh, that simply won't happen so we need to balance how strong is the advantage and where is the valuations at so we'll learn about valuations we'll do this in the next session actually valuations is something that comes in the last session i think uh, so this is the cost of winners that we need to identify and we also need to identify company related risks while identifying winners so come last time around we spoke about industry risks but when we talk about in companies there are certain additional risks as well for example uh, the management may change so management related factors uh, the company might diversify into more businesses which are not uh, adding value new product release might no, not go well structural advantage going away so all these things that can survive, that can risk the company's uh, future that is uh, that those are companies related risk so we have industry risk and company risk and we need to understand both of them and then act on it so this is also a cost of winners that we need to understand these risks before acting on it and also lastly we need to identify i'm just rushing through it because these are pretty straightforward company growth factors so any growth factors that are related to industry plus uh, industry growth plus uh company growth factors so new product launches new market entries these are factors that do not allow the industry to grow but the companies can grow because like they enter new markets or new product versions or new product launches so so these are factors that affect the company growth uh so yeah this is how this is what we need to do we need to go through all the numbers and the story side of finding winners we need to be sure what is the cost that we are paying for winners we can't pay outrageous costs and expect good returns we also need to take care of the risks that are related to the company along with the industry we need to identify the industry growth factors and the company growth factors and with this we end up the discussion there is one last thing how do you find the winners and the honest answer is there is no there is no answer the honest answer is there is no way how th there is no formula how you can find for winners what we can say is just keep looking everywhere just keep keep an open eye and once or like finding two or three winners in an year is a huge task if you can do that you'll make outrageous uh, investment returns so just go to malls and world around and what are people buying where are people what new stores are opening around you where are uh, where, where is the where is the rush where is the traffic what uh, so all those factors uh, what shops what uh, what shops have waiting times so those factors will tell us okay these are winners that are there these are winners these companies are doing well so just just wherever you see a lot of people like queuing up you should expect uh, returns next is numbers uh, so just look for wherever numbers are increasing margins are increasing significantly where and by margins look at gross profit margins also ebitda margins we'll see all these uh then sales is increasing at a significant play, pace or market share is increasing so anywhere these things are happening and these we can find in newspapers or tools like screener.in uh so let me just write it down 
so all these places you'll find uh, numbers and uh, so this can also be places where we can look for winners and lastly read a lot of media articles and uh, newspapers and magazines so personally i follow this company called uh, magster.in so it's a 2000 rupees subscription roughly uh, which which allows which gives all the newspapers and magazines so i follow this so looking for these three company these three ways are few ways how you can identify winners but there is actually no other no other uh, method how there is no fixed method how you can identify winners so with this we end up this session next time around we'll talk about management background and financial statement analysis very quickly i'll take on questions after this but before that i also have a small project to give uh, one is a uh, create a value chain for any two given companies that are competitors and identify the ones that are weak and the ones that are strong and would uh, love if you could share it on this particular place uh, so zebra learn groups basically the one that you are uh, that you are all members of already so just just share it i'm not sure if that's uh, somewhere uh, it's zebra somewhere it's there so once you log in you'll find it so love up uh, would uh, so put it there uh, next is uh, next project next so this won't take a lot of time maybe half an hour and next is find at least five indian companies uh, that are advanced, that are winners in their markets and don't take uh, very obvious companies like geo and flipkart uh, like look for smaller companies look for startups look for uh, or maybe unlisted companies as well so for example razer pay is doing excellent work in payment space so it's something of that sort so look for smaller companies and why what is the source of their advantage so these are the two examples, two uh, pro two projects you can say, or two activities that we'll say. Uh, one is the value chain, and second is look for five companies that have these advantages. Post it in the group. Would love to hear back. Would love to discuss any questions. And next session will be again next Sunday around management analysis and financial statement analysis. Meanwhile, let me go back and take up any questions. Uh, so you're not audible okay excuse me okay nikhilesh you're saying something it's audible please uh swot analysis uh what exactly is swot analysis would love to take any questions any questions guys would love to take it actually i went through the last part pretty quickly because it was pretty straight uh so guys any questions would love uh, any part uh, you did not understand so just that finding winners is hard finding winners at good places good valuations is even harder and it's very important to find it so if you can find even two or three of them in one year we'll have tremendous tremendous investment returns we don't need to find one every month that's not how it works what will happen is you might find two in two like couple of weeks two good ideas and you might not have an idea for next uh six months as well so yeah this is how uh, we'll find winners. So, so far we have done a lot of heavy lifting. We have, what is the difference between supply chain and value chain? So, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Actually, uh, Uzi, uh, can you write a question? Uh, actually, team, uh, if you could put up the projects there in the chat box, it would be good. I think someone is asking, can you write a question? Uh, so supply chain is a part of value chain. Uzi, uh, value chain is the entire activity. So supply chain is just. How do you get the products? Uh, any template for assignment too? So uh, let me finish the question. So sorry, I just didn't. So supply chain is actually how do you get the raw material to the finished goods? That's it. But uh, uh, but with uh, uh, value chain, it's the entire activity. It includes marketing. It includes logistics. It includes procurement, human resources. Uh, customer service, customer feedback, entire thing that a firm does. So what you can say is supply chain is a sub part of value chain. Very absolutely correct. Any template on uh, assignment two. So I think assignments will also be updated on the page that's there for the course in the sec week two button. But uh, but here as well, uh, I think uh, the page that we have. Let me put on the screen share. 
this page delivery value chain you can use this particular uh, this particular uh, this particular template uh, and for the first one it's pretty simple you just need to name five companies and their uh, so let me write hold on so company name industry in which they are uh, they have an edge over uh, and uh, the reason of edge you can even write a couple of lines about the competitors if you like and in 25 i think I, uh, I think this will be updated in the page on the page as well sometime today or think or tomorrow i'm not sure uh our equity research internships work from home or or office uh, our office mandatory people i would say even if it's work from home always look for office internships you learn so much more uh because it's just so much the conversations the informal conversations and particularly given the young uh, like young age will understand so much what that happens behind the scenes how to write an equity report arvind will cover this in the third i think in the fourth session briefly uh equity report is something uh, that has parts to it and first you will always your first two or three reports will always not be that great but uh, but yes that's how we go about it one step at a time winners in the making identification step assignment okay so there is no honestly there is no template or no way to identify winners in the making it's just and at times you'll identify few companies that they are making they are winners in the making but they will not perform they'll just not perform so so there is no that you will go wrong like it said if you are right uh, 50 to 60 50% of the times in equity research you do you have done a great job because it's it's how the things are things change things just end up not ex- the way you expected so there is no way how i can say what i can say is just look for companies where rush new wherever so one thing that i really follow is whatever new stores are opening around me in my city in a different cities so what that sure ensures is that if that store is opening in my city it's likely that it's opening in other cities as well and because of that we can expect that the numbers will uh, like the store is doing well and it's growing but then we also have to look for uh, growth like uh, a good source of advantage where should we submit assignment so i think that has been answered uh, you can put it in you can go to zebralearn.com uh, and you can uh, you can basically log in there and then there will be a equity research group you can send in there and also uh, also you can send a mail after that or you can send a mail as well hello at zebra loan so today's topic is going to be something that's super fun uh it's going to be uh, about financial analysis basics of it and also a bit of valuation evaluating finance related transactions to determine okay uh perfect chalo let's get started uh before that uh let's do this let uh let rohan share a link to this uh, so today's session a lot of it will also be done on excel so let rohan share a link to the excel file and if you guys can download it uh, would be amazing if you could do it on the site um we can take up we can do it in the background meanwhile let me just put this on a second guys let me just share my screen uh uh 
uh, is this valuation similar? No, Rahul, we'll be talking about the detailed parts of it in uh, in this part. It's a lot to do with uh, it's a lot to do with, uh, in Shark Tank. It's a lot to do with negotiations. Here we'll be talking about uh, how we calculate it at the back, uh, like what price are we comfortable buying a stock. Uh, again, that's a very very vast topic. We'll be touching upon a lot of basics of it. At the end, you should be in a position to have a broad understanding right now. So let me just put on the screen share uh, very quickly. Uh, second. Uh, yes. So basics of financial statement analysis and valuations. Now on this, we can go on for months and months. So here, what we'll do is we'll keep it simple. We'll touch upon the important concepts. Are you still using Google search blogs, YouTube to learn finance? It's time to switch to something more efficient. Introducing the all in one finance bundle, especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time. Learn about personal finance, stock investing, stock trading, financial analysis, financial modeling, futures and option, MS Excel, and so much more. Everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots. With 150 examples, 30 plus tools, 6 certified courses and 2 visual books for the next 1 year. Take the most definite step towards your finance career now. We'll, touch, we'll get, the, uh, we'll get the, uh, the main crux out of it and we should be in a position to understand if a company is placed horribly wrong or is doing well and we should also be in a position to uh to uh to kind of identify uh the valuations that is it like bizarrely overpriced or underpriced and again valuation is something that comes with a lot of experience and a lot of reading so that is also something that goes along with it so quick recap what we have done so far we learned in the first session how to analyze any given industry with industry sheet last time around we talked about how to find winning companies in the industry a lot of you have submitted the assignments, so that is great. We'll have we can have a uh, we can have a discussion of the assignments later on or on the groups groups as well. Uh, in this session, we'll be talking about the financials and the valuations. Uh, last time around, we spoke that we'll be talking about management, but what we have done is management. We have pushed it to the last session, that is the next Sunday, and it just made more flow here. Uh, and financial statement analysis, we'll be talking about it right now. So let's get started. Uh, here is all what we'll be learning. So we'll first walk through an annual report and quarterly results. Then we'll start with accounting analysis. Uh, we'll practice on Excel. Then we'll start a bit with peer analysis. Then we'll talk about valuation. We'll touch upon the concept of absolute valuation. We'll uh, go ahead with relative valuation and exit multiple approach. So this is the agenda for the day. Uh, we'll be talking about all these things and it's going to be a lot of fun and I would suggest if you guys can keep on doing these things uh, uh, like together that's where we'll learn because see if I walk you through and if I do everything here it, we won't learn as much uh, uh, so one thing meanwhile as we are discussing it would be great if you guys would I'm assuming a lot of you would have already downloaded the excel sheet uh, that uh, Rohan has shared uh, in the chat I can see the link that's there it's a google link so just download it uh, in your device and let's get started. It's going to be super fun. And anywhere, again, now we have been doing this anywhere you have questions, just push, keep on pushing in the chat button and we should be answering it on the go. Uh, One second, uh, just a second. A lot of people have been using the first link that was sent in the chat. Please don't use that link because that link is being used by Anurag. So the second link that is available in chat, you can use that link for the uh, Excel sheet, right? Sorry for the interruption, Anurag. Uh, now you can continue. Yeah. And just in case if there's an issue that's going on with Google and stuff, like issue in the sense if there is any confusion, one thing that you can do, Rohan, is just put up the file on vTransfer and share it. It's a very simple thing. That will even be easier. But anyways, let's just move on. I think uh, by the time we come to the Excel part, a lot of you would have already downloaded it. Uh, we'll start with an annual report. An annual report by a company is one of the most important documents that they submit. Uh, spelling mistake here. Uh, so a lot of it. Uh, so 
and being comfortable with an annual report takes a lot of time uh, and takes practice like you have to go through multiple annual reports and that is where you start getting comfortable because annual reports can be anywhere between 150 to 350 pages depending on company for companies like reliance it's even like 400 450 pages so so uh, so what happens it's just too much volume of data every year uh, for someone who's starting out to process so it's important that we spend time in on an annual report and understand the different sections of it uh, because an annual report has almost a lot like if not all a lot of data that's of value to us as an investor and uh, like other investors other equity research analysts are all going through annual reports and not just one year of so coming back uh, we'll start with an annual report. Uh, this is something that a company publishes every year, as the name says, annual. And it has a lot of important data points that is required for us for our analysis. In fact, for management analysis, the whole source of data, data is from annual reports. So let's actually do this. How it works is, go to this website called screener.in. I'm sure a lot of you would be aware. Uh, you can even go to BSC India. Uh, that's Bombay Stock Exchange and any company, let's just say PCI Express, because this is what we'll be doing today. Uh, so here, uh, if you scroll down, like towards the very end, you get this section for annual reports and just click open the uh, latest annual report. So this is 21, 20, and this is how an annual report looks. So for this company, it's 150 pages. Uh, and these are the different sections that are there for an annual report introduction then the md and the ceo writes letters to shareholders and here they talk about the past year the targets that they are trying to achieve the next year it's basically a written interview uh, from the top management and they talk about the direction where the company is headed next they talk uh, next there is corporate governance report so corporate governance report mainly talks about the board of directors and how the company is being governed. So how the corporate, the company has been governed, like is it a healthy uh, structure of governance? Uh, so just, uh, so yeah, is this a healthy uh, governance system? Then there is a structure, then there is a section called MD and A, that is management discussion and analysis. I'll show all these to you in this report very shortly. But uh, so this is one of the most important data points for us. Here what happens? The management discusses and analyzes the the management analyzes the business. They talk about the industry, the company, the past year, the future year, all these things for every business division. So this is one of the most important uh, data points for us. Then we have standalone financials. And lastly, we have consolidated financials. So uh, standalone financials means let's say if you're talking about TCI Express, so uh, financials that is numbers for TCI Express. And if you're talking about, uh, let's say, uh, consolidated, then TCI Express plus any subsidiaries or any joint ventures, or anything it has. So whenever today, whenever we'll talk about financial statement analysis, we'll talk about consolidated numbers, all the other ownership that a company has. So these are the different sections of an annual report. Let's quickly go through them. And after that, we'll move forward to the Excel sheet. So this is how the annual report looks. So it starts with some uh, and see uh, any annual report or in fact, any document by the company, it will always have two parts, relevant data for us. And secondly, data that's required for compliance. That is data that is required by, let's say, uh, let's say someone like a BSC or someone like a SEBI, they, let's say they have mandated that this kind of data is required. So that data might not be the best or most useful data for us. We need to break it down into data that's useful for us and data that's related to compliance. So all this is fine. We'll move forward. Uh, so this is how it starts. Yeah. Coming back, this is how an annual report looks at, uh, and I saw a question, what is TCI Express? So TCI Express is a company that is a listed company basically in India. 
uh, that is into logistics. So we have taken this example today. Uh, so this is what we have been doing in the first session as well. So we'll be going with TCI Express as example and uh, another company competitor actually, uh, Gati Express. So we'll uh, we'll take these two as case study or example uh, while while following up uh, while actually going through the financial statement analysis. So this is how an annual report looks. If you keep on scrolling, this is the introduction section that we had seen. The company is listing down all the services that it offers. If you see Surface Express, C2C Express, if you dig deeper into it, we'll understand more about it like Air Express. Uh, so this is using trucks and uh, this is using aeroplanes. This is International Air. E-commerce Expresses, let's say take uh, executing Amazon's orders or e Flipkart's orders. Or uh, So this is the introduction section actually, if you keep on scrolling. So companies, uh, companies talk about all that is their awards, recognition, their products, all such things. Next is the chairman's message. So here the chairman would have spoken about what they look forward to, what are their goals, what are they doing currently. Here is the managing director's message. And it's not compulsory to have all this. The order can change. The company can even skip a few things. Uh, then they have the key financials. Then we start about we start with the corporate governance report. So first thing is uh, okay. They have the MDNA first. So this is the board of directors, different people who are involved with the companies, and then MDNA section where they talk about the economy, the business, uh, the outlook. Like what do they expect going ahead? The logistics sector, what the company is doing, how is it placed? everything that the management sees they talk about it and we get a lot of very useful data in this segment so if you see it's about 15 to 20 pages already and the management has completely described the entire business like what are the different risks that they have the economy how is it placed their initiatives then there is the something called boards report uh, and uh, within it we'll have the corporate governance report so here we see who are the auditors, uh, how is risk being managed in the company, uh, then dividend distribution, then let's say ESOP scheme that the company has. So all this data is very much available to almost anyone. It's just public. It's out there. Uh, and we need it's data that we must must as an analyst go through. So it takes time to go through these to get used to it because it is a lot of data about 150 pages. So here is also a lot of it. Imagine 300 pages, 400 pages. So particular of employees, like what is the CEO's remuneration? What is the director's different director's remuneration? All these things are available. Who, who is capable or skilled in what field? So we need to analyze these and this will be used in the next session for management analysis. But here we see that what are the different committees that are there? So nom nomination and remuneration committees by these four people. This was so uh, within the board, there are multiple small committees that run the company. So risk management committee, share transfer committee. So all this is here, like how has the share price moved? Then certificate on corporate governance. Okay. Then business sustainability report or business responsibility report. Actually here they talk about the different things that they're doing for the uh, environment, different things that they're doing for their employees different things that they are doing for their customers. Uh, then there is something called business wise principles as well, where they talk about business should like principles that they have laid down for themselves. Now, these are not absolutely binding that they absolutely follow, but uh, like almost all companies, but in general, that determines the direction of operations. So this is how it works. It looks and this is so far we have gone through the different parts of documents. Uh, now we come to do, uh, auditor's report. So auditor's report is basically before any financial statement. So here we see, uh, let me just go through it. So we have a finance. Okay. So here they don't have a consolidated or standalone. The company has no subsidiary. So only one set of, uh, one set of financials balance sheet, statement of profit and loss, uh, changes in equity and cash flow statement. We'll be going through all this. But before that, it's very important to see uh, auditor's report. 
so what happens is any company that creates uh, financials submits financials before that they need to get an independent auditor's report that is they get they need to get it audited uh, that is uh, like for anyone who's coming from a non commerce background that is like saying that okay i need to get my books of account checked by some third party who is independent so that is what happens over here uh, they need to get the numbers checked by the, by an auditor so that the government knows it's right and the auditor can then say things like okay i have faith in what the company is reporting so for example in our opinion and to the best of our information and according to the explanations given to us uh let's just in the so required and give a true and fair picture and conformity with the accounting principles uh generally accepted in india under indian account, uh, accounting standards so what we see here is that the auditor the third person is saying that okay all the explanations are good and the numbers here give a true and fair view of accounting principles and what is happening uh, on the ground so and they have one key audit matter as well that they have pointed out that needs to be checked so this is how an audit state auditor report works that okay what are the things they have a problem with and are they fine with other parts of it next uh, the auditor also gives explanations about certain things how they uh, like what the company is doing what the company is not doing uh, the auditor is a ca here we have this firm who has been assigned as the auditor and once that is done then we go through the balance sheet statement of profit and loss and statement of changes in equity below this so once we have these numbers here below this we have a notes to financial statement analysis and so notes what will happen is here we have a brief summary let's say uh, operating expenses they have just written one number 566 crores but what exactly under 566 crores like what are the major expenses let's say 300 crores is going into some xyz item so what is that item so all that breakup is given in the note section so if we go to note 27 and we'll get a breakup of operating expenses same is the case with almost every line item and we have to match the note number and the notes at the end uh it will be pretty basic for anyone who's coming from finance background but let's just quickly go through it before we move forward to the numbers part uh then the next thing is very important that is accounting policies so companies every time have to uh, disclose uh what accounting policies are they using like what is it when are they booking let's say like what are the rules that they are using for accounting let's say tci express when do they count something as a sale uh when the order is received or when the order is delivered so th these are things that are uh, that need to be taken in uh, mind uh that is uh like what are the different accounting policies uh going ahead what do uh like what do the research analysts who are professionals what do they do they compare accounting policies for every year and wherever there is a change like the accounting policies have changed uh in any between any two periods they just take a big note of it that is very important to understand if the accounting policies are changing then the numbers are not really comparable uh so those things need to be taken care of after that we quickly come forward to uh notes to accounts and this is where we start getting all the notes like for capital work in progress what's the breakup uh for intangible assets what were the additions during the year disposal disposals uh all such things need to be taken care uh, like so this is what we'll primarily be working with and it's a lot of data actually for anyone who's new to this for anyone who's starting out and going through the first time through these for the first time it is very intimidating and it is very uh, scary let's just not use the word scary but it takes time to get used to it and it is very normal uh, it is very easy to get a uh, lost in this data keep on scrolling but it is fine with time uh once we go through a couple or not a couple but let's say six or seven annual reports after that we should start getting a hang of it where to find the board representation where to find uh what date what uh let's say what accounting entry uh, or what accounting line item 
so these are things that you need to keep in mind these are this is this is what we'll be dealing with and you can so what i'll say is uh down open this uh oh, let's just let's not do this let's uh go to scene.in let's take a couple of minutes right now and open gati limited so gati limited is also a uh similar company to tca express i'm not sure if they're exactly similar but just say they operate in the same space uh open this uh annual report for 2021 and i'll take a like let's break let's pause for a minute and go through the different seg- scroll through the uh, through the annual report and see what are the different sections that are there so let's just take a minute uh what do you do in case for unlisted private companies abhishek damodar damodar you are saying something i don't know what uh okay i have a lot of questions here uh speak hindi no um, mr self employed this will remain primarily in english or bit of it will be in hindi but uh i think this one will remain a lot in um, this language order from malayalam i don't know what you're saying e shop is employee stock exchange uh Uh, sorry employees employee stock options uh, is equity research restricted to listed companies because of research what data and uh, docs drhp are needed available in public uh, so uh, not so much abhishek equity research can be used very much in unlisted companies as well it's just that the sources of data and availability of data kind of changes uh, for unlisted companies we have to we don't get such detailed annual reports uh we have to take out the and the numbers uh the numbers from this website called mca or you might have heard of zoba or or such companies where uh you get the financial statements that is the balance sheet the annual reports and that you have to pay for uh it's not a lot it's like 100 rupees per statement or something around that uh, 100 rupees i think yes uh, last i checked um yeah what to do in such cases like for unlisted private companies uh, again as i said is of fine elbo um, okay what's this i don't know what is logistics business so logistics is basically uh let's say taking any physical goods from point a to point b ah uh not so much puja it's not exactly financial modeling financial modeling will take a lot of time to teach uh, but it is the as you can say it's a very concise version version of uh, version of it secondly will today will not be talking about forecasting because that's a uh ronak jain 200 yes transportation business you can say in a way in a way uh 200 i don't mean i don't know what exactly but 200 but let's move on so i'm sure a lot of you would have uh, gone through let me put on the screen let uh, so the screen is the screen visible no i don't see yeah so we went through uh, we i hope you guys got a chance to go through gati logistics uh very quickly they, they have the index so this is the introduction section what the business is about then so they have a shorter uh, shorter this part uh the shorter introduction section then there is this letter let me just zoom out a bit so so as an analyst it's our job to go through all of it then again the introduction then the board of directors then these are all information about it's similar to introduction only introduction okay so their introduction is after the letter so this way there is no uh, exact uh, rule that okay this is to be this order has to be followed csr pillar so they, here they talk about the csr that is any thing good for the society that they do uh, which is generally not for profit then there is something called notice to shareholders uh, so any decisions to be passed during the year that is here then we come forward to uh, the next section is about the directors what are the directors doing what's their remuneration what's their expertise so now we come to uh, directors report basically uh, we'll be talking about corporate governance within this itself so yeah the different annexures have come uh, so the pay, the pay scale for different uh, managerial people the csr policy of the company then secretarial audit report so that that is fine two pages 
So all these different documents are there. Report on corporate governance. So how the company is being run, how the company is being governed, different people involved, all that is covered here. So this is how we go through. Then we come to the MDNA section. So this is the MDNA section. It's relatively short here. Then the business responsibility report. And finally, after this, we should be getting uh, the statement of profit and loss. Is this standalone or do these guys, uh, do they also not have any subsidiaries? So we have the auditor's report and I think they don't have any, it's a staff. So they also have a single set of accounting because uh, it's, they also don't have, seem to have a, a lot of subsidiaries which will require them to publish uh, standalone and uh, consolidated statements. So with this, we have now gone through two annual reports very roughly, very like overview wise. Uh, now, so this is what, okay, what exactly? No, I didn't follow. No for uh, how to go through these reports, like what crux do we have to take out from this? Okay, so uh, Uzi, uh, the crux, the idea here is that uh, all the analysis, be it industry related, be it uh business like the last time around that we did uh, business related the competitive positioning be it about management or be it around uh be it around numbers everything the source of raw raw data will be annual reports and the different industry reports so whether we will be referring to annual reports it's not something like we go through the annual report and take uh, we have to take out any solid plugs out of it right away for different purposes whenever we refer to annual reports we will uh, we will kind of understand it. We'll, uh, we'll refer this for raw data and taking out our own anal analysis. So for example, uh, today when we go ahead with this, uh, what do we say? This uh, uh, financial statement analysis, I'm putting it on the screen. Uh, Let me just remove this. Um, so yeah, this. So for this, what we have done is, uh, I'll, uh, so we have used the annual report as the source of raw data. Like we have entered each and every line item referring the annual report, and because that is the most authentic source of information that the company has published, it's coming directly out of the company. So that is wh that is what the crux of uh, annual report is. Like it is the source of all the. Uh, data that we'll be using, uh, if not all, a lot of data that we'll be using and we'll be taking a lot of decisions based on the data that we get from the annual reports. So this is how we go through the different sections of annual report. Uh, now let's quickly, uh, and the second part is actually quarterly report as well. Let me show that as well. So every company, they publish quarterly reports. Uh, that you have to scroll here and see or else you can go to BSC India and... And Let's just enter Gati Yeah, so if we go here uh, to financials We get results here we see a lot of uh, corporate data. Okay, we have it here as well. Uh, where is the, uh, yeah. So if we see quarterly results, we have raw PDF here as well. So let's say for March, 2022. So this, it will be a three, four page document. Okay, for this company, they have released a really long one, 23 pages, but in general, it is like three, four pages. Okay, it's March, that's why it's that long this is 11 pages so they they have released the uh they have released the auditor statement is this yeah so they have released the auditor statement as well then we have the quarter like for last three months like three month um in uh, annual state annual report or not annual report income statement then they have segment revenue okay this is a relatively decent uh, like a detailed one and then any changes that any news announcement that they have that is covered over here. 
so this is how an annual uh, uh, quarterly report looks it's very straight forward it's a very short version which talks about the quarterly uh, performance it talks about the quarterly performance it talks about uh, it talks about the quarterly performance at times they also publish the uh, the balance sheet at the end of quarter here they have but it's because march that is why they have is also a good possibility then they have also published the cash flow statement so and then if there is any news announcements that to be that is to be made uh, that is also published so this is how we'll use changes in equity is uh, statement is it important yes it is important but in most cases what happens is that uh, equity statement does not change every year uh, it's only when uh, it's only when any uh, as i've said the idea is to kind of use these documents as raw materials uh, to to understand the data uh, to understand or to conduct our analysis further so that's the idea uh very quickly just hold on a second are you liking this session well we have something more for you download the zebra learn app get free courses to learn from attend live events with experts work on assignments connect with experts basically everything you need to build a career in finance download the app now yeah so coming back screen stuck i uh, know it's not stuck it's i was actually here itself so um let's move on so this is how uh, annual reports and quarterly results look uh, after this session i would strongly recommend uh, to walk through at least three annual reports and spend like half an hour each uh, to just get an understanding of different sections that are there in an annual report because it takes time and without an annual report to know like understanding annual reports properly uh, you like it's not just not possible to work as an equity research analyst starting so next thing next uh, quickly we will start with accounting analysis so yeah so now i hope uh, all of you have the uh, all of you have this uh, excel sheet downloaded so how does a typical accounting analysis work or a financial model work uh, so the first things first this is not a financial model we won't be able to create a for complete financial model because that will require another 4 5 weeks in itself because it has to be very specific uh very detailed so i'll just give a quick overview of how financial model works and then we'll analyze the past numbers so how it works is it has two parts to it the first part is all the past numbers that is a a means actual numbers like actual numbers in fy 2019 20 and 21 e is estimated numbers so these are forward numbers that we as an analyst forecast that okay fy 22 the company's sales uh, or uh, cash and cash equivalents should be this bank balance should be this and so on and so forth so this entire process of entering numbers logically uh, it has a complete method to it we can't just put throw in random numbers here that is financial modeling uh, and we we'll, we use that as reference going ahead that okay uh, using this financial model we have taken an investment decision so this is how it works just a second yeah so to so 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 uh, a second yeah so what we'll do is today we'll focus on the analysis part so analysis mainly means understanding the past numbers not so much and focusing on the numbers that are to follow that means uh, we won't be dealing with the forecast part however a bit of it will be answered in the valuation part so let's quickly get started and i would suggest you to do alongside as well uh, so what we have done is we have entered the last 3 years numbers for uh, tci express the uh, balance sheet then we have the income statement and then we have the cash flow statement just the basics of it and then we have the different ratios so we'll complete we'll do two things today uh, we'll use it for uh, we'll use it for this thing uh, 
com- we'll conduct a common size analysis we'll do it for two companies and then we'll compare and see the differences uh and see what's the idea behind the an- analysis so first things first let's build a common size analysis what exactly common size is let's uh, a lot of you would have seen that in the past so let's copy this guys anything that's not working you zoom on the screen okay i'll zoom on the screen please zoom on the screen okay i'll just zoom on the screen all those using the excel file please create a copy of the same all right uh do if not create a copy just download it in your device that will be the easiest thing don't create a copy and can take five year average or take scenario analysis like base or yes shubham we can do a lot of things but let's just keep it simple for now it's let's start with the absolute basics uh five so we have taken three years uh, more experienced analysts they do it for six years seven years in fact some even go up to 10 years and that's also uh, that is also something we can do but here for simplicity let's start with this copy this i hope you are doing alongside uh, and let me zoom in a bit once you copy this come on the right side and make a co- copy of this so now what we'll do is we'll make a common size of this so how exactly common size works uh we need to get the number for total current assets all right is equal to so cash and cash equivalents divide by total assets and we need we'll scroll this to the right uh so so don't, don't get confused with this if like uh, excel uh, it's just very basic uh so let's me just show it to you first and then we can kind of understand it much better so it should be in percentage and we'll increase the decimal points and now we'll do this to it for the right and then we'll go down as well i've taken the right number all right let me actually reduce the decimal point one bit and why is this showing value because the numbers are not there correct so this is how this is what is happening so let me just remove this value thing you can do it using if error as well so let me very quickly show what we have done and then so all this i'm doing it manually for simplicity but uh, after like understanding excel or knowing being more fluent with excel we can do it uh with a lot of techniques and methods that are available all right so it's ready so this is the common size statement for last 3 years so what have we done here let me make this sideline item bold yeah so what have we done here we have taken our total assets to be 100% for every year so for example our 378 crores total assets so we have taken this to be 100% so what percentage of total assets is total current assets what percentage of total assets uh, in this particular year next year as the total assets increased uh, the current assets should have increased only in that same proportion did they increase by a proportion that is more than that so all that is to be understood here let's have a quick look at it so what we see we see property plant and equipment that's the share of property plant and equipment in the total assets that is reducing 
which means the company is now needing less property plant that is fixed uh, properties like uh, let's say warehouses buildings or let's say trucks if they own so all that the the requirement of this uh, of that is reducing over the years and where is that money going uh, so we see share for capital work in progress has increased okay so the company has yes so we see uh, the company's investment in the last two years like work in progress that has significantly increased so we can see very easily here that the company is significantly investing in capital work in progress that is in building new assets so this is one example that we see uh, intangible assets the company requires very low intangible assets the company has very low investments uh, from the total assets so where is the major chunk the major chunk is in uh, fixed assets and the second major chunk is with account receivables so the company's account receivables has gone down quite significantly that's a great sign but and current investment has increased so we see all these things that okay bank and current investments so this is increasing if we come to the numbers here so we quick we very rightly see that the company's current investment that is investment in let's say mutual funds investment in fixed deposits all that is increasing so this is how we actually analyze any companies it's all there it a uh, common size statement is one of the most powerful simple yet powerful it's because it's so simple that it's often often overlooked that okay why do we need to do go ahead with common size but it is just we we'll, we can we can forget these numbers for a while now and just focus on what is changing the company's cash equivalents have come down and bank balance has gone up so it's pretty much the same thing no significant change here current investments has increased quite significantly in the last two years uh, account receivable has come down quite a lot uh, that is a that is a very big like plus sign the company requires less working capital uh, if this happens then advances is stable all these other line items are very small in number so we won't really focus on them account receivables uh, or rather pp and e property has gone down but against it the capital work in progress has increased so the companies uh, like new assets are expected to come up very soon uh and deposit is fine this is pretty much stable so this is how uh this is how it works so this is how the asset side looks now let's compare it with the liability side so what is happening on the liability side the account payable has also decreased quite significantly so what do we see despite increase in sales the account payable here has decreased that means less assets are now account payable so what the company is doing here we can see that the account the company is taking quick payments and also releasing quicker payments so that is a very good sign for the company's health now we need to understand this in greater detail that why are they paying it so quickly if if it's willingly then it's a great sign uh if it's because uh, the market credit standards have changed in those cases then it might not be as good a sign short term borrowings it's almost repaid it's a very small number anyways uh, other current liabilities all these are smaller numbers uh where is the next big number so 27% okay that's the total so that this number of current liabilities has gone down mainly due to account receivables others are very small amounts long term borrowings the company has no long term borrowings or very low long term borrowings that's also a big plus okay the remaining part is from equity so total liabilities is either account, uh, accounts payable or the rest of it is equity which is a very healthy structure for any given company so equity is about 70 and then 80% of the total liabilities and equity so the company is debt free the company is financial uh, the the health of the annual uh, the balance sheet is very strong so what i'll do what i'll say is after this session uh what i'll ask is uh create this common size for any company take any companies punch in the numbers from consolidated uh, balance sheet uh, also what i'll say is uh, submit the one that you are doing right now uh submit that document as well so after this like after creating a balance uh, this thing write analysis that you have uh, from from for the major items so here we see account receivables 
has gone down significantly which means company is receiving faster payments now our anal our job as an analyst is to identify the reason why this is happening because this is now reflecting in numbers and it's very important for us to take note of this also where is the major item where are the major items it's mainly account receivables and property plant and equipment or here as well if we see uh, it's cash account receivable and property plant and equipments in most cases 80 90% of the company's resources will be tied up in two or three places in most cases in other cases it might be spread out so we need to really really keep a close eye on these line items that what is happening in capital work in progress what is happening in property plant and equipment so this is the first thing next liability side again we saw the capital here is mainly tied up in uh, uh the, the uh, it's mainly with account payable and uh, the equity part so one we understand the uh, structure of it and second we are, we have our own analysis to make uh, that okay what why is this happening the analysis the idea is uh, what is happening and why is it happening so i would suggest to take time out and create this analysis uh, thing so after from the common side that okay what is your analysis of what is happening so this way we have analyzed this company's balance sheet it's a relatively very uh, strong balance sheet uh, they are take, they are able to take faster payments now and they have no debt most of their cap uh, like this capital structure side is equity and uh, account payable so yeah that is done next let's create a similar balance sheet or rather a similar common size income statement i mean well before that any questions that you guys have what is the formula used okay a uh, formula this is common size analysis uh okay 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 i'll just share the formula so the form uh, could you maybe analyze a financial statement of a company because i'm confused as to what analysis has to be done uh all right so the formula here is see what we are doing here is uh we are trying to identify what percentage of total assets so one thing is total assets and total equity and liability is same that we all know basic accounting so the idea here is how is the asset side spread like out of total assets what is majorly like what is the main like what are the main 3 4 line items and how is it changing over time so we see that account receivable is a major component of total assets and that's reducing over time so this is the this is what we have done Uh, the formula is very simple uh take each line item so here we have taken b7 so what if we go to b7 b and 7 that is cash and cash equivalents divided by total assets that is the total assets that is there b28 so b28 is total assets so the percentage is 16 crore divided by 378 crore that comes out to be 4.3 percentage 0.97 divided by 378 uh like 171 divided by 378 so on and so forth so this is the common size and for liability side also you can do the same thing each and every line item divided by total asset total asset or total equity and liability pretty much the same thing so this is what we have done after that the right left uh, the the calculation that was pretty much excel rather than accounting uh just hold on what is the formula used we can also see the numbers from before to analyze all this uh yes this is what uh, so yeah so we are doing 2019 20 and 21 we can take it for periods as like for 5 years 7 years as much as we want could you just repeat the formula yes i just did divide by total assets uh for balance sheet and divide by total revenue for income statement you please to be make how please how to make common size balance sheet from the previous one i did not understand the question do you want me to make another uh, balance sheet uh, do you want me to make another uh, common size balance sheet let's do that actually quickly for gati very quickly will not take more than 2 3 minutes 3 4 minutes so what what is the first step the first step is to punch in these numbers these numbers we have manually typed 
from the annual report and make sure to type from annual report only no other website no money control no screen or nothing just annual report that is the most authentic source of information uh going ahead we use paid uh, you can use paid uh, software uh, such as uh, capital line or bloomberg to get these csvs downloaded now what we'll do once we have this make a copy of this we have made a copy of the entire annual report we'll scroll this to the side paste i think i i should have pasted in the second row not too much am i missing this okay i just want it to be in the same line so that it's easier for me so now we have made a copy of this now next thing what we'll do is quickly is equal to inventories so we selected the inventory number divide by total assets so where is total assets so this is what we have done 11.99 divided by 1489 uh where is this okay here so now we don't we want uh we'll put a dollar sign this is so dollar sign just don't get confused with basic excel so it just allows me to copy paste quickly so now uh, we have done this we'll convert this into percentage here we have the percentage sign we'll increase the number of decimal points okay so it is 0.8% let me just make it one i'll press control right just copy paste what we have to this so this is excel actually it's uh, so what you'll have to do is once you have linked one cell uh then you can control right uh, shift and select the right cells and press control r so that just drags this formula to these two cells as well now we have selected this again and we'll scroll down select the down thing and we'll use control d so that just scrolls the formula down as well so this way we have now the we now have the uh, this thing ready we are deleting this uh, we are doing this manually to make it quick otherwise we have formulas for this as well so now what we see we have a lot of let's just see the asset side quickly so we see out of 100% uh, 28.6% is goodwill okay that's a very so that's com this company has made a large acquisition in the recent past uh, a 34% like out of total assets 34% is goodwill 11.6% percentage uh, percentage is uh, property plant and equipment 15.8 is account receivable which is steady as well uh, cash and cash equivalents so now what we can do is we can compare this and the co two competitors basically so for example tca express here does not have any goodwill this company has a lot of goodwill to it as well so that that uh, goodwill as an accounting entry i meant so here a large portion of accounting like what 425 crores is steadily tied up in the goodwill so how, how goodwill works is they would have made a large acquisition in the past and that is where they are getting this entry from account receivable is steady for this company and increasing for in the last year for tca express that is not the case it's in fact decreasing so these are things that we need to compare like different companies uh, what they are doing they have 11.6 percentage in property plant and equipment these guys have 41 percent so uh, tca express has much more assets uh, as a percentage of total assets as compared to gati so they have less assets on their own books versus tca express so this is how we compare that okay what are the two companies doing differently same we can do it for uh, liabilities and equity as well so total liabilities 50 percent is total liabilities out of which 42 percent is current liabilities okay so they have financial liabilities also that is large and they have some debt as well 
that's not that large 2.1 percent so they have repaid a lot of so if we see here they have repaid a lot of long-term borrowings that they had so this is how we need to we can make a lot of sense out of uh out of uh the common size balance sheet that's there i hope it's can you please repeat how goodwill is increased or decreased over time anshula that's uh, I, how uh, how their bank balance increased to 3.4 percent as they have pay their creditor on time in 21. Uh, Nikhilesh, uh, which company are you talking about? I think the bank balance increased for this TCA Express. So just how, uh, for the year it's increased because you see a part of it has come from cash and cash equivalents and also a lot of working capital tied up in account receivable has been freed up. So that also has contributed to uh, increase in bank balances. So probably because of these places. Can you please repeat how goodwill is increased or decreased? So Anshula, goodwill increases or decreases in terms of accounting when a company makes a large acquisition offer or large acquisitions in the past. So for example, if they acquire, let's say, company with uh, for the if they acquire a company for hundred crores which has assets worth fifty crores, so the remaining fifty crores has will be shown as goodwill. Uh, that is how it works. So this is how goodwill is acquired when large acquisitions are made. I don't know what is this control. Uh, I don't understand this. So let's just move on now. Uh, so with this, we have wrapped up. Uh, we have wrapped up this thing. Uh, balance sheet, common sizing. Next, let's do the same thing very quickly for this uh, profit and loss. And any questions, just please feel free to put it in the chat section. I just like it if it's pasted in the same line. Otherwise, it's our choice actually, it doesn't matter, but I just feel more comfortable. Here, what we'll do, take this revenue from operations, divide by total income. Or we can even divide by total revenue as well. It's our will and wish. We'll take total income. So here we have this one entry. Uh, we'll put a dollar behind the number 62. So we'll convert this to percentage. And in, okay, this has to be 100 percentage always. All right, why will this be 100 percentage? Uh, if we increase the decimal point, actually, it will be under. So the difference was so small that it was showing as 100%. Control and R, as we quickly saw. And if we scroll this down all the way down here, we'll con press Control D. And now we have all the numbers here. So if we see, gross profit is 100%, which is not possible. They are not selling a physical good. What would have happened is that they, it would be some miscla uh, some classification. Uh, so, but let's just see very quickly. Uh, let's just highlight these lines, which are of more importance to us. So now we have the uh, in common sized income statement ready. Uh, so the the total the total income will always be hundred percent. What percent is, and so revenue will almost always be hundred percent or very close to hundred percent. It's mainly the expenses that matter. And if we do this, we clearly see that employee benefit expenses for the company is increasing. If we just go through this, we might think that okay, it's only increasing because of uh because of uh the because of the numbers here uh like because of the sales increase here but here we see that it is increasing why is this showing us 10.26 d64 by d62 so d64 is 87 by okay the sales has also come down correct 
so and okay so the the company has also seen one year of degrowth because probably because of covid uh but coming back so we see that the employee benefit expenses is increasing quite significantly and this expense has decreased quite significantly carriage so this is how margins are created and uh, like taken away and created so this has this has eaten quite significantly into the profit margins but this has created a lot of space as well 5 6% additional uh, margins in ebitda so yes uh, payments this is a small number small number so these small numbers won't really matter so much rent expenses increasing uh, so our question whenever we talk to an talk to a company we we'll ask why is the rent expense increasing so significantly because that is what we want to understand about 90 basis points it has increased other expenses so this is how it works and total expenditure what was 88% of revenue has reduced to 83% of revenue ebitda margin has increased quite significantly ebitda is basically earning earnings before interest taxation depreciation and amortization uh so basically what we are saying is that the margins have increased quite a lot uh here again we see margins increasing uh margins increasing and as a result the margins have almost increased by 70% uh in the last 60% wait wait i just saw that you purchased a product from zebra loan store and thank you so much we have something super super awesome for you introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses be it personal finance stock trading derivatives financial analysis financial modeling uh, stock markets everything and anything that you want to learn in finance you have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period you'll have access to them as well this is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to enter this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle in the last 2 years and that's a big plus we see profit loss after tax in fact even after the uh, even after like sales has decreased the company's profits have increased that's a big big plus for almost any company uh and this is what we are seeing over here with the common size we just get to understand the different sources like why has the margin increased number one reason carriage freight and distribution expenses has gone down uh quite significantly 7 percentage decrease here is a big big decrease even a percentage or 2 percentage increase or decrease is a big percentage but 7 is absolutely huge and that is clearly reflected in the profit and loss so we will analyze here again we'll follow the analysis segment and we'll write what are the things that we observe that the employee expenses is increasing but here why is this increase decreasing one thing that is that why is this possible why this is possible is let's say they would have received, achieved some economies of scale one reason i don't know what is the reason i'm just guessing we talk to management or we conduct our own detailed analysis we will get some answers to it but we are getting the important questions here that okay carriage freight has decreased so why that is the most important question then other expenses has also decreased which has created all this margin so this is how it works uh let me just see, look at the question rent increasing maybe because they are expanding their business quite possible gross pos- profit showing 100% is it possible no nikhil uh, unless it's a digital product like when there is zero cost of re- uh, production in that case 100% gross profit is possible in this case it's not possible i am believing that there is some uh, there is some there is some error there is some reclassification here uh like this should be up or this should be down also i'm getting some background noise so i uh, just please bear with that uh rent increasing may be due to expanding yes correct uh yeah this is how it works this is how we get the numbers uh, the common size statement we have the common size now for common size balance sheet and we have the common size income statement 
and you understood how the analysis is done and this is just as a professional when we we'll start working the level of depth of analysis also keeps on increasing but here this is also a lo- lot of value we'll get a lot of inputs from this let's quickly do the same for gati express very quickly pasted the line items here uh is equal to divide by total income and i'll put a dollar behind number 79 and convert this to a percent page i hope you are all catch uh, you're all following this so it's a very simple tool yet it's super powerful it gives us the entire okay i just made this mistake i should have pressed control now and i think yeah so we have all the numbers here so yes total taxation what percentage of it is lost in taxes uh, let me just mark out the different margins it's very important to follow the margins all right so this company is working into losses for last 2 years all right so here what we see we see that okay revenue is fine uh we see that uh employee benefit has increased so it has increased for both the companies so we see that something might be happening in the logistic segment itself which is leading to increase in employment benefit expenses uh f- freight carriage has decreased but only very slightly for this company as compared to the earlier one So this is how we need to compare. For them, it's forty-seven percent of revenue. For them, it was seventy-one percent of revenue. So okay. So for them, it was much larger portion of revenue. Here, the portion of revenue is much lower. Uh, then this has increased. Other transportation expense, rent expense has decreased for them. Uh, in fact, it has decreased, and then it has increased. Office maintenance is very small. Other expenses has also increased. So as a result. of all the activities put together the ebitda margins have decreased it has gone down from 5.9% to 2.9% and if we and depreciation and amortization has also increased as a result the company ha- and then profit loss before okay so this company has some some out some big line item like some one time loss that they have incurred but overall the company's margins have ta- are taking a com- considerable hit uh due to these ex- in these expenses increasing so this is how and we can compare now each and every line item for the two that okay how are the two companies positioned what's the difference in their strategy because all these things do reflect i just zoomed out quite a bit so this is how we create of an income statement why so why carrier charge i don't know nikhil i we also need to understand carrier charge may be uh, increasing i think for them it's decreasing for dc express it's decreasing for these guys also it has decreased for gati express as well so it's not increasing actually the example you gave for goodwill other 50 crore will be shown as goodwill liabilities are being shown as goodwill and then how is that good for acquiring company uh so but for for the acquiring company all the other parts the assets increase the sales increase so it's a business decision right uh they are getting some sort of uh they getting some sort of uh, a synergy value as well they uh they for example in this case they might expect that all of the all of the uh, customers of that this particular company whatever company they acquired their customer they can sell more products of their own com- as well to the customers of the second company so there are synergies as well so lot of things actually go in acquisitions and there is a fact uh, uh, there is a fact that says about 60 70% of acquisitions don't actually work so this is also one of the reasons the premiums paid are very high at times it works at many times it does not work as well so it's just an accounting term actually depris this goodwill it's not it's nothing tangible that we can see nothing tangible that is uh, available to us so with this we have understood the income statement and balance sheet 
any questions so far guys would love to take questions goodwill uh, rahul, rahul uh, anshla we need to understand that these are two different goodwills we are talking about one is goodwill as an accounting entry and sec so that is just a balancing number that means nothing and second is the general market goodwill if you have if you have more goodwill in the market what does that mean uh, that is purely like that is that mean that might mean more profits more wealth and all such things but in this case this accounting entry will not lead to any of it it's just an expense that's there any other questions would love to take you can keep on putting your questions here i will take them one by one meanwhile uh, meanwhile let's move forward to uh, cash flow so what we are doing right now is we are getting to understand the accounting parts we'll put all this together in the valuation parts which will be a lot of fun and lot of and very important for us uh, so that part it will all start adding up very beautifully so let's keep follow i hope all of you are following along and creating these sheets on the side as we are doing it uh moving on cash flows activities cash flow statements so what we have done is we have not taken the entire cash flow all the line items we have just taken the uh the overall numbers for the three different types of uh, of the overall numbers and we can get the flow that okay the company is generating good operating activities good operating cash flow they are investing it regularly in uh, they are investing that cash flow regularly and also they are paying loan or paying dividends either of them so this is what we can make from this how so one part is cash flow from operating activities so anyone who is not coming from an accounting background or commerce background cash flow statement has three parts one is cash flow from operating activities that is cash generated in day to day activities second is cash flow from investing activities that is cash used to buy new assets or cash uh, obtained from selling assets third cash flow from financing activities that is cash taken from issue of new shares or uh, cash taken from uh, paying like taking new debt or cash used for paying off debt or dividend or interest all such things so cash flow from operating the company is constantly generating cash flow from operating activities which is what the case should be if you are generating profits you should make convert it you should generate a uh, cash here as well then the company is uh, put using that cash in investing activities and financing activities so they are either pay uh, they are buying assets and second or investments as well and second they are uh, paying off debt or paying dividends again the same thing investing they are uh, getting capital and using that for investing as well as financing again here they are putting it in investing and financing here the financing outgo has decreased so this is how we need to ensure let me just put this actually on screener.in as well let's go to tci express and if we scroll down to uh, to cash flows so we see that for the last 5 years the company is generating cash each year so sorry for the background noise guys it's just few things beyond control uh operating voice uh, operating activity that constantly generating cash flow and that cash flow is being used in investing activities as well and uh, mainly in investing activities and a bit of it in financing activities so this we can ref uh, this this is what we can see so this is a good sign that they are able to generate cash here a lot of companies are not able to generate cash here and that's itself a big problem you as a company it's their uh, company should generate operating cash flow so with this we we'll could we have quickly understood the financing the cash flow activities we we'll just quickly check that the questions all right nikhil is so sorry uh i let me know what i can change let me just zoom in a bit what if liabilities is more than assets of the acquired company then will goodwill be higher or lower uh i think uh, if liabilities are higher uh, if liabilities are more then you're buying basically negative assets so in that case goodwill will even be higher because 
all the cash that you're paying let's you will be paying cash right uh, that should be high uh, that uh, if it's not a cash deal it's actually also dependent on how the deal is structured if the company does not pay cash the company just takes the liabilities then how much liabilities are they taking uh, if they are paying any surplus cash then definitely goodwill will be higher uh, guys uh, let's let's uh, let's move forward from goodwill the reason is uh, it's not that big of an item uh, to get confused in that case my point is we don't miss out on the important stuff uh, we don't miss out on the important stuff the understanding of the numbers uh, goodwill has always been confusing for everyone that's a given fact right from school right from colleges right from even working professionals uh, and it is an accounting entry it does not mean anything in terms of uh, value that it adds it is just the premium that is paid uh, by the acquiring company and that's all that it is it does not contribute in operations uh, for example assets do contribute in activities in operations but goodwill does not do even that uh, it's just a fixed number in fact if we look at this the goodwill is actually a constant number so it's where is goodwill so yeah it's actually a very constant number and it's just something that sits on the balance sheet it does not contribute directly to any activities of the business uh, it's just a price that was paid for acquisition uh, so with this we have un- but goodwill comes under assets and is if a company acquires another company with I am not following the exact question, Srishti, uh, but uh, I think we can take this offline as well. But uh, but exactly what happens is it also depends on the structure of the structure of the. Uh, let me just put it here. It also so if it has negative liabilities, that is, uh, assets are less than liabilities. That means the company will have negative uh, negative uh, equity as well. So now to buy this negative equity, uh, what is the deal structure? Are they paying cash or are they just onboarding liabilities? So, so one and two, both options are possible if they are paying surplus cash. So what they are doing, they're basically paying this part. They are paying if it's it's negative equity. They are paying that negative part and whatever cash they are paying. Both this is being paid surplus. If they are just onboarding liability, then are they not paying any cash? So it's a bit technical, and uh, that's what I was trying to say. That it's very easy to get confused in this. So I think it will be proper if we can let's just schedule another session on this. This value during written off and winding. Right. I think I need to move on because I think I can consume another hour on goodwill. But any question, I think let's let's store it for the end and we can answer all the goodwill questions at the end very uh, properly because uh, because then we we'll lose the will you lose the uh, moment um, not the momentum exactly but uh, the idea behind what we are discussing. So so far we have understood uh, understood the uh, the common size balance sheet and common size income statement. Next we'll understand the basic ratio analysis and growth numbers. So let's very quickly do that. And here we need to understand the numbers. So growth. So for growth always we'll never be able to calculate for first year. So growth how it works? Uh, what is the growth in revenue? This number divided by this number minus one so percentage so this is the growth in this is the growth of revenue for EBIT again same go to EBIT divide by previous year minus one Yeah, uh, let me just add one more. And so this is how we keep on. So uh, despite revenue degrowth, the EBIT has increased. So, and again, now same PAT divided by previous year minus one. And then convert it into percentage and increase this. 
and this is how it works this is how it looks like uh, the pat has grown 22% 12% and just to track these numbers it's very important like year on year what's the growth been uh, for different items and always we will want the the pat growth or ebit growth to be more than revenue growth because it just means increase in margins uh, how are the margins looking so this we calculated you uh, in the common size already so gross profit margin should not be 100% technically uh ebitda margin so we see the ebitda margin here as an exercise what we'll do is after this session you will uh, uh, like we'll fill this one uh we'll fill this all right i just think i made an error 76 so uh we'll fill one of these from scratch for any company of our choice so that will just give us way more understanding uh bad margin is here so that is what will give us way better understanding of what we are doing let me just zoom in the screen a bit more did now so with this we have understood the basic uh, so ebitda margins it has increased ebit margins it has increased and pat margins it has increased if we do it for years we'll just understand how the margins are increasing and decreasing over time next we'll understand the most important matrix that personally i also follow and it's a super powerful matrix the returns on capital return on equity so return on equity what does it mean return on equity is basically let me write it down here roe it's the only roe and roce they are the only two items only two ratios that get affected by any any uh, change in the income statement as well as the balance sheet so let's quickly use this returns so returns means pat divide by so this is what the uh, this is what the formula is pat divide by equity this is what the form okay let me write it down one pat by equity okay so pat is basically profit after tax we just write down that profit after tax and equity so what we can do is we can further break this down into pat so basically let me explain over here it will be way easier so roe is equal to profit after tax by equity now we know this basic math that we can multiply and divide by same item so if we multiply by uh, revenue upon revenue this this both should cancel and we'll still get the roe so what we'll do is this formula can be redone as pat upon revenue multiplied by revenue upon total assets into total assets upon a uh, equity so if we cut this uh, revenue and revenue should cancel out total assets and total assets should cancel out and we'll still get the roe number right so we have just broken up this formula into this format now let's go back and see what exactly what is pat divided by revenue it's the profit margin right pat divided by revenue is profit margin multiplied by revenue upon total assets so a lot of you would have read in schools colleges revenue upon total asset is total asset turnover multiplied by total asset upon uh, equity is leverage so if we multiply these three things we should get the roe this particular format is called dupont analysis and it's one of the most powerful tools that is there to analyze and to understand our uh, our research so it's very important to kind of understand this uh let's so we'll conduct a dupont analysis first pat margin so 
we we understood the formula at margin multiplied by asset turnover multiplied by leverage let me read this so pat margin i'll take the questions after this i am expecting we'll have a lot of questions after this so pat margin we got it from this from the common size so this is the pat margin asset turnover how will we get that so asset turnover is equal to total assets upon total revenue so total revenue is this divide by total assets so total assets is this in the balance sheet so let me just reduce the number of decimals but yeah so the company's total asset turnover has decreased meaning uh, the um, like the company was initially able to get 2.7 times like uh, sales like if they have 100 crores of assets they were able to get 271 crores of sales now they are requiring more and more assets to get the same amount of sales a part of it is also to do with the decrease in sales also another part of is part of it is to do with uh, higher asset turnovers that are required lastly we have financial leverage so financial leverage is total assets the same numerator total assets divided by total equity so where can we find equity here we have equity okay we don't have a sum do we have a sum calculated here uh b15 okay we don't have a sum so what we'll do is we'll have we'll calculate our own sum and we'll add these two so this is uh, so out of like the company uh, out of 1 rupee and 42 paise it uh, assets that it has 1 uh, rupee is equity that is what this means so with this we what we have understood is that it is a relatively high margin business uh, and a mid medium asset turnover business and the company is using very less financial leverage so now what the uh, what the uh what this roi turns out to be this multiplied by this multiplied by this so the company is generating very all right i just let me just reduce this convert it to percentage the company is generating 27 26 24% roe which is extremely extremely good in most circumstances but this analysis is one of the most powerful analysis dupont analysis uh what is the total profit margin the company is making anything changes in the annual report uh, in the income statement the profit margin will change anything changes in the balance sheet the asset turnover and the financial leverage will change so this gives us a complete picture of the health of the entire business and okay how is the health of the business moving so pat margins are increasing but asset turnover is significantly decreasing and leverage is also been reduced by the company so that means they have a larger equity ownership as a result the company is able to generate this amount as return on equity which are uh, which are these make good numbers 20 anything above 20% is uh, uh, is very good in terms of return on equity in fact some people even use 15% and that is also fine so this is how we get return on equity numbers and after this session i would strongly recommend you to conduct this two point analysis for at least three different companies and three com which, which are competitors what it will do for you is it will give you a complete understanding of the business that okay how is it working on next okay let me just take up questions here is uh okay sir why you are taking growth on the basis of ebit according to me it should be pat so we have taken both uh it should it have taken ebit growth and pat growth as well both of them so uh total sum is there uh, total sum is there in total equity so, no uh so there are two parts to total equity uh there is one is shareholder uh shareholder equity and second is other equity which mainly uh, includes the different reserves and surpluses and retained earnings so always we will add these two it's always the sum that we have to take it's always this way so 
So this is the number that is the total equity because every year the company is making profits and adding out to this equity shareholders equity. So that also has to be calculated. Okay, we had this total equity calculation here. I just missed it. So yeah, these same numbers. Uh, according to what according to what report analysis show startup company hai ya old one uh, don't you don't uh, all these ratio numbers won't really work for a startup company because startup companies won't have that kind of history that they won't have stable businesses as yet uh, a lot of them will op be operating in uh, will be operating in losses as well uh, in generally it works good for listed companies that have a decent track record uh, of operations a few year a good few years of history uh what does dupont analysis show dupont analysis is yet another indicator it's not, uh, it's one of an other indicators which shows the total overall health of the uh, company the company's financials why is it so important and powerful because it's one of the very few matrix that is affected by any change in the financial statement if anything changes in income statement dupont is affected or roe is affected if anything changes in uh, in this thing uh, assets or rather balance sheet so then again dupont is affected and uh, return on equities uh, affected please explain financial leverage again all right financial leverage let me just show on this uh, on the ppt so i'm Finance. Are you still using Google search, blogs, YouTube to learn finance? It's time to switch to something more efficient. Introducing the all-in-one finance bundle, especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time. Learn about personal finance, stock investing, stock trading, financial analysis, financial modeling, futures and options, MS Excel and so much more. Everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots. With 150 examples, 30 plus tools, six certified courses, and two visual books for the next one year, take the most definite step towards your finance career now. Financial leverage. I hope you guys are able to see this. So financial leverage is equal to uh, total assets. Upon equity, we can also use other for others for it. We can use something called debt equity that also uh, total debt upon total equity that also shows uh, that is also indicative of how levered the company is. But total assets upon equity, what this means that out of all the assets that are required for the entire business, let's say the company needs 100 crores of assets for its business how much of it is using equity that is own capital by the company if if it is 80 crore that's own that is equity then the financial leverage is 1.25 times if it's 100 crores by let's say the company has uh let's say 40 crores own in that case it is 2.5 times so what happens is the less equity you have in the business uh, your return on equity will go up because the profit they'll be making here, let's say it's 20 here also, it's 20. So here they're making 50% ROE here. They're making only 25% ROE, but also the risk increases because if anything untoward happens, then most of the capital is not owned by the company. It's either borrowed or it's from the customers as advances or from suppliers or someone from outside the company. So that is what financial leverage means. How levered is the company? How much of the total assets is owned by the company? So yeah, that is what uh, it means. What is, uh, okay, Pooja, Jay, uh, no means, uh, like, can you please uh, elaborate? Okay, I was not, vis not visible. I, I hope I've answered it. Uh, what is asset turnover? So asset turnover, Rahul, is total revenue. upon uh, total assets so let's say the company is using let's say you are a facebook let's take this example now facebook is generating let's say 100 crores of sales just using hypothetical numbers what are the assets that they need they need a server they need few computers they need a office space some furniture so maybe 10 crores of assets 
so here the asset turnover is 10 times that is facebook is able to generate 10 times the assets that it has let's say you are a warehousing company uh you using assets worth 100 crores to generate 10 crores of sales or rental income let's say in this case what is happening your asset turnover is 0.1x so it shows the asset turnover shows how asset intensive your company is how as like more asset intensive it is the more capital the company constantly needs because they'll have to constantly buy more and more assets and like they'll have to uh, keep on reinvesting more capital from the external uh, supply, like from external investors or banks or borrowers uh, so this is what asset turnover means how many times can you rotate your entire assets as revenue as pat deduct ebitda so okay uh, why not just use pat upon equity uh, so i think that's a great question pat upon equity will give you roe that's a great that's a very simple straightforward thing but the idea here is to understand the breakup of it where is your what is the source of your roe right here we can clearly see that roe is coming mainly from pat and also from asset turnover but here asset turnover has decreased it's mostly coming from pat itself so this is what we need to understand that where is each of these line items headed uh, that is why we need to kind of uh, break it down does pat deduct ebitda uh, just a second does pat deduct ebitda so how it works is ebitda minus depreciation and amortization will give you ebit minus interest will give you profit before tax minus taxes will give you pat so we will be doing we'll be working with this pat ebitda say like we'll move from uh, all right this is not pat tax this is pat so we move from ebitda to pat in a systematic manner and conduct create uh, and uh, calculate roe using this number i hope that answers the question uh sir what is statutory remittances uh, it's beyond the scope of this discussion i think we can take it up at the end a statutory remittance where did you see in this i don't see it here uh, we can discuss it at the end uh next question is uh so yeah we have the roe calculated we have done the dupont analysis uh return on average uh return on average capital employed so we can keep it simple here as well we can use return on capital employed sorry i think i have a question asset turnover is most useful in which industry analysis or which type of company analysis someone that's a great question asset turnover see uh, personally i do it for almost every co every company that uh, we look into uh, asset turnover is generally very important for any capital intensive business for example power business for example uh, construction business anywhere there is asset intensive industry we will be looking at uh, asset turnover ratios very very closely uh, where it will not be very important uh, service based companies we might not look at asset turnover that closely uh, third third thing uh, asset turnover can also further be broken down into fixed capital turnover fixed asset turnover rather and working uh, asset turnover so we'll be covering that very shortly can you please explain the concept of EBIT and EBITDA it's EBITDA uh, I'll, I'll very quickly run you through it so revenue minus fixed expense uh, minus uh, uh, let's say direct expenses like cost of manufacturing all such things they will give us uh, gross profits minus uh, indirect expenses like marketing they will give us after deducting this we will get EBITDA EBITDA includes all the direct and indirect expenses like uh, employee expenses marketing expenses 
manufacturing ex- uh, expenses lo- logistic expenses all those activities deducted then we get ebitda then we will deduct depreciation and amortization so that gives us ebit so the difference between ebit and ebitda is depreciation and amortization then we will deduct interest then we'll get pbt then we'll deduct taxes and then we'll get pat so this is how the entire flow works and we need to understand how much is being lost at what point like are we losing a lot here or are we losing a lot here and if we are not losing a lot at all places then we'll have a healthy pat at the end so this is how a manufacturing company should have more asset turnover not necessarily again most manufacturing companies do have high a uh, low turnover ratio low manufacture uh, low asset turnovers but uh, but few companies few manufacturing companies also have very high asset turnovers where the cost of end product is much high as compared to the cost of machinery more asset turnover is good for the company or less asset turnover shrishti in general we want more asset turnover we want more uh, more margins we want everything more but it's just that so every industry have a, has a certain behavior in general uh, like it should be above industry peers that's for sure that's something that is uh, for sure and it's also a choice for example if if in logistics if someone is owning all the trucks uh, in that case their as a turnover will be low they have a asset heavy business versus someone else is not owning the trucks but they're renting it out in that case the asset turnover in the same industry will be very low uh, will will be very higher so it depends actually on the business decision uh, but it might happen that despite high asset turnover their margins are relatively low so overall the roe should be followed but in general personally a higher asset turnover means low capital required what is the difference between roce and roic we'll come to that so roic and roce uh let's quickly calculate roce roce is calculated this way pat divided by debt plus assets so debt right so we have this and debt so so we have debt plus short term debt plus equity so yes this is the roc that the company is generating basically debt plus equity that's the due denominator the numerator everywhere is the same profit after tax it's just the denominator that keeps on changing and we are getting we'll still get pretty much same numbers itself in most cases unless and un- like except for very few cases just a second yeah so coming back uh next is return on assets so again the same thing pat divide by assets so yes with this we are getting the different numbers the different return matrix and these are relatively good return matrix uh the next is return on invested capital so again pat now there is there are different items here return actually there is something also called return on invest incremental invested capital so we won't be doing all those things because it will lead to confusion but there are so many returns return on working capital is also one matrix that i've seen in the past for working capital heavy industry return on financial assets return on uh fixed assets you can create see the numerator remains same it's just the denominator that can be anything from the balance sheet that is what the idea is uh return on invested capital is uh profit and loss actually i don't really use return on invested capital uh profit and loss plus it should be something uh, around uh this where did it go uh this thing 
equity but i think incremental equity something of that kind let me actually very quickly uh look at look at it return on capital because i have never used return on capital personally i'm not return on capital return on invested capital used roc total invested capital now everyone can define uh, uh, define uh, invested capital in different ways again it's pretty much debt plus equity that they are also mentioning so that that is why roc is a pseudo for roic in many in most cases so it's here uh b12 divide by again i think the same thing debt plus equity so all the capital that has been invested into the business so this number all right this number plus uh short term borrowings plus long term borrowings so okay the company has negligible of those so we'll get i think i messed it up a bit it should be b83 not 23 all right so we'll get the same numbers and as roc the numbers logically uh, it's pretty much the same honestly i also don't know the difference between roc and roic there can be some technical difference but in general i follow these three matrix roc roe and roa and uh let me just do this and dupont analysis that's the most important thing in, in my opinion because just breaks down the entire uh, numbers for us very very clearly so these are the different return matrix that we have understood any questions would love to take it just let me go back what is the difference between roc and roe himja honestly not a clear answer as i see roic is amount of invest money mix that is above the cost above the cost uh, above the average cost it pays for its debt and equity so there is some technical difference i think manufacturing company should have more asset turnover uh, in general no uh, manufacturing companies have less turnover because they have high assets but but uh, better more it can have better it is but then it's also a business decision as uh, asset turnover cannot be looked like by itself you need to look at look at it in comparison like in uh, as a pair with the margins because let's say if you are a company who's owning all the assets and then manufacturing versus there is second company who's outsourcing all the manufacturing so asset turnover for the second company will be much higher but does not mean that the they will be more bit valuable might be their margins are very low might be the margins here are very high so those reasons need to be taken care of and uh next is liquidity that is receivable days so here we'll talk mainly about the uh, mainly about the uh, working capital turnover rather so how does it work receivable days so first things first uh how do you calculate receivable days receivable days means on an average how much time does it get for the company to get the capital back so receivable days if we scroll up uh total revenue divide by receivables so and then 36 this so the idea is total revenue by uh, total revenue by uh, total receivables this tells us that okay the company is able to rotate or turn its uh, receivables six times in a year so how do we calculate the receivable days 360 divide by so if in a year they are able 365 rather so roughly the company gets its payments in 58 days is is typically the trend that okay if i have made a sale today the company is uh, making a credit sale and they'll be getting the payment back 58 days from today and the numbers are actually increased to 73 days here 
why that why has that happened because the sales numbers have qu- gone down quite significantly so we see whenever we see something like this we look for an explanation for this number why has the receivable days jumped so significantly and this we remember that the company's assets and receivables uh, company's assets and account receivables had decreased next inventory days like how much time does it take for in, for the company to get the raw materials and uh, process it keep it as inventory and sell it out so in this business they won't have a lot of inventory again let's go up uh, here we need to take cost of goods sold so i think we can take this this should be the cost of goods sold in general there is a classification error cost of goods sold divided by inventory so inventory will be here in assets so the company has absolutely zero inventory okay so no inventory so this business is something that does not require inventory again it's a service business so there is no possibility of inventory so we'll write zero table days again how much time before the company gets the goods and has to pay the product, has to pay for it so again i uh, will use cogs divide by Pay, payments uh, accounts payable so r- the company is able to uh, like rotate the payments 10 times in the year so 365 divide by the rotation number so roughly the company has to make the payments in 36 days 31 days half and lately it went up to 49 days probably because of covid related factors so this is how we are getting the number of days the company is getting as credit and number of days the company is getting at, like as credit here and the uh, the company the number of days that the company has to make the credit so what is the total cash operating cycle this plus this minus this that i think this plus this minus this number so the company needs like today if the company is making a sale it needs like the cash operating cycle is 22 days that is uh, if you look at the cycle how many days the goods is sitting in the inventory how many days the goods is being sold on credit and then against that how many days credit is the company getting itself as well so 22 days is what it used to take the company to uh, convert the cash and again despite covid again they are able to con- maintain their cash operating cycle they are able to pass on the credit that they have to extend to their suppliers so this is a relatively good sign uh, that okay the cash conversion cycle has not been affected if these numbers go up let's say from 26 to 40 the amount of working capital that the company will require will go up significantly why because the company will require 17 more days of working capital right so that thing is taken care of because the working cash operating cycle is not affected so this is how we look at the different numbers uh, quickly we will understand these two numbers as well solvency ratio that is how good is the health of the company so debt to equity ratio so debt to equity ratio is uh debt so short long term borrowings plus short term borrowings you can even take net debt but for simplicity we'll do this divide by uh shareholder capital all right so i think we forgot to put the brackets here so yeah the the this number is really low it's negligible actually so the company has negligible debt it's all equity and that is what we have seen earlier on as well next is interest coverage ratio so interest coverage ratio is basically interest expenses uh, or rather ebit divided by interest expenses so that the company's interest expense is covered 34 times and then 310 times and 443 times so these are all very good signs that is negligible debt otherwise what would have happened if this number was less than 3 then the company's coverage ratio which will be the case in asset heavy companies 4 3 5 so in that case we really need to focus on the health of the company uh, that okay they have do they have enough in payments to pay the interest first leverage we have already seen we can actually borrow it just from here itself 
so these are all very healthy numbers that means the company is very solvent right now next thing is turnover ratio so we already understood asset turnover now what we'll do is we'll understand fixed asset turnover and uh, working capital turnover so the numbers are very the formula is very straightforward revenue upon uh so it was fixed asset turnover right so revenue upon total uh, so revenue upon this number uh property plant and equipment so five times asset turnover is relatively good asset turnover all right so asset turnover has decreased which we also know fixed asset turnover has decreased working capital turnover how does that uh, get calculated so again uh, revenue from operations divided by working capital how do we calculate working capital we can take current assets minus current liabilities the simplest way but we can be even more precise we can take uh, account receivables let me put a bracket actually account receivables plus inventory so zero inventory uh, minus account payables that is a more accurate working capital requirement so 11 times so this way we have quickly calculated all the important ratios that are required to understand the health of the company we understood the health of uh, uh, cash flow statement of growth then in the common size we understood how different line items are moving so we understood the balance sheet and income statement then uh, quickly we understood the health of like different return matrix dupont analysis then we understood how liquid uh, like what's the cash flow condition of the company what's the debt condition of the company what's the asset condition of the company so with this we have covered all the important matrix that are there all the important documents that are there by the company next what we can do is we can go through all the detailed uh, notes and items that are that we saw in the early discussion uh, in the annual report but that is, that will take a lot of time and that will be beyond today's discussion but this is generally how financial statement analysis works this is a simplistic version will spend as a professional one spends way more time in it but this is how the basics of it look and as an assignment i would request all of you to complete the same for uh, gati as well and share it in the group and i will be active in the group after like from now on so uh, any question will directly answer it there itself within the group so so uh, any question anywhere just stuck because i expect a lot of doubts here a lot of numbers not matching up you can even take help from your peers but i would suggest uh, to create annual uh, create uh, this dupont analysis for at least two more companies uh, create du uh, not dupont common size create dupont analysis for at least three to four companies you don't really need to put in all this you can simply enter the numbers here as well uh, and complete gati expresses this particular ratio analysis so that should be the assignment with this we have understood a lot about the about the numbers that are there about how numbers work now what we would have done if we were doing financial state uh, we were doing financial modeling as well is that we would have forecasted each of these numbers as well from our current understanding of numbers so we would have forecasted what we expect the growth to be so let's say we expect the growth to be 15 percent so we would have forecasted 15 percent growth in uh, in this number we would have expected then a, a matching expense increase in uh, the relevant expenses EBIT, EBITDA and then so on and so forth we would have created a forecast of that and that is what would have been used for absolute valuation which I'll come to very quickly but this so far we have covered the financial analysis briefly like right? you understand now good enough to understand if the company is doing something horribly wrong or something if a company's health is completely messed up let's quickly take up the questions Will you be providing the Excel sheet that you're currently doing? Yes, let's do that actually. What percentage ROC is good as per you? Uh, yes, anything that's more than uh, 15 basically uh, is decent. Anything that's more than 18 is very good. That's what my personal preference is. Uh, 
uh, yeah i think current one should be shared uh, if it's even if it's not uh, just put up questions in the group i'll be more than happy to answer it uh next moving on where were we so yeah so this is the, this is these are the assignment things that uh, we'll work upon next is absolute valuation we won't understand absolute valuation so much let's quickly actually take a one a one minute break a two minute break meanwhile anyone has any question would love to answer uh, uh, i'm getting a question what is comparative statement so yes. comparative statement in what regard you can compare uh, across timeline like same company but 2019 18 so in fact this was also a comparative statement 19 20 21 you can even have a comparative statement for companies like 2021 but let's say three or four competitors put together most important ratios to consider other than these ratios other than these ratios what i'll say is every industry has kpis that is again very important like for uh, we have discussed this in the previous sessions as well what are the diff like uh, in in uh, in social media there is this uh, uh, revenue per user uh, that is something that's very important to understand uh, so such industry specific ratios All right let's move on any question we'll just keep on answering we'll now touch upon the valuation are you liking this session well we have something more for you download the zebra learn app get free courses to learn from attend live events with experts work on assignments connect with experts basically everything you need to build a career in finance download the app now part which is a which is going to be a lot of fun it's going to be going to understand quite significant we'll we again we can't cover entire valuation not even in a month but uh but we'll understand the basics of it how it works what's the fundamental we'll touch upon absolute valuation as a concept we won't be able to do complete value for that uh, we need to understand one given company or industry much better uh and after that we'll use this method called exit multiple approach that's something that's super powerful that we can use for almost any company tomorrow as well and then we'll also cover our uh, relative valuation very quickly what are the negative effects if the company does not maintain debt equity lot of negative effects rahul uh, if something like covid comes up these are the companies that go bust first secondly if you have a very high debt to equity the cost of debt will go up because banks will see more risk in you they will give you uh, like higher interest rates so it's good to have some debt but a lot of debt high debt ratios can be a kill for the company as well what does solvency ratio and liquidity ratio indicate so solvency ratio indicates uh, solvency ratio indicates like how solvent is the company meaning how good is the long term financial health if the company long term does not have more assets than the liabilities then there is issue on solvency part liquidity is how are the assets and liabilities matched uh, or maintained in a short time frame that is in few days in few weeks uh or few months rather does the like other assets like let's say you have to pay liabilities but with the asset you have you own a large piece of land which will take 6 months or 1 year to sell so how will you pay a 1 month loan from that land so in that case liquidity is mismatched or not managed so a solvency ratio tells us the long term health of the company liquidity ratio tells us the short term financial management of the company which hypothesis you use for analysis i did not get the question hypothesis as in what way mm hypothesis we don't use like i have never used any of this and i like to keep things simple can you please provide recorded video for previous two sessions i would be great help it's i think already there but if it's not i think you can contact the team so all right let's start so now we'll talk about the valuation part uh, so we have gone and we have done this we have done this peer analysis is peer analysis is nothing but as we are comparing on the go uh, uh, on the go this these two companies gati and tci express so that is peer analysis 
it's nothing as such different now the last part valuation part we'll be touching upon absolute valuation from a concept point of view the uh, relative valuation will be going through it as well what it means and exit multiple approach is something that we'll practice and we'll use it's very simple it's something that we can use in our day to day work as well uh, let me just hide this comms is some this so uh all right so let's let me explain first what is uh, absolute valuation first things first what is valuation valuation means what is the company worth today now how what do you mean by company worth by company worth we mean all the cash the company is going to generate in the future let's say the company sells toothpaste let's say colgate for example colgate all the cash that it will generate in the future that is what exactly means company's worth all the cash nothing else no assets no not if the company will sell assets at the end that is also cash generated so all the cash that the company will generate any point in the future that is what we are trying to identify with absolute valuation and that is what uh, that is what the valuation is all about but again this means looking into the future how will we ever know all the cash uh, the company will ever generate so just uh, by the technique by simple uh, reason this is just not possible to exactly uh, estimate all the cash that the company will generate so uh, what what we do we take estimates so we take for la year let's say 19 okay let me so 19 20 21 22 is also over now let's say uh 23 24 25 26 27 and after this as well so what we are doing is we are taking this past data this is not this means nothing in valuation it's just an indication of the future using this we'll forecast for this the, for the next 5 years let's say we'll forecast for this period that okay the sales should be like increasing 10% a year on so let's move on actually let's let's we have quite a lot to discuss already also still uh we were at this let's actually add a slide here use this as a rough work rather than that white board so yeah um uh, so we were talking about absolute valuation we had created that 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 so on and so forth this was past this was the forecast period so financial modeling would have come in handy here uh now in this so we'll forecast for this next 5 years we'll say that okay sales will grow by 10% expense by 8% and so things so on and so forth and after this forecasting period we will the company won't stop right the company will continue to grow or continue to operate so that value all this is all that after this period this is called perpetuity value so what is the company's value or uh, valuation today the valuation is the cash flows value for all this period plus the perpetuity value so how does it work uh, and a lot of you i don't want to get into the concept of discounting and compounding right now uh but it's something that's very fundamental in valuation let's say let me just use an example so let's say you are generating 100 crores of cash as a company in fy27 versus you're generating 50 crores of cash in fy uh, today so in reality the value of these two will almost be the same because if you generated 50 crores today you would have put that let's say at 8% interest in that case also in Uh, in a, at eight percent, it won't have doubled. But let's say at ten, twelve percent, the money would have doubled in five years. 
so in that case 50 crores today is as good as 100 crores five years into the future so let's say you're generating 100 crores year 80 year uh, 60 year 50 year and 40 year so what we do is we discount like bring the value back to what is its today's worth so let's say 100 crore means 50 crores today 80 means 45 60 means uh, let's say 40 of uh, of the, the time frame is also decreasing that is why the discount is also decreasing uh 50 means let's say 30 crores and this means let's say 28 crores i'm just taking hypothetical numbers add all this up 50 45 like 90 135 165 and 30 uh 195 so 193 so the value of next five years of cash flow from the company is 193 crores so this is how absolute valuation works like first we calculate a forecast period this the next five years is the forecast period then we calculate the cash flows during this forecast period then we discount it and add all of it up and that is the value of the company for the next five years cash flow next is perpetuity value so we are saying that okay the company is generating 100 crores the company will generate 100 crores will grow by five percent every year and then there is this formula it's all mathematical in nature r minus g which is basically the interest rate let's say 0 0.1 minus 0 0.05 so don't get confused at this actually it's pure math i'll share the formula uh it's it's prop it's covered in financial modeling classes everywhere uh 0 0.005 this means 105 into 20 is equal to uh, 2000 and 2100 actually. So 2100 crores is the value of all the cash that the company will generate into the future. I'll explain this part in a very shortly. So 2100 crores five years from today means about 1100 crores today. So the companies, so this again, we have to discount for today's terms so that company's valuation is about 1300 crores this is what the current valuation should be now we have taken a lot of things for for granted in this but this is the fundamental understanding behind how valuation works all future cash flows discounted for today so again next five years we calculated the numbers we discounted it and took a sum total of it and that is the value for next five years then the perpetuity value, they, this is how it's calculated. It's the formula 100 or actually uh, like cash flow at the end. Last prediction cash flow 1 plus G R minus G. So it's very easy to get intimidated by this. It's a very straightforward thing. Actually, it said that whatever is the last cash flow, let's say 100 crores, that will grow by a given uh, growth rate which will continue forever this g is growth rate forever so we are taking a small growth rate here we are saying five ten percent but here we'll only say five or four percent so let's say five percent r is the return that you the return or risk actually so uh, the return will be basically what you expect on your portfolio or what's the risk-free rate of return there are a lot of numbers to it so for simplicity, we'll take this number as 0.1 and this again as 0.05. So 2100, the challenge here is identifying the correct RNG itself. That is the number one challenge and number one problem with this. If we take R to be 0.12, we'll see that in from 1300 crores, the valuation all of a sudden went to 1000 crores. If we take R to be 0 0.08, the valuation all of a sudden will go from 1300 to 1600. So this is the number one reason that's that why this problem, this method acts as a problem at a lot of times. So 210 divided by 0 0.05 is equal to 2100. Uh, I'm assuming it's 21. It's 105, not 202. Yeah. So this is how it works. This is how the math of it works. The, it's all now messed up and a bit intimidating. But the fundamental is very simple. All future cash flows discounted for today. That's it. Now, we won't be using this because it takes a lot of time and practice actually to learn this because we need to understand R and G. Let me actually put up some more videos or understand explanation of this 
in the group like we can discuss this in much greater detail uh, it's a straightforward concept it's important to understand how absolute valuation works because if this is the fundamental reason or logic behind valuation we have a relative valuation we have other sources of uh, valuation which are proxies meaning which can help us take a decision but it's absolutely important to understand this method uh, in fact there is this talk by mr ashwat damodaran who's considered as the uh, like the best instructor on valuation at google he gave a one hour talk at google where he speaks about valuation in such a wonderful manner so if somewhere you get a time uh, get time i would strongly suggest you to go through that it is just an amazing in fact what i'll do is i'll also share the link for that video in the group after the session it's absolutely amazing uh, that session so so what we have done is this is how absolute valuation works let me quickly do this let me go to excel we have built a framework for absolute valuation just to explain the same thing uh it's pretty much the same thing uh so again we have to take the cost of capital so this r here has to, has to be the weighted average cost of capital so don't get actually intimidated by this term it's basically uh it's basically let's say how to explain if you get debt at 8% interest plus equity at 12% is what you are expected like cost of equity is then if you have 30% debt and 70% equity then your vac is 30% into this 70% into this so will come out to be let's say roughly 0 uh, 0. Uh, roughly it will come out to 0.105% uh, somewhere around this not taking exact numbers but somewhere around this so this is the vac that comes out and the number one problem here is identifying this vac itself and vac keeps on changing then uh, number of shares and all this is fine so this is actually how relative absolute valuation works we take i'll take, i'll go to the comment section after this uh, immediately after this so we get all the past numbers then we get all the estimated numbers for future we discount that and then for uh, for terminal value or a perpetuity value we calculate this mal this valuation and then discount that as well and then add everything up that's how absolute valuation works and i'm sure a lot of you have lot of doubts on this i'll actually try and take up an event during the week or take up something that explain that just focuses on uh, absolute valuation let me quickly go back on please stream on 720 or 10 it's all right any questions i would actually love to take questions here because i expect a lot of questions a lot of confusion in this uh, category after this it's simple uh, relative valuation and uh, exit multiple approach it's very simple explain vac point again all right it's uh, it's weighted average cost of capital uh, wacc so vac basically formula is let me write it down here where did we lose it yeah so just a second let me insert one more page here it's just easier to explain here so vac is weighted average cost of capital and the formula for vac is cost of equity multiplied by weight of equity plus cost of debt multiplied by weight of debt 1 minus t so this is the exact formula if you if we say cost of equity is basically what is the cost that your investors expect out of you that there is a method to calculate that as well but again these are mathematical methods and few of them might not make a lot of economic uh, like base to it at times not every time but at times so let's say investors expect 12% from uh, from you from your invest equity investment plus uh, your debt to equity ratio so let's count this as debt to equity so not uh, so your equity is uh, 60% of the total assets 
plus cost of debt is let's say eight percent multiplied by forty. The cost if equity is sixty, then debt is forty uh, uh, multiplied by one minus tax rate. So zero point six five. Let's say thirty five percent tax rate. Why zero one minus tax rate? Because you would have had tax savings on the interest expense that you would have incurred as well. So now your that tax you that you'll have to pay that is the extra loss that you will have if you don't have interest expense. So uh, this is the cost of this is how you calculate VAC. Now we have all the numbers. If we do the math, it turns out to be seven point two percent plus eight percent. So this is three point two percent. 0.65 so is equal to 7.2% plus 3.2% divided by uh, multiplied by 0.65 so let's say 2.2% roughly not saying exact uh, is equal to 8.4% so this is how we calculate vac our vac here is 8.4% so all the cost of capital where will vac be used this discounting this rate that we took 10 12% this has to be taken now converted By a VAC, like hundred crores divided by eight point four percent every year, uh, and here also the R that we'll take that is also eight point four percent. So the numbers will change if we take eight point four percent, right? The valuation will increase. So this is how VAC and this is how uh, we use things here in absolute valuation. We share the Excel sheet in which you have explained. Uh, I think you have the Excel sheet, right? This Excel sheet. So we have just taken the uh, bare bones of it. We have not taken the numbers on purpose because it will get just too over complicated. Too. Uh, we'll take actually. We'll, uh, we might take a four week uh, session on financial modeling. Not very uh, sure of that. Uh, team will keep you informed. But if that happens, so financial, all this will be covered in great detail in that. But for now, uh, for now, uh, this is what absolute valuation means. The next thing is relative valuation. So let me. Uh, so relative valuation, what it means? Uh, you don't know if the share should be or if the valuation should be hundred crores or two hundred crores. Here, what happened? Here we took a definite number. The second. So here we achieved at a, arrived at a definite number that okay, this company worth must be worth thirteen hundred crores. So that exact number is absolute valuation where we are saying that okay, this should be the exact worth. In cases where we do not find, do not find valuation, exact valuation. That is a relative valuation. So we are not saying that this company should be worth ah fifteen hundred crores or one thousand crores or two hundred crore, whatever that number is. We are saying that okay, this company X has two more competitors Y and Z. Company X has uh, sales of hundred crores, Y has sales of one twenty, Z has sales of let's say three hundred crores. If this company is uh, selling at five hundred crore and this is selling at uh, all right, this is selling at let's say twelve hundred crores. Uh, this company is trading at six hundred crores. Then what should this company be trading for? So let's say this company is trading for four hundred crores. So now you compare these, uh, you compare these with the uh, with company Y and Z, and see that okay, this company is expensive or cheap. So let's say this is sales. So we and this is price. So we calculate price by sales. So what is price by sales here? Twelve hundred by three hundred. That is four. Here we have six hundred by one twenty. It is five. Ah, uh, here we have four hundred by hundred, so four. So this company is now trading within the range itself. It's not too expensive. It's not too cheap. Relatively, it's trade. It's decently valued. Let's say if this company was trading at eight hundred crores rather than four hundred crores, what have would have happened? Price to sales is equal to eight. Then we can say, okay, this company is expensive for whatever reason, but this is expensive. Why? Because For other similar companies, they are trading at a multiple of five or four, but they are trading at a multiple of eight. Maybe the quality of this company is good. Whatever we might, in fact, after eight also go ahead and buy this company. That's a different story. But 
in itself it's expensive that is what we are saying so coming back this is what relative valuation is it compares different companies and this is always what the format will be price upon some variable so price upon it can be price upon earnings as we did price upon sales so that is what we call pe ratios uh, it can be price upon sales it can be price upon book value it can be price upon any kpi it can be price upon user whatever this number is but price upon something we can even have price replaced by something called ev ev is enterprise value actually let's not get there it will lead to confusion right now let's keep it very simple price upon and it's important to understand this part because this is what we'll be using now to understand if a company is expensive or uh, cheap right now so price upon any variable and if we do it price upon the company's pat or earnings it's called pe ratios one of the most common ratio that you would have seen today or you would have seen a uh, price will always mean market cap we won't use price per share reliance is trading let's say at 2500 for example so we won't use 2500 we'll say reliance has a profit of uh, market cap of 15 lakh crores so 15 lakh crores upon let's say it has profit of 70000 crores so whatever this comes out to be let's say this comes out to be roughly 20.5 so this is the pe of the company so market cap upon total pat market cap upon total sales market cap upon total book value market cap upon kpi whatever the number is but this is how relative valuation works and we will not identify a number that okay this company should be worth 500 crores or 2000 crores we'll say this company is expensive or cheap just looking at the competitors that are there so just a second guys yeah so so this is what we have done we have actually calculated uh, we have actually calculated these three companies that are pretty similar so we have the market cap we have debt that's there interest that's there at ebitda everything from 2022 actually because the latest numbers were out so what is the price to sales we see that for this company tci express the price to sales is outrageously higher than the other two companies the price to earnings is again higher than the other two companies but gati is operating in losses so what we can say that okay the ps here is extremely high ev by sales ev by ebitda uh let's this is also something that can be used so ev is actually a uh, market cap plus debt so whatever the total market cap is of the company plus debt i hope you write this down because ev is very often used instead of uh, instead of uh, ev is very often used instead of uh, market cap so ev by ebitda ev is this number uh, market cap plus debt and ebitda we all have seen early on what it means so these are the four valuation relative valuation parameters that we have calculated it's very basic math so from all matrix we can say that tci express is relatively most expensive out of this here as well here as well ev by ebitda is one of the most powerful matrix because it takes away all the losses that have happened because of depreciation or capitalization uh, decisions so here we can say that okay it's not that expensive from what we see So, if we have a list of ten or twelve companies here, or even four or five companies, that tells us a lot about the company. Second, what we can also do is instead of calculating this, we can even calculate uh, yearly, like so for TCA Express. Let's say I'm just using uh, twenty, let's say twenty eighteen. uh we can say p so we can calculate these three for the same company but for different points in time so uh, we can go to bse india and see the past prices of the company but we can calculate the price to earnings of the company uh for the for all these five for all these five like years and these different matrix and we'll see that let's say if it looks i'm just putting in hypothetical numbers let's say it was 32 then it was 28 then it was 
22, then it again went to 32, and now it's at 40. So we can clearly see that the company currently is trading at higher end of the valuations than what it has had in the past. So this is also relative valuation where the company's past is being compared to the company's present. So this is again something which will tell us if you have extremely out of out of line, if you have extremely out of line uh, numbers, like if the numbers here are let's say 20, 35 and next year the company's valuation is 80, like P is 80. So you know that the company right now is extremely overpriced and you might want to take some time before the valuation normalizes because what will happen even if you are correct there is very little room for the uh, for the company's earnings to grow or rather not the earnings but company's valuation to grow because already it's exp uh, already it's at high levels so this is how relative valuations are used what i'll say is at the uh, at the end of this do this for cement sector like uh, all this data points you'll get from Sina, calculate these manually. And uh, we have eight listed companies in cement. We have in fact more, but you can use eight. Uh, in fact, five or six should also be good. Uh, and create this should not take more than uh, two hours, but will give a very good understanding which companies are trading expensive, which companies are trading cheap. And also for ultra tech cement, do this uh, for last five years. That should tell you a lot about when to buy and when to sell a company. Lastly, we'll use something called exit multiple approach. Very, very powerful. And the last topic for today, super powerful and super easy. So what here we have two, three assumptions. Wait, wait, I just saw that you purchased a product from Zebra Loan store and thank you so much. We have something super, super awesome for you. Introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses, be it personal finance, stock trading, derivative, financial analysis, financial modeling, uh, stock markets, everything and anything that you want to learn in finance. You have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period, you'll have access to them as well. This is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance, if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to enter this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no-brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suit of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle current, P, current eps and investment time frame Let's say the company EP, company is currently trading at 50. Uh, let's get the actual data actually for TCI Express. Uh, company's current uh, PE is 50, correct? 50.3. Uh, EPS is, let's just go here. Year on year EPS is 33.4. And investment time frame is 3 years. Right. And today's price, let's call it CMP. This is super powerful method that can be used and it's very, it's, uh, this is one of my favorite methods to use. 1670 is the current market price. Yeah, roughly 1670. So we are right, all right there. So now what we'll do, we'll create a table. First table is for possible PE. And second, uh, like rows will be for possible growth. Why is this not selecting? All right. Possible growth. I think I have, I don't know why it went there. So if the current PE is 50, what can be the PE of company after three years? The investment time frame is very important here. After three years, the company's PE can will be. Uh, it can be either. Let's say we expect that it will be in that range of thirty to sixty. Let's just say we have that expectation. We we can be that broad. So what will take possible PEs are thirty, thirty-five, forty, forty-five, fifty. 55, 60. 
so these are the possible fees the company can have if the market is not that good it will have a lower end of fee if the market is good it will have a higher end of fee and possible growth rate of eps so eps we think will grow anywhere between uh, 6 to 15% so we can say 6 uh, 9 Let me just put percentage as well. Six percent, nine percent, twelve percent, and fifteen percent. All right. So these are the different now. These what we have done is we have created different cases that the company can grow at nine percent, the earnings can grow at nine percent, and the PE exit PE uh, can be forty-five. So that will give us what will be the price at the end of three years. So let's actually calculate now. What will be the company share price after three years? Today it's sixteen seventy. After three years it will be so EPS multiplied by ah uh, one plus the growth rate base two three. What we have done is the current EPS ah uh, current EPS. Uh, multiplied by 1.06 uh, multiplied by uh, sorry raised to three. We can even write three years simply. Uh, and let me put this. So B has to change. 21 does not have to change. So dollar. So this is what the PE will. This is what the EPS will be. Uh, three years into the future, in case the company's EPS grows at six percent, which is very correct, right? And if it grows at, all right, I messed it up here. I think I should put dollars here as well. All right, I think something is not right. Twenty one. So uh, B seventeen is correct. Uh, twenty one. So C twenty one is correct. Okay, this should also be dollar. Yeah, it's important to use these dollars very well. So, if the company's earnings grow at six percent, this will be the EPS. If the company's earnings grow at nine uh, percent, this will be the EPS. Fifteen percent, this will be the EPS for three years, right? Now, what will be the price after three years? So, the same number, this number we have calculated the EPS, right? So, the EPS is calculated. Put it in the bracket. Multiplied by the exit up multiple. That is, after three years, in case the PE is thirty, then what will be the uh, what will be the exit multiple? So let's say dollars. Uh, no, I think uh, we need to have a constant. Yeah. So after three years, if this scenario happens, that is, PE goes from fifty to thirty and earnings only grows at six percent, the company's price will be hundred and twelve rupees, roughly around that. We might be wrong here and there, but we get the direction in general. So, with this, we have calculated uh, what will be the exit price of the company after uh, under different scenarios. So, if we are at sixteen seventy today, we want at least let's say our earnings to grow at fifteen percent, our stock price to grow at fifteen percent. So, sixteen seventy. Multiplied by one point one five. Let's say twelve percent, not not fifteen percent. Base two three. So we want the price to be at least twenty three hundred, twenty four hundred. Uh, at least twenty four hundred. Let's say. So when do we get prices to be twenty four hundred? It's under such limited. Like this is the green zone of ours. Anything beyond this? So our green zone is starting actually very late. Ah, uh, for that to happen, the PE has to sustain, and the earnings growth has all has to also be like upwards of twelve fifteen percent. And because this because our ah uh, range is so low, what what is happening? Ah, uh, what is happening? Our like we are so this is not a correct price for us to buy this company, no matter how much we like it. Let's say, uh, or let me actually convert this into a number as well. So, 
so uh, we can actually calculate the returns here that's what i was trying to do but uh, let's first uh, clear this discussion let's say if this price goes down from 1670 to let's say today's price goes down to 1000 rupees all of a sudden what is it uh, the, if we if our buying price is 1000 rupees what is happening these numbers won't change right these numbers are as it is the P, current pe will change the current pe has come down to roughly 33 then but what is happening because if the current market price is 1000 now we only need let's say 12% so 1000 multiplied by 1.12 raised to t so we only need the stock price to be 1400 so when is that happening all this is our green zone then so this, these are scenarios where as an analyst you want to buy stock in most cases there is like very little chance that you lose money on this and in fact you not even lose money you'll just gain less it's in most cases you are getting a good profit a more than good profit this is this is the scenario these are the scenarios uh, uh, where you want to invest this is where you will want to buy that stock uh where can we go wrong the pe does not grow in that in this range the pe grows by let's say 0% uh, not the pe the eps this is one pl- place where we can go wrong the pe that we thought would be between 30 and 60 turns out to be 20 that is one more place where we can go wrong otherwise if the number if the math holds up it's likely that in this case we'll earn a good return so only thing that we that will affect our buying that will affect the result is this number over here 1200 uh this number whatever the buying price is if we decide to buy at 1000 if we decide to buy it at 2000 what will happen we'll have only these two three instances where we'll make money other than that we'll most probably lose money or make subpar returns so the only thing that as an analyst we have within our control is the current market price so it's very very important to buy correct stocks but even more important to buy at correct valuations at any random valuation it does not make sense so we'll use these two methods to uh, to understand uh, to understand uh, to conduct our analysis uh, let me very quickly revise the revise what we did we understood absolute valuation as a concept we understood relative valuation first with competitors and then with itself then we use something called exit multiple approach with exit multiple approach what we did we took assumptions it estimated current pe current eps investment time frame and cmp that's current market price uh we calculated the range for possible p exit pe that is pe after 3 years and possible growth during 3 years we calculated the possible eps after 3 years at different eps growth rates and then we calculated the exit price uh at different exit multiples exit pe's for uh, at 30 pe what will be the value and so on and so forth so this is exactly what we did to uh, i'll quickly take up questions after this but assignments that we'll do uh, after this is one uh, gati express uh, ratio analysis so this time around we're going to have quite a lot of assignments because it's learn we have to absolutely do it if we don't do it by ourselves we won't learn uh, we need to make common size where did we go common size analysis for two companies of our choice then uh, we need to uh, then the next one was around uh, absolute valuation we did not have to do anything then we need to uh, make for cement cement relative valuation uh this should take uh this will do for five companies any five companies in cement then we'll do a uh, time series relative valuation for ultra tech cement and then i'll suggest uh you to make uh exit multiple approach for ultra tech cements again uh we don't want to take an estimation out of it where is it where, how is it loaded how is it like adding up we don't want to take buy sell distance right away 
but we want to make sure that we use this these this is what we need to do as assignments this time around uh each of them will take these two will take less time uh these three actually these two might take a relatively longer gati express you can use this sheet itself uh but if we do this we'll have a decent grip a good grip and good understanding of exit multiple of time series of ratio analysis uh it's important to understand exit multiple because it's very simple it's very easy to start with again at the end of it we'll somehow reach uh, absolute valuations which we'll cover in some other course uh so yeah with that i'm done with the topics for today actually let me actually go back and look at the questions very insightful okay rahul that's kind of you how you take 3 hour session so smoothly it's something i enjoy personally a lot and it's fun kpi basically means shrishti uh, key performing indicators key performing indicators means let's say for social media company you can say price per user uh, so number of users is a not an accounting term but a kpi that is num uh, an indicator but if market cap is more than more that also means that the company is expensive yeah that means the company is expensive but it can also be expensive for a reason but like it can be better quality company than its competitors and that can also be the reason that the company is expensive but this if loss isn't calculated right i didn't get the question in case of loss p does not work that is also a problem yeah so in that case use ebitda or use some other valuation metric uh, but p does not uh, it does not work but is this is loss isn't calculated right i didn't get the exact question but i'm assuming in terms of loss the last date of submission let's try to do it before saturday but again that i think team will coordinate i think before saturday should be good and uh, last time around also i have seen a lot of discussions uh, i have seen a lot of discussions uh, uh i have seen a lot of uh, assignments actually they are uh, i have been informed that in your profile page like uh, they are working on it i have been informed i am not fully aware right now but in the profile page of your uh, of the website like on your profile page there is this uh, tab that they are adding called projects a uh, portfolio or projects i'm not fully aware so you can submit it there itself and what with time what will happen all your assignments will be submitted at one place itself and you can share the link of that project in the group and also guys one suggestion don't share google links please that i sh- i did go through a lot of google links please share uh, try and share the original file so that others can also look at it read it uh, i would love to take any questions meanwhile next and the last session will be around management analysis ideas and the road ahead uh, so that's very important uh so yeah that is what the next session will be around which will be the last one i've talked about the assignments and guys please uh, download the app invite your friends uh, i think we can reach out to a lot of uh, like we can reach, it's easier to communicate on an app that for told and uh, so yeah uh any questions would love to take i am assuming there should be a lot of questions is what i'm hoping i have mailed the assignments to the given thing yeah uh, mail uh put it on the assignment tab that you'll see very soon that uh, that's what i've been informed otherwise put it in the group itself that's where more people can review it and discuss it as well and i might take a, a session on absolute valuation somewhere in this week so um, even that details will be posted uh so yeah any questions would love to take i think i have shared the link i see the link here so yeah great the link to the group is shared in the chat you can access the chat like access the group and submit your assignments over there so on like this was i guess a very good session like i have i have been seeing students uh commenting on it it's like people are very a lot of you have stuck till the end actually thanks so much what is the deadline for assignments let's let's aim for saturday now saturday try doing it before saturday but let's definitely aim for saturday 
Okay, so Anura, someone in the comments was asking, how do you take a three hours long session so smoothly? So I can go on for another three hours right now, but it's just that the audience fatigue will come in because just digesting all this is quite heavy. And particularly the format that we like the format that uh, the course is presented right now, because uh, if we spread this out in a one hour session, one and a half hour session, we can discuss a lot of it. But Sunday session, three hours, we pack a lot of content in it. So anything longer than this, it becomes difficult to process too much in one session, actually, from a learning point of view. How do we estimate EPS growth and PE in exit multiple approach? Is there some particular calculation for that? That's a great question, Himja. What I'll suggest is take five years, last five years range. Uh, growth is something that you, it's yours. Uh, basically, you will have to kind of read the company a little better. But for exit multiple, you can, unless something has changed with the company, some new factor has come up, uh, take the last five years as an indicative. Let's say last five years, the PE has been between 20 and 40, so use that. Well, thanks, uh, Sneha. Thank you. So I think I'll wrap this session. We can wrap this session up. Yes, I let's. Think, uh, uh, guys, we'll meet again next Sunday. I'm super excited for it, and I'm looking forward to actually seeing the presentation, seeing the uh, assignments, and also I think whatever files are required to be shared, you can get in touch with the team and uh, they'll just share it there. And also you can find me in the group uh, very soon. Uh, so we can discuss there anything that's there, any questions, any good resources for equity research reports, a lot of them, Yashoda, uh, Yashoda uh, what, what kind of resources do you want? That's the main question, like uh, industry research, you have uh, like, what, what, what's, like, what kind of research reports? I think uh, we're waiting for uh, your back. All right. So yeah, we're waiting for Yashoda to uh, all right. reply. Uh, Yashoda, you can reach to me personally as well. You can check a lot of things, a lot of places. Uh, depends on what kind of reports you want. So okay. industry as well as full report for better. I did, still did not get it. Yashoda, I still did not get it. Just do this. Reach out to me personally, I think, or on the email. Uh, I think that's the best uh, place because industry, what kind of industry reports? For industry reports, simple Google search also works great. Uh, full report, uh, sorry, as the full report for better understanding. Uh, you're learning, you're talking from an industry research point of view or a learning point of view. I'm not uh, fully aware, but Google search works great for almost everything. Bank industry research, all right. So look for, look it up at Google. At least uh, that's where it's going to be very valuable. The last sessions, what you have done, you have spoken about industry, business. Then last one, we spoke about financial statement and valuations. So you have done a lot of heavy lifting. We'll have to practice it a lot. Without practice, obviously, nothing will add up. It won't make a lot of sense. In this session, we're going to touch upon this concept of management, how to analyze management. Uh, we'll take roughly one hour. Next, we'll talk about how to generate investment ideas. Like what are the tested methods that people use? to kind of understand or evaluate different places where they can conduct their research and look for good investment opportunities. And lastly and quickly, we'll talk about the road ahead. So this is the this is the overall flow today. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun rather than the heavy lifting that we have done early on. Management is going to be pretty intense. But after that, it's going to be a lot of to and fro, a lot of uh, sharing. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me just see if everything's fine. My username, it's by Anurag Sundarka uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, so let's start. So, uh, so far, what we have done is industry. So what place do you start? Uh, what place do you invest in like cement, be it mobile phones, whatever space. Then we had business. That is what company in that space. And then lastly, we saw the numbers of those different companies. We took out different ratios and then we saw a price that is good to buy that company. 
a good business with good numbers is not a good stock if it uh, if it does not have a good valuation uh, or like a attractive valuation from an investment point of view so this is what we have seen so far now we'll see uh, the people we are investing in are they good people like are they people who will who we can trust with money they have not done anything anti shareholder in the past they have not done anything that's against majority shareholders interests in the past basically they have not cheated on people that they have taken money in the past so that is what we'll see with management uh, so why management analysis so whenever we invest in companies companies change like they they enter new industries they start new products uh, they change businesses but the only thing that remains constant is the management the senior management or uh, so having said that someone can say that okay even they can change but ultimately it's their skill that will determine the outcome of the company in whatever they are doing so their skill they should not have done anything that's anti shareholders all these things so people remain constant the industries and companies and businesses can change so that is why it's very very important to be like you should be in a position where you can trust the management that okay this is a management that won't do wrong with my money because because you know why like we have seen lot of examples in in the past where uh, wrong doings have happened with the shareholders and has resulted in business doing well but the stock doing terribly uh, like terrible so we invest in people and like if we invest and we get it wrong in terms of people it can be very very expensive see if we get the business wrong if we get the let me just use this so if we get the people uh, business wrong we did we had a uh, we had an analytical error if we get the industry wrong that too is an error that was that uh, that we got it wrong logically but if we get these right and then the people behind it are wrong then this can be something that's very expensive why because it's difficult anyways to get the business and industry right and despite that uh the people there they they like after getting this right which will be happen like uh once in three times or two times uh the people there went wrong so that is something that we don't really want many companies have fabulous businesses but the management is a problem and that as a result the result is subpar that's very well understood so as a result because the people are constant because we're investing in people uh management analysis happens to be one of the most critical aspects of uh financial analysis that you are comfortable with the management now with management analysis what will happen this and this will not help you make a lot of money particularly on listed side but will prevent you from losing money so if we get the industry right or the business right we make money out of it but if we get the management right we don't make money out of it uh, right away what happens is if we get the management wrong then we end up losing a lot of money so this is something i cannot emphasize more how important is management analysis we have seen the reasons quite theoretical in nature here but if we go out and if we start looking at stuff we'll understand much bigger picture like the how are the incentives aligned how how is the entire picture looking like so 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 we yeah, have we'll cover all that very soon actually so without any further delay let's actually move on to management analysis how to proceed so we have actually created this framework and it's inspired by this book security analysis i'm sure a lot of you would have heard it's called the bible of investing so so uh the model is vmia that's vision motivation integrity and ability will judge any given management be it of the smallest of small companies or the largest of large companies uh will judge them on these four parameters we even have something called management sheet on similar lines as business sheet and industry sheet but we'll stick to the simplistic rule because that will get too complex uh and beyond the scope of what we are discussing uh so so yeah coming back meanwhile let me just have a look at if we have a question okay uh okay how can exit multiple 
Uh, we'll cover all these questions, Viraj, in the at the later end of this. Let's focus on today's session, and then we can focus on uh, the questions that you have from previous sessions. So, how to proceed? Uh, proceed. So, VMI framework. So, vision basically says we'll. Uh, so, vision basically says, what is the management trying to do? So, what is the management trying to do? In short term, maybe less than one year, or maybe at max two years. And alternatively, what is the management trying to do in long term? That is upwards of upwards of five years or maybe four years. So the and it's very uh, it's difficult to find such data. Uh, the management generally communicates this in the chairman's speech or the CEO's letter or somewhere in the in the communication which is not compl like compliance related. So vision is something that's very important to understand that uh, what is the management doing short term and what is the management trying to do long term. And then the second factor to vision is consistency. If you if you are looking at a management or a company, are they saying the same thing? See, if you're doing it for if they're trying to achieve a goal in next five years, they will take a lot of time. They'll keep on saying the if, like everything, like same things year after year, year after year. So are they consistent in what they are trying to say? If the management is not consistent, like every year they end up changing the goalpost. This year they want to become something else. Next year they want to achieve something else. In that every year they are uh, pivoting or changing directions of the company. In that case, the vision, no matter how big it is, no matter what they want to become, the challenge that happens with uh, here, this is that it's very uh, expensive to navigate. Are you still using Google search, blogs, YouTube to learn finance? It's time to switch to something more efficient. Introducing the all-in-one finance bundle especially curated for beginners so that you don't get lost in the ocean of information next time. Learn about personal finance, stock investing, stock trading, financial analysis, financial modeling, futures and option, MS Excel and so much more. Everything so structured that you can easily connect the dots. With 150 examples, 30 plus tools, 6 certified courses and 2 visual books for the next one year. Take the most definite step towards your finance career now. navigate it's very expensive to navigate this and as a result due to lack of consistency the management generally ends up being a problem in the sense uh, that because you're changing your endpoint every year uh, your your resources will be used in different ways and you just won't get anywhere so this these are two things that we need to understand very very explicitly what is the management trying to do in short term what is the management trying to do long term and how consistent are they? We'll cover this in greater detail when we come to this. But yeah, uh, next is motivation. So motivation is nothing but is very straightforward. Uh, how is the management incentivized? So we see a lot of news where uh, where people say this person takes zero salary or this uh, this CEO takes zero salary or this CEO takes so much salary in fact both the, both the ways so what is happening actually so there are different ways how a company can be incentivized or how a management can be incentivized salary commission then something called ESOPs so ESOPs we touched upon earlier uh, we'll, co we'll cover this great in greater detail going ahead and then uh, lastly, we had shares, like the management owns a large proportion of shares. So these are different reasons and what proportion of it. If some company is getting, if some management has major interest in shares, then our interests are aligned, like the investor interests and the uh, and the company's interests. They are in sync. But let's say if the management is more interested in salary and uh, the shareholders are more interested in the share escalating price, uh, in that case, the, uh, the incentives might not be aligned, not saying definitely not aligned, but might not be aligned. So those are things that we will look into and we'll also look into how to find data about it. And then lastly, 
we have a uh, non financial motivation so this we won't be able to find everywhere uh, communicated uh, because it's something that is a bit personal as well uh, so so uh, the company is trying to do something to make uh, or the management rather the ceo or whatever the whoever the top management is they are trying to do something to make an impact or they get a, a, a satisfaction out of it whatever that reason may be that non financial motiv- motivation can be a very very strong power very very strong force uh for a, for any given management so so what is the non financial financial motivation and this we'll find in some of the interviews that they would have given to media outlets or maybe uh maybe let's say uh in their communication like chairman speech ceo speech or uh they might have discussed it somewhere publicly or if you go and look their look into their past history that there also you can find some hints about it uh so the, the here we understand what is the management trying to do are they incentivized enough to perform well then lastly we'll come to integrity after this we touch upon this topic ability ability basically means are they in a position to deliver on what they are saying the vision like they want to become xyz in 5 years are they able like are they do they have the ability to do that so how do we judge ability of a person it's actually almost next to impossible particularly the framework uh, particularly the, uh, from an equity research investors point of view so what we'll do is we'll look into history what they said 5 years back did they do it so whatever they said 5 years back did they do it uh let's say they said uh we want to become like whatever whatever the case may be uh so did they do it what were the results what were the business results what was the uh, like how did it all add up and if it did, if they did not deliver on it what were the excuses or reasons for not delivering on it was it something that let's say something like covid happened which was far beyond their control so in that case most of the plans will go here by but let's say due to some small factors they say we were not able to achieve it in that case ability might become a question so we want to look for companies that are talking big like we want to do this 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 in next f- a few years and they have done that in the past like whatever they said they have done that in the past and they have enough motivation to do that uh, if these three things add up you have a great management in hand uh have uh, saying it's difficult to find this combination all together and then in a good industry and then in a good business and then at a good valuation these things will always this will never happen that everything adds up but from a management point of view large vision plus historical ability to execute things and a good motivation uh, or well compensated motivation this will generally lead to good results next we have something called integrity very very important and very difficult to understand integrity basically means will they not lie will they keep to their words will they do anything wrong with their shareholders uh, so basically will they not do or will they not like will they do anything that's against the commonly accepted uh, or like the good practices will they do anything that will harm the shareholders or not just the shareholders but in general like other people as well so in that case integrity becomes a question so there is absolutely no way to find out if a person has integrity or not there is only one way have they done like in the past have they done something wrong if they have not done something wrong then we give we might give them a benefit of doubt and go ahead otherwise if they have done something wrong in the past then it becomes a big problem or are they like secondly is their reputation not that up to the mark which is again very difficult to uh, identify so this is the vmia framework extremely extremely important cuz uh, understanding how to analyze management takes time you don't get uh, you don't get to understand management like tomorrow morning it takes a lot of time data is almost uh, not available uh, you have to read between the lines and it is not easy but if you do it again and again multiple times it starts you start getting more comfort with certain management see at the end it all boils down to this comfort are you comfortable by investing in a person let's say mr 
Mr. ABC, whatever the name is. So are you comfortable investing in him? Whatever he's saying, whatever he has done in the past, whatever he has uh, integrity or uh, moments of this, uh, un disintegrity or motivation, all these things. But are you comfortable? So it takes time to uh, kind of get uh, start getting comfortable with things. But uh, but this is how it uh, like this is how we'll uh, this is how we'll approach uh, vision, motivation, integrity, and ability. So any question? Let me actually have a look at the questions. I don't see a lot of questions right now. So yeah, we can come to questions very soon, like after this. Uh, and whenever you have questions, just feel free to hit me up uh, like uh, in the comment section. And also in the coming sections, we'll go through a few annual reports and have a look at how to uh, kind of find these. So before we identify VMIA, that's vision motivation, one very important factor to understand is the background of the management. So what exactly the management type is? So background determines all these factors, it influences actually. So what is the type of management? So is it a owner operated uh, business or a professional run business or a family run business? So names are pretty self evident. So owner operated means the person who started and owns the business, he still runs it. He's still the top management. In that case, what will happen? Uh, the This person owns many like large shareholding uh, and we as minority shareholders also have share interest in shares. So as a result, the interests are aligned. So many investors purely invest in owner operated businesses and that is also fair. Secondly, we have professional management where they find a professional or an experienced professional to run the business. And in this case, what will happen? This person won't have as much shareholding, but he'll have a lot of uh, cash uh, or salary. Basically, he'll have maybe commissions like 5% of profits or 2% of profits other than salary. And lastly, he will have something called ESOPs. So ESOPs are basically, let me just quickly explain that ESOPs is uh, employee stock option programs. So uh, basically what happens is uh, like thousand rupee, let's say today's shares are quoting at hundred rupees. Uh, person X comes in, he's given thousand shares. He's given the right to buy thousand shares in three years at rupees 20, let's say. So today the shares are quoting at 100. This person feels that, okay, in three years, this 100 can become 300. So what will happen? He gets 1000 shares at 20 rupees. So basically paying 20,000 rupees and he will get three, uh, 3 lakh rupees worth of shares and shares within the company. So this person is incentivized to perform well because the better he performs, the greater will be the value of the shares he gets at the end. Uh, if he performs better, this four, 300 will become 400. We've actually touched upon ESOPs early in the earlier sessions as well. So this is actually how it works in a nutshell. Uh, you're given options uh, to buy at, 20, at a cheaper rate, rate in the future. And once the time is completed, you get, let's say, at a discount, uh, which you can sell in the market at a larger value. So this is used to attract talent in the business. So this is the, uh, this is how it works. Background of management. Uh, and lastly, we have family run businesses. Family run businesses are again, very simple, straightforward. So if you could give me a few examples in the comment section of owner operated businesses, professional run businesses and family run businesses. So let's, let's actually have a look. So if you could help, uh, okay, uh, guys, great. I uh, see about the assignment. Uh, guys, uh, if you could give examples of owner operated businesses, professional run businesses and family run businesses. So Haldiram, yes, family run business. So now I think of late, a few uh, professionals are also getting into uh, uh, business. Family run reliance, you can say family run at the top level, but at the business unit level, uh, it's again, uh, something much more professional run. So, uh, for example, geo has a professional management in place. Amul, I'm not sure how the management there looks like. So one example I'll take is 
Kotak Bank for a very large period of time has been owner operated, right? So Mr. Uday Kotak has been at the uh, at the top. So Kotak Bank versus HDFC Bank has been professional run since its start. So we see how similar businesses in similar spaces can have a different type of management. And here, uh, we have, uh, the interests are very well aligned. Here as well, the interests are aligned because the pro the professional has a great uh, like has a lot of skin in the game in this particular business. But the idea here is that this person owns much more versus the professional here, and the salaries like is also like uh, professional run management have higher salaries generally. Tata, um, uh, Adani, Bajaj family run, yes. Uh, Tata is professional run, correct. Tata is professional run because, uh, like, yeah, obviously, because all the all the places, they are not owners, they are not uh, family run. So you can say uh, Flipkart, what would you say? Flipkart early on, was it, uh, like, what was it? Which category? Owner operated or family run or professional? So it takes us a, a couple of seconds uh, lag actually, uh, but yeah. So if you could help Flipkart, what was what was it early on and what is it now? So this is how you see that the the type of management. Let's just see professional. Correct. It's professional run. It's owned by Walmart. Early on, it was uh, owner operated. Uh, till uh, obviously they raised a lot of external fundraise, but but uh, it was owner operated for a very large period of time. So uh, the type of management is very important. Next, industries served in the past. So whatever, what's their core skill? What have they done in the past? Uh, what are the core functions that they're aware of? Uh, and lastly, the board composition. So let me just touch upon these. The past history of the company. So for example, Flipkart, when they started out, they had before that they had worked in Amazon for maybe a couple of years. So what happened there? They had past experience in the e-commerce space and they had seen how things work and they had direct expertise versus let's say someone else started this who's coming from food and beverages industry. So for them starting a company similar to let's say Flipkart or e-commerce that wouldn't have been possible. The reason for that, the reason for that is uh, they don't have the relevant experience. They have experience. But they'll take time to figure things out, to learn things, to how does how does it work? Uh, Infosys is professional, Reliance is family again. Uh, yes, Rahul, uh, it is family now. For what are you saying? Uh, Flipkart, Flipkart is not family. Uh, so how do you find this data? Uh, so we'll go again. We'll open up any company. We'll use Rina.in. We'll open any company. Let's say we'll open, let's just pick one of these. I'm just taking a random company. Let's say, let's take this. Now I have no clue what this company does. It seems to power. So we have to scroll down and we open any annual report. So uh, first things, uh, industry served in the past. So their core skills, industry served exactly we don't get, but uh, let's just look for core skills. Yeah. So now it's compulsory for the companies to disclose this. Uh, so we just looked for core skills. So every person on the board of director, what's their educational qualification and what is their core skill? Like this person comes from uh, engineering, banking and finance. Now you'll have to see who's the top management as well. Like if, if the CEO or these people are sitting on these boards, so who, who comes from like, who is the top management there? And they will help you figure things out. Like who, uh, they'll help you with the core skills. So it's very important to have relevant core skills. Let's say if this board looks a good board for, let's say a cement, uh, a power company, but let's say if this board starts uh, working for, let's say a textile company. So it's likely that a lot of these the lot of their experiences will be irrelevant and they'll have to start from scratch and figure things out the hard way or the more time taking way. So this is how we find uh, core skills. Uh, so what I'll say is uh, 
just look at the core skills for at least three to four companies uh with the core skills of the management and is it relevant and secondly also what you can see is corporate information let's just see where that is page 20. so if you go to corporate information for any company so page 17 yeah so we'll have a page like this uh which talks about the board of directors which talks about the CFO. I don't see the CEO in this. So I think we'll have to look at a C at the CEO separately in the, so this is, you can, I hope you're taking notes. So company information or corporate information, you can, you can look for that and that'll give you the entire board. How is everyone placed? And then you can match the skills. So, uh, like, uh, you can match the skills, like who is at what place. Yeah, here we are. And CEO, let's just see, Chief Executive Officer. Uh, right, I made a mistake. So, okay, so this company does not have a CEO, does it? No, it should. It's not a go. Yeah, we, yeah, here. So we find we can find it here somewhere. So yeah, uh, basically it'll take time, but we can find it in the in the uh, statutory reports, in the corporate govern uh, corporate governance report as well. So so yeah, this is how. So basically, this is how uh, how we need to approach it. Uh, how, what are the core functions served? Industries served first for the CEO and then for the board as well. So this will tell us the complete background of the company's management that are, do they have relevant experience? And once they have, then we can, uh, we'll go ahead with the VMIA framework. Lastly, we have something called board composition. So who is there on the board? So we don't want a board that's only, let's say run by the family. Uh, let's go back to page 23. That was, yeah. So we do, so if we see the board of directors here, we don't want a board that is only all families, like all the top people are from the same family, because in that case, all the decisions will be taken by one person only in general. And there will be a, there will be an imbalance in systems like checks and balances systems. We want an independent uh, board, which is powerful, uh, and which is not very, very, so I don't know if this is a family or not, but in general, we don't want all of them to be family. That is something that's very important and both should have competent, independent people. So this is the, this is a brief background that we'll have a look into it. We always prefer, we'll always prefer owner operated businesses with industries served in the past, uh, that are similar to what they are serving with core functions that are, uh, key, uh, that are the key areas to success in that industry and board that is independent and powerful in itself. So this is the background of the management. Uh, this is where we start. This is, uh, then we move forward to the vision motivation that we were talking about earlier. So earlier on, we did mention about the short term vision, long term vision and consistency. What are they trying to do in less than one to two years? What are they trying to do in more than four to five years? And how consistent are they? So how we'll do that? We go to this section uh, and we'll read the, uh, the, the reports. We can read all this actually that you don't know where you'll find it. Uh, focused on deleveraging its balance sheet, even while focusing on growth. Okay. So anything that's future related, you can use that. Uh, let's say the company's background so there is no place where you find it but just keep on reading this entire stuff uh do they have chairman's letter uh our company possesses all this so yeah uh what we had promised so yeah there they talk about we would primarily focus on uh debt repayment to become a net debt free company we repaid a substantial portion of our long-term debt, a validation to our commitment. So this is something where we get uh, straightforward uh, answers on what they have done in the past. So we'll go in the past and see, did they actually speak this and what were the exact promises they made? 
but uh, secondly we also have we would not engage in any sizable capex until we have repaid all long term debt we have not reinvested a single rupee in building fresh or sizable capacity beyond normal maintenance so okay this is fine but what is still the uh, yeah so in this section we might find we don't know where we'll find it uh will be funded primarily through internal approvals so we believe in the comp so so you'll have to be, yeah here we are so here is a management director md's overview you will read these and there will be some goals some missions that we'll find that what is the company trying to do in the next 4 years next 2 years or next few years whatever proposed capacity expansion programs so here they have some goals for next 1 to 2 years so so this is how we identify the vision the long term vision of the company what are they trying to become uh, we can even look for something like uh b let's say uh godavari what's the company's name godavari power and its pat uh let's say interview we can even look for something like this we don't know what we'll find yeah so the ceo magazine here we see some uh, abhishek agarwal executive director at godavari so now we might look at this uh, and we might find some some value uh, we might find what they are trying to uh, become here so this is how th there is no fixed way but this is exactly how you kind of find data about the company the effect had uh, the affected this affected a change in their mindset from gpl being a family driven company to a more system driven company okay so this was a family driven uh, business uh covid 19 they, so if you go through the entire thing yeah what lies ahead and it, uh, personal vision for gpil in the next 3 to 5 years is to expand so here we have found it uh one thing so there can be anything as much as we have find in addition to this abhishek agarwal's personal vision for gpil for the next 3 to 5 years is to expand steel producing capacity from current 500000 uh, tons to 2 million tons and what's the date of this article so not too old it's just about a month old so one thing very important for articles is to look the look at the date if this was 3 years back if this was from 2019 we would have come to this and seen that did they do this like did they go from 500000 to 2 million so this is what we have been talking about so far this is how you judge a management short term vision long term vision how consistent are they uh, and then are they achieving their goals or not so this is what we mean by vision and this is how we find it and uh, do this for different companies and you should be comfortable like what are they trying to achieve next let's actually come to uh, th these two later let's actually first uh, cover this topic ability uh, so execution hit ratio basically ability simplistically as the word says can they do it and this is how we'll take hints from the past so execution hit ratio meaning this is exactly what we were talking about in the past if they promised five things how many did they achieve so this is this is what we mean by execution hit rate like if they promise 10 things did they do like at least 5 4 of them or 5 of them or did they do like two or three of them or did they change the goal post so this is something that we focus on and this is what we will go by like whatever the goal was 5 years back 2 years back did they do it what was the reason for not doing it what was happening all such things that's very very important to understand so execution hit ratio is actually at the very core of ability about the ability to get things done next we have distractions outside the business so one enemy of uh, execution is too much like doing too much and distractions outside the business so if someone let's say some business person is involved in too much let's say politics or involved in too much csr or involved in let's say too much like in four companies and four companies that are not related 
so in those cases see the outcome can still be good but in those cases the person has distractions outside the business as well and that can lead to downfall of the company as well so this is something that's very important how how like where, how many distractions do they have outside the business and one way to find this is there is this table where they talk about other directorships yeah so uh yes so we see this board of directors we see this topic called number of other directorships held so if a person has a lot of directorships other than the core company and he is an executive in the company then it becomes kind of a problem so uh, this person has five which is on the higher end this person has six which is also high this person has 10 but he is non executive so it doesn't really matter because whatever he does is not really a uh, working before the business so this column we can see number of directorships that the company has and we want the management the managing director the chairman the ceo to have like one or two directorships outside the company at max not more than that why because then it just leads to distractions and uh, distractions outside the business so this is just one way to find distractions there are n number of other ways again political intentions because see those who have built businesses from scratch uh they would have acquired a lot of wealth so with wealth they uh, they start chasing polit a lot of them not everyone but a few of them a lot of them they start chasing political aspirations as well so uh how politically are involved are they how much like how are they chasing it next csr so are they too much into csr and compromising profitability for that so so these are the two things that we see so far uh, for ability and if we can get these two right a lot has been answered for us it's a very capable management that can do a lot of things then we have these two factors are uh, so we, uh, i'll just explain this so basically returns so whatever capital are you liking this session well we have something more for you download the zebra learn app get free courses to learn from attend live events with experts work on assignments connect with experts basically everything you need to build a career in finance download the app now they are using are they generating good returns out of it so what happens is uh, after a point in time management tries to uh, use a lot of capital like for even if it's not the best use of capital at times so it's called technically it's called empire building like they want to get their business bigger and bigger even if it's making if it's not making good returns out uh, at the end so internal allocation means putting money in the business and external allocation means putting business outside the putting money outside the business such as acquisitions jvs mergers all such things investments as well so internal allocation is free and external allocation is free this will determine uh, like this so how do we judge that so roc the trend so roc is basically we saw this last time around uh, roc we said uh, we said for simplicity pat upon uh, debt plus equity we can uh, for tech, uh, for uh, perfection we can even use ebit upon uh, debt plus equity because that should that is the exact that is the correct thing like, more precise one so the trend of roc should not be down if uh, if the trend of roc is down that means suboptimal use of capital is happening and that is something that the management uh, ability is can be questioned that is where it can be questioned so these are two factors that we need to understand what is the management trying to do and are they in a position to do that are they in, do they have the ability to do that then once we have and taken care of these two then we come to major compensation sources we saw salary so fixed salary that the company has how do we see this control f you can look at salary uh let's just have a look so yeah uh we see salaries for the board of directors what is the fee that they are taking we also have a salary uh board compensation uh, structure for uh for the senior management so let's just see if we can find it i think we have gone too low 
I think we are we find it here. Ah, uh, okay, it's for KMP key management person. Key uh, related parties. So if we go back again, let's just uh, commission. Let's see if we can find something in commission. You find me coming? Yeah. If we go, go up uh, remuneration to directors again. So if you uh, keep on finding for a couple of minutes, actually you'll be able to find it. Uh, it's just that it's it's, it's generally in the uh, corporate governance uh, section. Let me see where that is. Corporate governance. Corporate governance support is page 46, 21 and 46. So 49 actually here. So do we see if we keep on scrolling? So yeah, we need to get comfortable actually going through an annual report as well. So this is the salary for the board of directors. Uh, and we should, we should find it in the annex shares, I think. It's not here, then we find it in the board support. So, so we need to get comfortable going through these as well. So not everything is very important, but a few of them are uh i don't see in this so maybe let's see in 24 but that's where we can find a table for table for uh the compensation structure so annexures we find here so this uh for the film annexure two that's the director's report We keep on finding we should here itself somewhere. Uh, is this no? Yeah, the remuneration again, again it's for directors. No, uh, particulars of key employees. So uh, they talk about the remuneration to each person. It's for directors as well. Uh, okay, and the remuneration per annum for the top ten employees of the company. So we'll find a table like this. We find a table that's often. So this is where we find all the remuneration. So the remuneration for this, so we, uh, they don't really have a CEO as such. So we can find it, you can see this here. The COO makes this amount, the MD makes this amount, and this is the fixed salary. We'll also have to look at it if they have uh, ESOPs, if they, what's the shareholding. So a lot of them had share, shares because it's a family run business. So, so this is how we actually look for data. Uh, so this, these are people are well, well, uh, like the salary is there commissions. We didn't see any commissions here. Otherwise they would have mentioned the commissions here as well. And this is compulsory to do. Otherwise they can't, uh, like this, they have to disclose mandatorily. So commissions, they did not have here. Commissions look something like this 2% of PAT or 5% of PAT, whatever that number is. Uh, and then the numbers are adjusted. Then they have shareholding. So uh, we can go to promoter shareholding. So they have 67%. If we can further break it down uh, in the shareholding pattern here. So promoter holders, individuals, okay, we need to find for each and every individual. So we'll find for each and every individual in the, uh, in the, in the boxes above, we'll have to uh, look for it actually. But the, so it's because it's a family run business, most of them will have shares and anyways, the promoters have about 60% of the company. How much was it? Uh, uh, the promoters had about 67% of the company. So it's a family run, but a very, very like high concentration of shares in the promoters. So in this case, you can be assured that those who are running, those who run the business, they are all they are interested in shares it's shares going up and so are we so this adds up well lastly esop so esops is not required in this case because it's a family run business and shares are high like shareholding is high anyways so we see that there is good enough compensation and the uh, compensation structure is in line with the share uh, 
with us as common shareholders so are the interests in line with shareholders that's the big question and that generally happens whenever shareholding or esops is high so that's how we judge uh, compensation and lastly integrity so integrity is how do you find integrity so resolutions passed in the past so this is just one way so you'll have search for this word notice so the company will have issued a notice yeah notice to uh, notice of annual general meeting and here they would have written all the resolutions that they want to pass uh, in that particular year so if we go to a point so ordinary business but and you'll have to specifically focus on special business to approve or reappoint mr abhishek agarwal as whole time director of the company and consider if thought fit to pass with or without modification uh this as a special resolution uh to approve uh, this person as whole time director so these are fine but let's say if the company is changing any like making any ma major changes they require special uh, approval th uh, through this framework so one way to check uh, this is resolutions passed in the past years so we'll have to go through this for last 7 8 years and see if the management has done anything that's against the shareholders uh, that's against the general shareholders so this is one way where we can find data second is we can find major litigation so again a google search there so how we can see how we can search uh, let's say the company's name was godavari par and this part is part and so now if we read these few pages we might find something we might not find something so all this we won't find we won't read in so in so much detail let's just say news let's read what kind of news is going about them so go through these and you'll also find some good uh, comfort here like what kind of news is being spoken about them so those debt free pays all long term debt stocks that will remain in action upper circuit whatever the case is see uh 250 mw so generally a uh, good we see good news like good news being published or coming out in the market about them so uh, litigation otherwise we might see a lot of litigation related news here if they were involved in any major litigation see any large company will have litigations we don't have to find each and every small litigation are they involved in a major major uh, issue which can challenge the business's survival that's the key and lastly have the have they done anything in the past like moments anything that's against shareholders so basically moments of integrity and disintegrity so this is how this is what we'll see uh moments of integrity meaning uh like they actually stood up and did something good for the shareholders be, uh, beyond what they had to compulsorily or did they actually do something that was against shareholders and either ways we need to find these out and data is very difficult to find for them for all this but if we can find it these will be excellent uh, this is where our research will come into the picture and this will help us save a lot of money if we get uh, if we invest in a company with where the management is involved in any of this in that case it will become a challenge for us to make a good return out of it so this is how we have seen so far what is the management trying to do the past ability major compensation sources and integrity so as a project after this what i'll say uh take any two companies and find out any two companies and find out what their vision is like what have they communicated that they are going to do in next few years you know where to find it uh find out their vision their uh, past ability their past execution track record uh their allocation outside the company uh like allocation history like are the returns stable you can say you can see ro you can use roc and see if it's stagnant or going up or going down uh and then how are they how are they like what's their in uh, incentive and lastly the integrity behind it like do, do can we find some data about the integrity like to go through the resolutions that they have passed major litigations if you can find any and this way do uh, we'll take any two companies 
and bring data the the idea is not to be very very we don't want to be picture perfect because that won't happen it's the first project and it will be very difficult to do this uh in the sense very difficult to find data that's relevant but we'll get a lot of uh, relevant data and this will just grow, help us grow in confidence in terms of dealing with management related data so yeah summing up very quickly this is how we proceed with management analysis uh vmia first we go through the background of it the management they have relevant experience then the vision then the compensation then the integrity and lastly the ability so far we have done the management analysis uh, a brief overview like a good uh, we, uh, i i will see the projects it should be a lot of fun and any questions would love to take there uh now we come to a very fun part of this entire course it's my favorite part actually uh, it's actually a lot of fun because there is no rules to there is no rule to this how to generate investment ideas like how do you find uh, and a lot of you will find interest in this before that let me see if we have any questions why ceo represent the company everywhere does md represent see rahul what happens is uh, the ceo generally is the person who is responsible for getting things done he is the one who is appointed by the board that okay you are responsible to uh, get things done and we are betting our money on you see everyone will not leave their work and after investing somewhere uh, they'll start like following it up day after day that doesn't happen they get a dedicated ceo whose responsibility it is to uh, kind of uh, run the operations the execution part is their responsibility the md other other than that the uh, md is the managing director so managing director is uh, like from from the board of directors who is involved in the business operations at whatever position and also he manages the entire operations of the firm not necessarily from an execution point of view but in general the day, the entire uh, working of the firm that is uh, maybe the appointment of ceo or uh, not if, if not the appointment of ceo in the, then uh, even the uh, even the activity part of it so any questions would love to take i think uh, my explanation of md was not very clear was it so md basically is a uh, managing director someone from the board ceo can be without, without like ceo cannot can be outside the board as well and md is generally the person who's working like a step ahead of the board of directors to represent the board and also get the execution of the activities done any questions would love to take other than that let's move forward and let's focus on this part how to generate investment stock ideas uh how to generate investment ideas actually so there is actually no rule how you can generate investment ideas there are certain tried and tested methods that we will talk about so first things first look for ideas in your profession whatever you do you know it better than many people like in general uh, you know it better than people around you or Uh, you know it better technically as well so whatever you do look for ideas related to it because that is where you have expertise look for ideas related uh, so if you are working in data science field you will have a greater much greater understanding even from a professional uh, so this is where an individual can beat a professional looking in their own profession so what is happening in uh, machine learning and ai related fields which companies are doing good which companies are struggling which companies offering is selling well in the market you'll have much greater access to uh, ground related data so in that case uh, that is where you start investing that is one of the best places to start investing actually second which companies are best positioned let's say for post covid if you are a doctor you understand the medicines well which companies will do better uh we see a lot of theme of let's say uh this uh like building boosting immunity that a lot of companies use it for marketing does this actually work you know it much better if you're a doctor if you are into textiles which companies are which companies products are selling the best so i'm assuming uh, those you are attending this course they will generally be in finance uh, in future 
so how are banks doing which bank is facing uh, liquidity crunch or uh, asset liability problems uh, then nbfcs how are they doing then new fintech companies how are they doing so if you see uh, mr warren buffett as well the uh, the the most like renowned investor he also made a large fortune of his money investing in financial companies a place of sector that he understood very well why because by profession he was also into that field itself so he understood which companies are doing good which companies are doing not doing good so he bought companies related to insurance he bought banks so that is where he made a lot of money other places also he did well but that is where you investing in your own profession just look around and you should find a lot of investment ideas are uh, related to your work work setting next so if you could actually let's do this if you could help me in the comment section uh i will take the questions later on uh, which are not related is morning star a good company yes they are a good company uh now depends on the job profile but i'll take all these questions uh, later on let's uh, if you could find whatever you do guys let's say even if you are students a lot of you are student then also you know which companies are doing well which education companies are doing well so if you can find if you could help me with a couple of examples whatever you do related to that uh, of companies that you know whose products are working whose products are doing well actually so we'll we uh, will fade for a minute to uh, kind of hear from here in the comment section uh don't see i think there's a lag because there's a couple of minutes lag but oh, all right let's move on i think meanwhile we can come back uh, and hear that uh, companies we can even find investment ideas from environment from our own surroundings just looking around be it at home be it at work be it when going out to restaurant be it when chilling with friends be it when anywhere actually you are go, walk, going by the metro or uh, taking the local train going let's say by car you can find you'll find products around you all the time and that simply is source to lot of ideas so right now if i'm using a laptop which laptop is it right now if i'm using uh, if i'm using a mobile phone which mobile phone it is all these are investment ideas so for example we see a lot of nestle products around us uh, and we constantly see it so if we keep a close look at it and track it that what's our purchase per week from per month let's say of nestle products is it going up is it going down are they coming with new products going through the supermarket to find the product all those things uh, all those things that is where uh, our environment comes into the picture next is we find company called marico so lot of you are using parachute oil but it's by a listed company called marico and it's a huge company so again products around us we see gillette so gillette is owned by png currently then we see something a, a product called govardhan ghee a lot of you would have even and particularly in urban areas would have seen go cheese so go cheese is by parag milk foods so this is again a listed company then this is a chips company that we see called dfm foods foods then jio no needs no introduction it's by reliance so n number of products actually you can put in some comments in the comment section about different products that you see around you right now that are by listed companies so by jews yes can say by if you're a student and you've used uh, their education services then by jews yes environment uh, so uh, if you can help me with few examples of environment uh, because here everywhere around us we find we find classmate notebooks it's again by itc so so every product that we see around us there is a chance that it comes from a listed company and we can just dig deeper and find out more about it next leg work so leg work is basically going out going out and collecting data so whenever you like actually take take a conscious effort and go to a mall go to a mall and see which shops and brands are opening up uh which shops have the like have the most rush uh then most common brand bags so if you look around what bags are people carrying because to carry if they're carrying a bag that means they have either bought something or exchanged something but that they have they have actually purchased in general if not today in the past but so if you focus on these things it's likely that if a new brand has opened in your locality 
it has opened up somewhere else as well uh, if it's a large company so if you look into these things you should find a lot of good examples that okay uh, this these companies are growing these companies are doing well and that is where actually talk to the people talk to the security guard that where is the most rush in general that is where you get a lot of good investment ideas uh s chand yes definitely s chand for books big time yes kalyani i'm not very sure kalyani hdfc bank icici bank yes for environment legwork so shops then we have construction material companies so go there and speak to the contractor what cement do you use what building materials do you use like what what trucks are coming just have look at everything and you will find a good you might find a good company and then you also need to look into it from a detailed point of view that okay is it making is it making sense or not uh like is it a good company because see you'll find 10 different ideas here it's just an idea you need to evaluate it and only it out of 10 maybe one will survive so this is where you get go for ideas that okay which products are being used and why next let's say you travel you see how people travel like what are they using airplane so we see air traffic has increased in recent past uh what do they eat where do they eat so we see that lot of uh, footfall is falling in dominos places like mcdonald so these are also listed companies actually uh which hotels are full which hotel chains are not full which is the ones that are preferred so any and every such question where you see demand uh that is where you can find a good investment so leg work is something that's very very important going out and just visiting stuff visiting places and looking at things that which ones are working which ones are not working next magazines and newspapers so this is something that's very easy to do because we have access to it right in our in our mobile phones uh so personally i use this app called magster i i think i've mentioned it early on as well so it's an amazing app where you get all the magazines of all the different like all different kinds of magazine at a, at one single subscription so uh magster like magazines actually and uh newspapers so you will find news like this uh five like these what is happening with the different companies earnings today petrol diesel prices pcs if they are hiring let's say 43000 new freshers in 6 months so that means the business is growing well or that means the business uh, is coming up so if they are pe- hiring people fast that means they are growing because why will why else will someone hire anyone if the work is not there uh we saw z entertainment and sony india merger in a few months back so all these things all such news you just need to dig deeper what can be the implications from a business point of view and from an uh, from a business point of view the implications have to be kind of uh red and that is where we can get ideas uh that is where we can see what different companies if they are tying up uh we can find ideas there and we want to identify news that are mostly related to business so this is a business related news this is a business related news we don't want news that is related to stocks so we won't focus on things like this uh we we might give it a read but this won't really act as an investment idea uh we we will not read news like this we will read news like facts basically uh tgs is hiring there is a merger air india privatization uh, all such things these are where we'll focus on investment ideas and same is the case with magazines uh next we'll use something like screener.in so there are a lot of screeners uh so let's go to this actually an academy fired 750 people yes correct ultra tech correct correct a uh, lot of people have fired correct uh so screener dot in if we go there they have something called a screener tool so screens basically so you can use these different screens let's say capacity expansion so this will give us companies a list of companies that have recently expanded capacity how did they do it they did it from only the numbers the financial numbers that were reported so whatever your circumstance whatever your preferences are let's say you want a list of all companies that have a roe of more than 20% uh, and let's say revenue growth of more than 10% so in that case you can find it all on the screener put it or uh, put all of that conditions uh, i think there's a condition thing here yeah you can put in all the search conditions here run the query and it will give you all the relevant companies 
so this is how it works screeners is a is a great place to find good examples uh so yeah this is exactly how it works these are three uh, examples we can find companies uh, like the, these actually so so uh, yeah at the end all these are examples so screeners are a good place where you can find examples and then we have peer recommendations so peer recommendations is a bit tricky actually so peer recommendations is basically asking your friend your friends colleagues so here we need to keep a few things in mind who is giving you this and how did they get that idea so did they did, did they research on it and then they got an idea or did they get a tip from some other friend and they have passed it on you if they have gotten a tip and they have passed it on you just ignore that because that is that is something that you we want to ignore but if they have actually researched they have read it somewhere they have uh, they have some backing to it in that case we will ask we will we will we might consider it or else if that person is coming from lot of history like as in they are good credible uh, and uh, like good credible so forces in the market so so uh, in that case we might uh, respect that and we might work on that and treat it as an idea uh be specific uh, that's very important how did they get the idea like as specific as possible i cannot repeat enough if they are getting a tip from a friend or someone just ignore it because it's noise just ignore it uh so yeah next we have a brokerage report uh, so brokerage report uh, will have a buy sell recommendation uh, also lot of miss selling at times so ignore that don't don't really focus on buy sell report that is something that we'll completely avoid but focus on the facts that they have mentioned these things that they have mentioned the data that's something where an analyst has worked very hard to collect and then they have shared so that, that is something that we need to focus on that is something that we have we can spend time on and basis that we can use that wait wait i just saw that you purchased a product from zebra learn store and thank you so much we have something super super awesome for you introducing this all in one finance bundle where you get access to all our courses be it personal finance stock trading derivative financial analysis financial modeling uh, stock markets everything and anything that you want to learn in finance you have access to this for the next one year and whatever courses we add during this period you'll have access to them as well this is the perfect thing for you if you are a college student who is trying to build a career in finance if you are a young professional trying to figure out and upgrade your skills or you are from outside the finance industry and want to enter this industry this is the place you should be starting this is a no brainer deal and since you already purchased the product you just have to upgrade it you don't have to pay the entire amount just pay the difference and you get access to the entire suite of products that we have so what are you waiting for just go and grab on the bundle to kind of understand and read companies understand and generate ideas basically uh, so brokerage report is also a great source of uh, a great source but you need to understand that it can be incentivized as well there can be misselling as well so that is something that we need to keep in mind lastly don't look at news don't really focus on lot uh, on day to day news a uh, lot of it is too incentivized as well and definitely don't look at tips why because even if you get a tip they will tell you when to buy no one will tell you when to sell if you don't do your research you'll never make money that's for sure tips also are incentivized that means uh that means uh money is spent to actually get that tip to you be it through social media or whatever channel actually but rumors are spread money is spread so that someone else can sell their stocks at a profit so don't read don't focus on news that you see on tv on newspapers so much just focus on the news that are facts no opinions just facts that okay company a did this company b released new products company c bought a uh, company d whatever the case is but that is what we'll do don't look at news they are too incentivized don't look at tips they they never tell you when to sell so these are few ways how you generate investment ideas uh first in your profession environment then leg work is going out there and kind of getting uh getting data from there uh newspapers and magazines screeners peer recommendations like from people around and brokerage reports 
so as an activity what we'll do is let's generate each person three good investment ideas or three good places that you can you want to research more into uh from either of these factors you can use like from what you see around and also share how you got that idea whatever the source is but spend time and take few days but uh share very specifically three ideas and more than that how did you get that idea and don't uh, it cannot be i got a reference i that cannot be the case whatever you use you use screener you use legwork you like go out you use your environment as an idea generation but good ideas that are possibly where your investi one way to do it is just put in three company names but you want genuinely good ideas that you can use and then you can build more projects on that so this is something that you can use that you can work i think this can be a good uh, a good project good practice because a lot of us are used to getting tips which is not the right uh, which is not uh, and as if you want to become equity analysts tips is certainly something that will not get us anywhere and also don't look at too much of opinionated news so this is what uh, this is what we'll say so far let me look have a look at questions if any ev cars are coming short sure, but uh, how like what did you see about ev cars how did you get that idea did you read a newspaper you read a magazine so what magazine what did you read about evs what is happening on the ground so read a bit more any questions would love to take so the road ahead after this with this we will have come to the conclusion of the four week equity course it's not the end it's actually the start but the but the road ahead will be uh so what we'll have to do after this we have understood industry business of ma management financials and valuations and idea generation so not in that detail great detail but a lot of it so but we are in a position where we understand enough to build a project so what we'll do is first uh, we'll complete this assignment second what we'll do is uh these two assignments basically one for uh, like two companies for management and uh, three investment uh, wherever you see uh, three companies that you can work great greatly into next is we can we'll create one larger project so which will cover the entire activity so basically one report which will talk about the company's industry competitive position uh management uh then financials and valuations and this is something that will be difficult to do will will be confusing to do difficult would be the wrong word because first time when you start it's obviously too much it's too time taking uh it's too time taking for a lot of factors uh but if you create one project and then the second project and then the third project uh with time you'll start getting uh, you'll start being more comfortable second uh you will also like uh, you will also create a portfolio of your projects that you can use uh and that portfolio of your projects will be used uh for like you can use to get internships now you are actually in a position where you can create a couple of reports and actually start applying for entry level internships uh, you'll have to work obviously you'll have learning it's just beginning it's uh, the, the here you're just beginning to learn it's not uh the, it's not as if you've learned it's a lot of detail and when you start doing things that is actually when you start getting confused so road ahead this is what we will build next one project or report which will take time couple of weeks about two weeks and also uh to follow this up we'll continuously be having sessions i think radhika takes up a lot of sessions so they'll be taking up sessions to help you build these assignments projects so that uh so that you can kind of put everything in one place and any questions let's just make sure that zebra learn uh, like make sure that the group that we have there we can discuss it all there and we can discuss it all there and uh uh like it will be a very open for forum for discussion i think uh following this let's see let's see if you have any questions thank you rahul uh, any feedback would love to take would love to speak to you guys offline as well meanwhile i hope everyone of you have downloaded the app and 
uh, I think Radhika, because yeah, that's what I've been told. Uh, download the apps, submit the assignment. So I yeah. think I got disconnected, guys. Uh, so let's just. Uh, so what I was saying is, uh, I've loved every bit of this session. It's been a lot of fun. Any thing, anywhere, just reach out to me personally. I'll take your leave now. Uh, it's been uh, any questions. Would love to take it online, offline, anywhere. It's thank you for taking out the time. And four Sundays, it's a lot to ask actually. But I hope I've done justice to your time. Um, it's practice that will make us. Uh, that will make anything happen. And your learning is actually starting here. You cannot end it here. And over time, this should translate into something that's very meaningful for you. So, so uh, keep doing the projects, assignments. I think more assignments and projects will keep on coming along. Let's keep the conversation going, and I think this should be great. With this, I wrap up the uh, with this session, and I'll take your leave. And I think Radhika will follow up, follow it up here. But thank you so much for taking out the time. Thank you, Anurag, for your time. And I guess everyone has learned a lot from your experience.